Part 4. This letter, with some variants, is printed by Billamoria, 73F. Orm, Fragments, 119, calls her a Kashmirian. Certainly she was not a daughter of the Rana's family, though it is not impossible she may have been of one of the great families of Shapura or Banera, then acting independently of the Rana, and her desire to burn shows her to have been Rajput. Such an inference is wrong, because a Hindu princess on marrying a Muslim king lost her caste and religion, and received Islamic burial. We read of no Rajputni of the harem of any of the Mughal emperors having burned herself with her deceased husband, for the very good reason that a Muslim's corpse is buried and not burnt. Evidently Yudipuri meant that she would kill herself in passionate grief on the death of Aurangzeb, Jadunat Sarkari, 64, note, dot. The emperor was the adopted brother of Rana Karan. 250 Rajputs opposed 5,000 of the imperialists at a pass, till the family of Jusvant escaped. The Rana received the young Rator with the most princely hospitality, and among other gifts a diamond worth 10,000 dinars is enumerated. This letter, first made known to Europe by Orm, Fragments, Notes, 93. FF. Has by him been erroneously attributed to Jusvant Singh of Marvar, who was dead before the promulgation of the edict, as the mention of Ram Singh sufficiently indicates, whose father, Jai Singh, was contemporary with Jusvant and ruled nearly a year after his death. My Munshi obtained a copy of the original letter at Udaipur, where it is properly assigned to the Rana. Compare the version of this letter in Jadunath Sarkar, 3. 325 ff. Who remarks that, the internal evidence and biographical details of the writer apply to Shivaji and not to Raj Singh. In the penultimate paragraph of the letter Raja Ram Singh is given for Rana Raj Singh by ASBMs and Orm. But no Jaipur chieftain could have been the head of the Hindus. It were superfluous to give a translation after the elegant production of Sir W. B. Rao's letter from Rana Raj Singh to Aurangzeb. All due praise be rendered to the glory of the Almighty, and the munificence of your majesty, which is conspicuous as the sun and moon. Although I, your well-wisher, have separated from your sublime presence, I am nevertheless zealous in the performance of every bounden act of obedience and loyalty. My ardent wishes and strenuous services are employed to promote the prosperity of the kings, nobles, mirzas, rajas, and roys of the provinces of Hindustan, and the chiefs of Aron, Turan, Rum, and Sham, the inhabitants of the seven climates. And all persons traveling by land and by water. This my inclination is notorious, nor can your royal wisdom entertain a doubt thereof. Reflecting therefore on my former services, and your majesty's condescension, I presume to solicit the royal attention to some circumstances, in which the public as well as private welfare is greatly interested. I have been informed that enormous sums have been dissipated in the prosecution of the designs formed against me, your well-wisher, and that you have ordered a tribute to be levied to satisfy the exigencies of your exhausted treasury. May it please your majesty, your royal ancestor Mahom Jalal ul Din Akbar, whose throne is now in heaven, conducted the affairs of this empire in equity and firm security for the space of fifty-two years. Preserving every tribe of men in ease and happiness, whether they were followers of Jesus or of Moses, of David or Mahomed. Were they Brahmins, were they of the sect of Darians, which denies the eternity of matter, or of that which ascribes the existence of the world to chance, they all equally enjoyed his countenance and favor, insomuch that his people, in gratitude for the indiscriminate protection he afforded them, distinguished him by the appellation of Juggut Guru, guardian of mankind. His Majesty Mahomed Nur ul Din Jahangir, likewise, whose dwelling is now in paradise, extended, for a period of twenty-two years, the shadow of his protection over the heads of his people. Successful by a constant fidelity to his allies, and a vigorous exertion of his arm in business. Nor less did the illustrious Shah Jahan, by a propitious reign of thirty-two years, acquire to himself immortal reputation, the glorious reward of clemency and virtue. Such were the benevolent inclinations of your ancestors. Whilst they pursued these great and generous principles, wheresoever they directed their steps, conquest and prosperity went before them, and then they reduced many countries and fortresses to their obedience. During your majesty's reign, many have been alienated from the empire, and farther loss of territory must necessarily follow, 
since devastation and rapin now universally prevail without restraint. Your subjects are trampled underfoot, and every province of your empire is impoverished, depopulation spreads, and difficulties accumulate. When indigence has reached the habitation of the sovereign and his princes, what can be the condition of the nobles? As to the soldiery, they are in murmurs. The merchants complaining, the Mohammedans discontented, the Hindus destitute, and multitudes of people, wretched even to the want of their nightly meal, are beating their heads throughout the day in rage and desperation. How can the dignity of the sovereign be preserved who employs his power in exacting heavy tributes from a people thus miserably reduced? At this juncture it is told from east to west, that the emperor of Hindustan, jealous of the poor Hindu devotee, will exact a tribute from Brahmins, Sonoras, Jagis, Biragis, Sannyasis. That, regardless of the illustrious honor of his Timurkan race, he condescends to exercise his power over the solitary and offensive anchoret. If your majesty places any faith in those books, by distinction called divine, you will there be instructed that God is the God of all mankind, not the God of Mohammedans alone. The pagan and the Muslim are equally in his presence. Distinctions of color are of his ordination. It is he who gives existence. In your temples, to his name the voice is raised in prayer, in a house of images, where the bell is shaken, still he is the object of adoration. To vilify the religion or customs of other men is to set at naught the pleasure of the Almighty. When we deface a picture, we naturally incur the resentment of the painter. And justly has the poet said, presume not to arraign or scrutinize the various works of power divine. In fine, the tribute you demand from the Hindus is repugnant to justice, it is equally foreign from good policy, as it must impoverish the country, moreover, it is an innovation and an infringement of the laws of Hindustan. But if zeal for your own religion hath induced you to determine upon this measure, the demand ought, by the rules of equity, to have been made first upon Ramsing, who is esteemed the principal amongst the Hindus. Then let your well-wisher be called upon, with whom you will have less difficulty to encounter, but to torment ants and flies is unworthy of an heroic or generous mind. It is wonderful that the ministers of your government should have neglected to instruct your majesty in the rules of rectitude and honor. It is well known that Aurangzeb forbade the continuation of the history of his life, subsequent to that portion comprehending the first ten years, the Alam Gurnama, see Jadunath Sarkar 2. 302. The epithet by which these Tatar sovereigns affected to call the indigenous, Bumia, princes. There were no such field trains in Europe as those of the Mughals. Seventy pieces of heavy ordnance, sixty of horse artillery, and a dromedary corps three hundred strong, mounting swivels, accompanied the emperor on an excursion to Kashmir. Bernier, who gives this detail, describes what he saw, 217 f. For this campaign see the account in Jadunath Sarkar, Life of Aurangzeb, 3. 365 ff. Pal is the local term for these long defile, the residents of the mountaineers, their chiefs are called Indras, Patti, Inbaka, Pat. Chief of the Hindus. In the text, Tiber, Khan. His original name was Jan Beg, also known as Bad Shakuli Khan, one of Aurangzeb's great nobles, Minuchi II. 239, note 3, 247, note. His tragical end is told later on. The Saktawat leader, Garibdas, has the merit of having prompted this plan. His speech on the advance of Aurangzeb is given in the annals. And his advice, let the king have free entrance through the passes, shut him in, and make famine his foe, was literally followed, with the hard knocks, which being a matter of course accompaniment. The gallant Saktawat deemed it unnecessary to specify. Orm, who has many valuable historical details of this period, makes Aurangzeb in person to have been in the predicament assigned by the annals to his son, and to have escaped from the operation of those high and gallant sentiments of the Rajput. Which make him no match for a wily adversary. In the meantime Aurangzeb was carrying on the war against the Rana of Chitor, and the Raja of Marvar, who on the approach of his army at the end of the preceding year, 1678, had abandoned the accessible country, and drew their herds and inhabitants into the valleys, within the mountains. The army advanced amongst the defile with incredible labor, and with so little intelligence, that the division which moved with Orangib himself was unexpectedly stopped by insuperable defenses and precipices in front. 
whilst the Rajputs in one night closed the straits in his rear, by felling the overhanging trees, and from their stations above prevented all endeavors of the troops, either within or without, from removing the obstacle. Yudepari, the favorite and Circassian wife of Aurangzeb, accompanied him in this arduous war, and with her retinue and escort was enclosed in another part of the mountains. Her conductors, dreading to expose her person to danger or public view, surrendered. She was carried to the Rana, who received her with homage and every attention. Meanwhile the emperor himself might have perished by famine, of which the Rana let him see the risque, by a confinement of two days, when he ordered his Rajputs to withdraw from their stations, and suffer the way to be cleared. As soon as Aurangzeb was out of danger, the Rana sent back his wife, accompanied by a chosen escort, who only requested in return that he would refrain from destroying the sacred animals of their religion which might still be left in the plains. But Aurangzeb, who believed in no virtue but self-interest, imputed the generosity and forbearance of the Rana to the fear of future vengeance, and continued the war. Soon after he was again well-nigh enclosed in the mountains. This second experience of difficulties beyond his age and constitution, and the arrival of his sons, Azim and Akbar, determined him not to expose himself any longer in the field, but to leave its operations to their conduct. Superintended by his own instructions from Asmer. To which city he retired with the households of his family, the officers of his court, and his bodyguard of four thousand men, dividing the army between his two sons. Who each had brought a considerable body of troops from their respective governments. They continued the war each in a different part of the country, and neither at the end of the year had forced the ultimate passes of the mountains, historical fragments, 119f. Dalir Khan, otherwise Jalal Khan Da Udzai, died at Aurangabad, 1682-83, Manuchi I, 243. Grant Duff speaks highly of his services in the Deccan, 145f. Chief of Rupnagar. Chief of Ganerao, in God War, now alienated from Muir. Some name is wanting here. Sidpur, a famous place of pilgrimage in Baroda State, IGI, 22. 358 F. Madassa, 52 miles northeast of Ahmedabad, BG, 6. 346. Makham and Ganga Saktawats, Rutan Khandawat of Salumbar. Chandra Senjala of Sudri, Sabal Singh Chauhan of Bedla, Birizal Punwar of Bajolia. Four of the chiefs made speeches on the eve preceding the battle, which are recorded in the chronicle. For Akbar's rebellion see Jadunath Sarkar II. 402 FF, Elliot Dowson 7. 298 FF, Manuchi II. 243 FF. A portrait of this rat or hero was given to the author of the present work by his descendants. He was chief of Dunara, on the Luni. He saved his young sovereign's life from the tyrant, and guarded him during a long minority, heading the rators in all the wars for the independence of his country. A bribe of forty thousand gold sons was sent to him by Azam without stipulation, when conveying Akbar out of danger. The object was obvious, yet the Mughal prince dared not even specify his wishes. It is needless to say that Durga spurned the offer. For the flight of Akbar see Jadunath Sarkar II. 415 FF. For the attempt of Tahor Khan to assassinate Aurangzeb see Manuchi II. 247 FF, Jadunath Sarkar II. 411 FF. Palargar is perhaps Palampur, IGI, 19. 354. Akbar died in Persia. 1706. We are not without hopes that some of the many in India who have the means will supply the portions of information which are deficient in these fragments, and must otherwise always continue out of our reach. The knowledge is well worth the inquiry. For, besides the magnitude of the events and the energy of the characters which arise within this period, there are no states or powers on the continent of India, with whom our nation have either connection or concern which do not owe the origin of their present condition to the reign of Aurangzeb, or to its influence on the reigns of his successors, Orm's Fragments, Notes I. F. Orm, Fragments, 150 F. Jawab Soul, Treaty. Singh, Uncle of Rana Raj. With the Panja, or Impress of the M. Manzuri, written by him. 
Question, answer, of Sir. Singh, and Narhar Bhatt. Emperor. Paris hand, with the word. Self. Manzuri, agreed. Your servants, according to your royal pleasure and summons, have been sent by the Rana to represent what is written underneath. We hope you will agree to these requests, besides others which will be made by Padam Singh. 1. Let Chitter, with the districts adjacent appertaining thereto when it was inhabited, be restored. 2. In such temples and places of Hindu religious resort as have been converted into mosques, the past cannot be recalled, but let this practice be abolished. 3. The aid hitherto afforded to the empire by the Rana shall be continued, but let no additional commands be imposed. 4. The sons and dependents of the deceased Raja Jasvant Singh so soon as enabled to perform their duties, we hope will have their country restored to them. Respect prevents inferior demands. May the splendor of your fortune, like the sun illuminating the world, be forever increasing and never set. The artsy, requests, of your servants, Sir Singh and Narhar Bhatt. S. 1737, A.D. 1681. It was to defend the rights of the heir of Marvar, as well as to oppose the odious Jizya, that the Rana took to arms. Ajit was still under the Rana's safeguard. Orm, Fragments, 217 f. A different story is told by Kafi Khan, Elliot Dowson 7. 334. Dot. A common error, Gomathi, meaning rich in cattle, has no connection with Hindi Gumna, to twist. 96 lakhs of rupees, Erskine 2. A. 9. A.D. 1661. From all I could learn, it was the identical pestilence which has been ravaging India for the last ten years, erroneously called cholera morbus. About thirty-five years ago the same disease carried off multitudes in these countries. Orm, Fragments, 200, gives notice of something similar in A.D. 1684, in the imperial camp near Goa, when five hundred victims daily fell its prey. Muir was not free from the last visitation of 1818, and the only son of the Rana was the first person attacked. The three months of rain, termed the Barsat. Asar is the month June to July, followed by Sawan and Baden. The four castes, sacerdotal, military, mercantile, and servile. From the Raj Vilas, the chronicle of the reign of Raj Singh. Chapter 14. Rana Jai Singh, A.D. 1680-98. Rana Jai Singh took possession. Of the Gaddi in S. 1737, A.D. 1681. A circumstance occurred. At his birth, which as descriptive of manners may deserve notice. A few hours only intervened between his entrance into the world. And that of another son called Beam. It is customary for the father to bind round the arm of the newborn infant a root of that species of grass called the Amar dub, the imperishable dub. Well known for its nutritive properties and luxuriant vegetation. Under the most intense heat. The Rana first attached the ligature round the arm of the youngest, apparently an oversight. Though in fact from superior affection for his mother. As the boy's approach to manhood, the Rana, apprehensive that this preference might create dissension, one day drew his sword, and placing it in the hand of Beam, the elder, said, it was better to use it at once on his brother, than hereafter to endanger the safety of the state. This appeal to his generosity had an instantaneous effect, and he not only ratified, by his father's throne, the acknowledgement of the sovereign rights of his brother, but declared, to remove all fears. He was not his son. If he again drank water within the pass of Dabari. And, collecting his retainers, he abandoned Udaipur to court fortune where she might be kinder. The day was sultry, and on reaching the barrier he halted under the shade of a sacred fig tree to bestow a last look upon the place of his birth. His cupbearer, Panyari, brought his silver goblet filled from the cool fountain, but as he for fifty-seven raised it to his lips, he recollected that his vow was incomplete. 
while within the portal. He poured the libation on the earth in the name of the Supreme, and casting the cup as an offering to the deity of the fountain, the huge gates closed upon the valley. He proceeded to Bahadur Shah, who conferred upon him the dignity, mansab, of a leader of 3,500 horse, with the Bawana, or 52 districts for their support, but quarreling with the imperial general. He was detached with his contingent west of the Indus, where he died. Treaty between Rana Jai Singh and Aurangzeb. Let us return. To Jai Singh, the Lion of Victory. He concluded a treaty with Aurangzeb, conducted by Prince Azam and Dalir Khan, who took every occasion to testify his gratitude for the clemency of Rana Raj Singh, when blockaded in the defile of the Aravali. At this conference, the Rana was attended by 10,000 horse and 40,000 foot, besides the multitude collected from the mountains to view the ceremony, above 100,000 souls who set up a shout of joy at the prospect of revisiting the plains which disconcerted Azam, while Delir expatiated on the perils from which the Rana's generosity had liberated him. Azam, who said he was no stranger to the Rana's illustrious house, concluded a treaty on the spot, in which, as a salvo for the imperial dignity, a nominal fine and surrender of three districts were inserted for aiding Akbar's rebellion and a hint that the regal color, crimson, of his tents and umbrella should be discontinued. That advantages were gained by the Rana, we may infer from Delir's sons being left as hostages for Azam's good. Faith, a fact we learn from his farewell address to the Rana. Your nobles are rude, and my children are the hostages of your safety. But if at the expense of their lives I can obtain the entire for 58 restoration of your country, keep your mind at ease, for there was friendship between your father and me, the Jasamund Lake. But all other protection than what his sword afforded was futile. And though Delir's intentions were noble, he had little control over events, in less than five years. After his accession, the Rana was again forced to fly the plains for the inaccessible haunts of Kamori. Yet, in spite of these untoward circumstances and uninterrupted warfare, such were the resources of this little state that the Rana completed a work which perpetuates his name. He threw a dam across a break-in the mountains, the channel of an ever-flowing stream, by which he formed the largest lake in India, giving it his own name, the Jasamund, or Sea of Victory. Nature had furnished the hint for this undertaking, for there had always existed a considerable volume of water, but the Rana had the merit of uniting these natural buttresses, and creating a little sea from the Debar pool. Its ancient appellation the circumference cannot be less than 30 miles, and the benefits to cultivation, especially in respect to the article of rice, which requires perpetual irrigation, were great. On this huge rampart he erected a palace for his favorite queen, Kamala Devi, a princess of the Prama race, familiarly known as the Ruthi Rani, or Testi Queen. Rana Jai Singh and his heir Amar Singh domestic unhappiness, appears to have generated in the Rana inaptitude to state affairs, and, unluckily, the favored queen estranged him from his son. Amra, a name venerated in Muir, was that of the heir of Jai Singh. His mother was of the Bundy house, a family, which has performed great services to, and brought great calamities, upon, the ancient sovereigns of Muir to the jealousies of the rival queens, one of the mother to the heir, the other the favorite of the sovereign, are attributed dissensions, which at such a juncture were a greater detriment than the loss of a battle, and which afford another illustration, if any were wanting, of the impolicy of polygamy. The annals of Muir seldom exhibit those unnatural contentions for power, from which no other Hindu state was exempt, 
this was owing to the wholesome regulation of not investing the princes of the blood with any 459 political authority and establishing as a counterpoise to natural advantages and artificial degradation of their rank, which placed them beneath the sixteen chief nobles of the state. Which, while it exalted these in their own estimation, lessened the national humiliation, when the heirs apparent were compelled to lead their quota in the arrière ban of the empire. Rebellion of Amar Singh Rana Jai Singh, who had evinced such gallantry and activity in the wars of Aurangzeb, now secluded himself with Kamala in the retreat of Jaisamund, leaving Amra under the guidance of the Pancholi minister, at the capital. But he having personally insulted this chief officer of the state, in consequence of receiving a rebuke for turning loose an infuriated elephant in the town, the Rana left his retreat, and, visiting Chitter in his tour, arrived at Udaipur. Amra awaited. Not his father's arrival, but adding his mother's resentments to. A feeling of patriotic indignation at the abasement his indolence. Produced, fled to Bundy, took up arms, and, joined by many of. His own nobles and Hara auxiliaries. Returned at the head of ten. Thousand men. Desirous of averting civil war, the Rana retired. To God war beyond the Aravali, whence he sent the Ganero. Chieftain, the first feudatory of that department, to expostulate. With his son. But Amra, supported by three-fourths of the nobles, made direct for Kumhomer to secure the state treasure. Saved by the Depra governor for his sovereign. A failure in this project, the knowledge that the Rators fostered the quarrel. With a view to obtain God war, and the determination of the few. Chiefs yet faithful to the Rana, to defend the Jilwara Pass to the last, made the prince listen to terms, which were ratified at the shrine of Eklinga, whereby the Rana was to return to the capital, and the prince to abide in exile at the new palace during the life of his father, which closed twenty years after his accession. Had he maintained the reputation he established in his early Years, the times were well calculated for the redemption of his country's independence. But documents which yet exist afford little reason to doubt that in his latter years a state of indolence, for sixty having all the effects of imbecility, supervened, and but for the formation of the victorious sea, would have left his name a blank in the traditional history of Muir. Rana Amar Singh II A.D. 1698-1710. Amra II, who succeeded. In S. 1756, A.D. 1700, had much of the gallantry and active turn of mind of his illustrious namesake. But the degrading conflict with his father had much impaired the moral strength of the country and counteracted the advantages which might have resulted from the decline of the Mughal power. The reigns of Raj Singh and Jai Singh illustrate the obvious truth, that on the personal character of the chief of a feudal government everything depends. The former, infusing by his talent and energy patriotic sentiments into all his subordinates, vanquished in a series of conflicts the vast military resources of the empire, led by the emperor, his sons, and chosen generals while his successor, heir, to this moral strength, and with every collateral aid, lowered her to a stage of contempt from which no talent could subsequently raise her. Amra early availed himself of the contentions amongst the sons of Aurangzeb to anticipate events, and formed a private treaty with the Mughal heir apparent, Shah Alam, when commanded 461 to the countries west of the Indus. On which occasion the Muir contingent accompanied him and fought several gallant actions under a Saktawat chieftain. Breach between the Rajputs and the Mughal Empire It is important to study the events of this period, which involved the overthrow of the Mughal power, and originated that form of society which paved the way to the dominion of Britain in these distant regions. From such a review a political lesson of great value may be learned 
which will show a beacon warning us. Against the danger of trusting to mere physical power, unaided. For 62 by the latent, but more durable support of moral influence. When Aurangzeb neglected the indigenous Rajputs, he endangered the keystone of his power. And in despising opinion, though his energetic mind might for a time render him independent of it, yet long before his death the enormous fabric reared by Akbar was tottering to its foundation, demonstrating to conviction that the highest order of talent, either for government or war, though aided by unlimited resources, will not suffice for the maintenance of power, unsupported by the affections of the governed. The empire of Aurangzeb was more extensive than that of Britain at this day, the elements of stability were incomparably more tenacious, he was associated with the Rajputs by blood, which seemed to guarantee a respect for their opinions. He possessed the power of distributing the honors and emoluments of the state, when a service could be rewarded by a province, drawing at will supplies of warriors from the mountains of the West, as a check on his indigenous subjects. While these left the plains of India to control the Afghan amidst the snows of Caucasus. But the most devoted attachment and most faithful service were repaid by insults to their habits and the imposition of an obnoxious tax and to the jizya, and the unwise pertinacity, with which his successors adhered to it, must be directly ascribed. The overthrow of the monarchy. No condition was exempted. From this odious and impolitic assessment, which was deemed by the tyrant a mild substitute for the conversion he once meditated, of the entire Hindu race to the creed of Islam. For sixty-three Rajput apostates. An abandonment of their faith was the Rajput's surest road to the tyrant's favor, and an instance of this dereliction in its consequences powerfully contributed to the annihilation of the empire. Rao Gopal, a branch of the Rana's family, held the fief of Rampura, on the Chumbal, and was serving with a select quota of his clan in the wars of the Deccan, when his son, who had been left at home, withheld the revenues, which he applied to his own use instead of remitting them to his father. Rao Gopal complained to the emperor. But the son discovered that he could by a sacrifice not only appease Aurangzeb, but attain the object of his wishes, he apostatized from his faith, and obtained the emperor's forgiveness, with the domain of Rampura. Disgusted and provoked at such infurious Conduct, Rao Gopal fled the camp, made an unsuccessful attempt to redeem his estate, and took refuge with Rana Amra, his suzerain. This natural asylum granted to a chief of his own kin was construed by the tyrant into a signal of revolt, and Azam was ordered to Malva to watch the Rana's motions, conduct, thus characterized in the memoirs of a Rajput chieftain. One of the most devoted to Aurangzeb, and who died fighting for his son. The emperor showed but little favor to his faithful and most useful subjects the Rajputs, which greatly cooled their ardor in his service. The Rana took up arms, and Malva joined the tumult. While the first eruption of the Marathas across the Nirbhada, under Nima Sindhya, compelled the emperor to detach Raja Jai Singh to join Prince Azam. Amidst these accumulated troubles, the Marathas rising into importance. The Rajput feudatories disgusted and alienated, his sons and grandsons ready to commit each individual pretension to the decision of the sword, did Aurangzeb. After a reign of terror of half a century's duration, breathe his last on the 28th Zilkada, a. d. 1707, February 21, at the city bearing his name, Aurangabad. For 64 Shah Alam Bahadur Shah, Emperor, A.D. 1707-12. At his death his second son Azam assumed the imperial dignity, and 
aided by the Rajput princes of Daisha and Kota, who had always served in his division, he marched to Agra to contest the legitimate claims of his eldest brother Muazam, who was advancing from Kabul supported by the contingents of Muir and Marvar, and all western Rajwara. The Battle of Jajau was fatal to Azam, who with his son Badarbakht and the princes of Kota and Daisha was slain, when Muazam ascended the throne under the title of Shah Alam Bahadur Shah. This prince had many qualities which endeared him to the Rajputs, to whom his sympathies were united by the ties of blood, his mother being a Rajput princess. Had he immediately succeeded the beneficent Shah Jahan, the race of Timur, in all human probability, would have been still enthroned at Delhi, and might have presented a picture of one of the most powerful monarchies of Asia. But Aurangzeb had inflicted an incurable wound on the mind of the Hindu race, which forever estranged them from his successors. Nor were the virtues of Bahadur, during the short luster of his sway, capable of healing it. The bitter fruit of a long experience had taught the Rajputs not to hope for amelioration from any graft of that stem, which, like the deadly upas, had stifled the vital energies of Rajasthan, whose leaders accordingly formed a league for mutual preservation, which it would have been madness to dissolve merely because a fair portion of virtue was the inheritance of the tyrant's successor. They had proved that no act of duty or subserviency could guarantee them from the infatuated abuse of power, and they were at length steeled against every appeal to their loyalty, replying with a trite adage, which we may translate, quem deus vult perdir, prius dementat, of common application with the Rajput in such a predicament. The rise of the Sikhs. The emperor was soon made to perceive the little support he had in future to expect from the Rajputs. Scarcely had he quashed the pretensions of Kambaksh, his youngest brother, who proclaimed himself emperor in the Deccan. Then he was forced to the north, in consequence of an insurrection. For sixty-five of the Sikhs of Lahore. This singular race, the disciples, Sikhs, of a teacher called Nanak, were the descendants of the Sithic. Jidi, or Jat, of Transoxiana, who so early as the 5th century, were established in the tract watered by the five arms, Panjab, of the Indus. Little more than a century has elapsed since their conversion from a spurious Hinduism to the doctrines of the sectarian Nanak, and their first attempt to separate themselves in temporal as well as spiritual matters, from all control. And they are now the sole independent power within the limits of the Mughal monarchy. On this occasion the princes of Amber and Marvar visited the emperor, but left his camp without permission. And, as the historian adds, manifested a design to struggle for independence. Such was the change in their mutual circumstances that the Mughal sent the heir apparent to conciliate and conduct them to him. But they came at the head of all their native bands, when, they were gratified with whatever their insolence demanded, a splenetic effusion of the historian, which well paints their altered position. From the royal Urdu or camp, they repaired to Rana Amra at Udaipur, where a triple league was formed, which once more united them to the head of their nation. This treaty of unity of interests against the common foe was solemnized by nuptial engagements, from which those princes had been excluded since the reigns of Akbar and Partop. To be readmitted to this honor was the basis of this triple alliance, in which they ratified on oath the renunciation of all connection, domestic or political, with the empire. It was. Moreover, stipulated that the sons of such marriage should be heirs, or if the issue were females, that they should never be dishonored by being married to a mogul. Sacrifice of the right of primogeniture. But this remedy, as will be seen, originated a worse disease. It was a sacrifice of the 
rights of primogeniture, clung to by the Rajputs with extreme pertinacity, productive of the most injurious effects, which for 66 introduced domestic strife and called upon the stage and umpire, not less baneful than the power from whose iron grasp they were on the point of freeing themselves, for although this treaty laid prostrate the throne of Babur, it ultimately introduced the Marathas as partisans in their family disputes, who made the bone of contention their own. The injudicious support afforded by the emperor to the apostate chief of Rampura first brought the Triple Federation into action. The Rana, upholding the cause of Himat Singh, made an attack on Rampura, which the apostate usurper Rutan Singh, now Raj Muslim Khan, defeated, and was rewarded for it by the emperor. But the same report conveyed to the king, that the Rana determined to lay waste his country, and retire to the hills, which was speedily confirmed by the unwelcome intelligence that Sawaldas, an officer of the Ranas, had attacked Firaz Khan. The governor of Permundal, who was obliged to retreat with great loss to Ajmer. On which occasion this loyal descendant of the illustrious Jaimal lost his life. The brave Durgadas, who conveyed the rebellious Akbar through all opposition to a place of refuge, again appeared upon the stage, his own prince being unable to protect him, he had found a safe asylum at Udaipur. And had the sum of 500 rupees daily paid for his expenditure, a princely liberality. But the result of this combination was reserved for the following reigns, Shah Alam being carried off by poison, ere he could correct the disorders which were rapidly breaking up the empire from the Hindu Kush to the ocean. Had his life been spared, his talents for business, his experience, and courteous manners might have retarded the ruin of the monarchy, which the utter unworthiness of his successor sunk beyond the power of man to redeem. Every 467 subsequent succession was through blood, and the sons of Shah Alam performed the part for which they had so many great examples. Two brothers, Sayyids, from the town of Barha in the Duab, were long the Warwicks of Hindustan, setting up and plucking down its puppet kings at their pleasure. They had elevated Farukhsiyar when the triumvirs of Rajasthan commenced their operations. Farukhsiyar, Emperor, A.D. 1712-19 Giving loose to long suppressed Resentment, the Rajputs abandoned the spirit of Toleration which it would have been criminal to preserve. And Profiting by the lessons of their tyrants, they overthrew the Mosques built on the sites of their altars, and treated the civil and religious officers of the government with indignity. Of these, every town in Rajasthan had its mullah to proclaim the name of Muhammad and its kazi for the administration of justice, branches of government entirely wrested from the hands of the native princes, abusing the name of independence. But for a moment it was redeemed, especially by the brave Rattors, who had made a noble resistance contesting every foot of land since. The death of Jasvant Singh, and now his son Ajit entirely expelled. The Mughals from Marvar. On this occasion the native forces of the Triple Alliance met at the Salt Lake of Sumbar, which was made the common boundary of their territory, and its revenues were equally divided amongst them. The pageant of an emperor, guided by the Sayyids, or those who intrigued to supplant their ministry, made an effort to oppose the threatening measures of the Rajputs. And one of them, the Amiru el Amara, marched against Raja Ajit, who received private instructions from the emperor to resist his commander-in-chief, whose credit was strengthened by the means taken to weaken it, which engendered suspicions of treachery. Ajit leagued with the Sayyids, who held out to the Rator an important share of power at court, and agreed to pay tribute and give a daughter in marriage to Farukhsiyar. For 68 marriage of Farukhsiyar, grant to the British. This marriage yielded most important results, which were not confined to the Mughals or Rajputs, for to it may be ascribed the rise of the British. Power in India. A dangerous malady, rendering necessary a surgical operation upon Farukhsiyar, to which the faculty of the court were unequal, retarded the celebration of the nuptials between the emperor and the Rajput princess of Marvar, and even threatened a fatal termination. A mission from the British 
merchants at Surat was at that time at court, and, as a last resource, the surgeon attached to it was called in, who cured the malady, and made the emperor happy in his bride. His gratitude was displayed with oriental magnificence. The emperor desired Mr. Hamilton to name his reward, and to the disinterested patriotism of this individual did the British owe. The first royal grant or farman, conferring territorial possession and great commercial privileges. These were the objects of the mission, which till this occurrence had proved unsuccessful. This gorgeous court ought to have been, and probably was, impressed with a high opinion of the virtuous self-denial of the inhabitants of Britain. And if history has correctly preserved the transaction, some mark of public gratitude should have been forthcoming from those who so signally benefited thereby. But to borrow the phraseology of the Italian historian, obligations which do not admit of being fully discharged are often repaid with the coin of ingratitude, the remains of this man rest in the churchyard of Calcutta. Without even a stone to mark the spot. For sixty-nine the jizya reimposed. This marriage, which promised a renewal of interests with the Rajputs, was soon followed by the revival of the obnoxious jizya. The character of this tax, though, much altered from its original imposition by Aurangzeb, when it was at once financial and religious, was held in unmitigated abhorrence by the Hindus from the complex association. And, although it was revived chiefly to relieve pecuniary wants, it kindled a universal feeling of hatred amongst all classes, and quenched the little zeal which the recent marriage had inspired in the Rajputs of the desert. The mode and channel of its introduction evinced to them that there was no hope that the intolerant spirit which originally suggested it would ever be subdued. The weak Faruxiar, desirous of snapping the leading strings of the Sayyids, recalled to his court in Nayatu Lla. Khan, the minister of Aurangzeb, and restored to him his office. Of Diwan, who, to use the words of the historian of the period, did not consult the temper of the times, so very different from the reign of Aurangzeb, and the revival of the jizya came with him, though by no means severe in its operation, not amounting to three quarters per cent on annual income, from which the lame, the blind, and very poor were exempt, it nevertheless raised a general spirit of hostility particularly from its retaining the insulting distinction of a tax on infidels. Resistance to taxation appears to be a universal feeling, in which even the Asiatic forgets the divine right of sovereignty, and which throws us back on the pervading spirit of selfishness which governs human nature. The tamga, or stamp tax, which preceded the jizya, would appear to have been as unsatisfactory as it was. General, from the solemnity of its renunciation by Babur on the field of battle after the victory over infidels, which gave him the crown of India. And though we have no record of the jizya being its substitute, there are indications which authorize the inference. For 70 Rana Amar Singh asserts Rajput independence. Rana Amra was not an idle spectator of these occurrences. And although the spurious thirst for distinction so early broke up the alliance by detaching Ajit, he redoubled his efforts for personal independence. And with it that of the Rajput nation. An important document attests this solicitude, namely, a treaty with the emperor, in which the second article stipulates emancipation from the galling jizya. It may be well to analyze this treaty, which attests the 471 altered condition of both parties. Its very title marks the subordination of the chief of the Rajputs. But while this is headed at a memorandum of requests, the eighth article discloses the effective means of the Rana, for there he assumes an air of protection towards the emperor. In the opening stipulation, for the mansab of seven thousand, the mind reverts to the great Amra, who preferred abdication to acknowledgement of a superior, but 
opinion had undergone a change as great as the mutual relations of the Rajputs. In temporal dignities other states had risen to an equality with Muir, and all had learned to look on the mogul as the fountain of honor. The abolition of the jizya, freedom. From religious restraint, control over the ancient feudatories of his house, and the restoration of all sequestrations, distinguish the other articles, and amply attest the improving attitude of Muir and the rapid decay of the Mughal Empire. The Marathas under Raja Sahu were successfully prosecuting their peculiar system in the south, with the same feelings which characterized the early Gothic invaders of Italy. Strangers to settled government. They imposed the taxes of Chauf and Desmuki, the fourth and tenth of all territorial income, in the countries they overran. The Jat tribes west of the Chumbal likewise bearded their oppressors in this reign, by hoisting the standard of independence at the very threshold of their capital. And from the siege of Sinzaini, mentioned in this treaty, to the last storm of Bertapur, they maintained the consequence thus assumed. Death of Rana Amar Singh. This treaty was the last act of Rana Amar's life, he died in A.D. 1716, leaving the reputation of an active and high-minded prince, who well upheld his station in the prosperity of his country, notwithstanding the anarchy of the period. His encouragement of agriculture and protection of manufactures are displayed in the edicts engraved on pillars which will hand down his name to posterity. His memory is held in high veneration. Nor do the Rajputs admit the absolute degradation of Muir till the period of the second prince in succession to Amra. The cushion, by which a Rajput throne is designated. Dub, Synodon Dactylon, the most common and useful Indian grass, what, Kam Prod, 463f. Gaddi Kian. I give these anecdotes as related to me by his descendant and representative the Raja of Banera, while seated in a balcony of his castle overlooking the plains of Muir. Often have I quenched my thirst at the fountain, and listened to their traditionary tales. It is a spot consecrated to recollections, every altar which rises around it is a text for the great ancients of the clans to expatiate on. And it is, moreover, a grand place of rendezvous, whether for the traveller or sportsman. Beam dislocated his spine in a feat of strength. He was celebrated for activity, and could, while his steed was urged to his speed, disengage and suspend himself by the arms from the bough of a tree, and to one of these experiments he owed his death. The Bojpur Lake, which covered an area of 250 square miles, was much larger, the Jasamund covering only 21 square miles, Smith, H.I., 396, Erskine II. A. 8F. Pancholi, Panchali, of which the derivation is uncertain, perhaps Panchakula, five houses, is the local title of the Desi or Mather Kayas, or writer caste, census report Marvar, 1891, 2. 111. Dot. Beri Sal of Bajolia, Kandal of Salumbar, Gopinath of Ganerao, and the Solunki of Desuri. Private treaty between the Rana and Shah Lam Bahadur Shah, and bearing his sign manual. Six articles of engagement, just, and tending to the happiness of the people, have been submitted by you, and by me accepted, and with God's blessing shall be executed without deviation. 1. The re-establishment of Chitter as in the time of Shah Jahan. 2. Prohibition of kind killing. 3. The restoration of all the districts held in the reign of Shah Jahan. 4. Freedom of faith and religious worship, as during the government of him whose nest is paradise, Akbar. 5. Whoever shall be dismissed by you shall receive no countenance from the king. 6. The abrogation of the contingent for the service of the Deccan. From the second of these articles, which alternate between stipulations of a temporal and spiritual nature, we may draw a lesson of great political importance. In all the treaties which have come under my observation, the insertion of an article against the slaughter of kine was prominent. 
This sacrifice to their national prejudices was the subject of discussion with every ambassador when the states of Rajasthan formed engagements with the British government in 1817-18, the prohibition of kind killing within their respective limits. From the construction of our armies we could not guarantee this article, but assurances were given that every practical attention would be paid to their wishes. And kind are not absolutely slain within the jurisdiction of any of these Rajput princes. But even long habit, though it has familiarized, has not reconciled them to this revolting sacrifice. Nor would the kind killer in Muir be looked upon with less detestation than was Cambyses by the Egyptians, when he thrust his lance into the flank of Apis. But in time this will be overlooked, and the verbal assurance will become a dead letter. Men of good intention will be lulled into the belief that, because not openly combated, the prejudice is extinct, and that homage to our power has obliterated this article of their creed. Thus Aurangzeb thought, but he avowedly and boldly opposed the religious opinions of his tributaries, we only hold them in contempt, and even protect them when productive of no sacrifice. Yet if we look back on the early page of history, we shall find both policy and benevolence combined to form this legislative protection to one of the most useful of domestic animals, and which would tempt the belief that Triptolemus, the lawgiver of Sparta, had borrowed from Manu, Laws, 11. 60, 69, 71, or rather from the still greater friends of dumb creatures, the Gines, in the law which exempted not only the lordly bull from the knife, but every living thing. The Muir contingent had been serving under Ozum in the south, as the following letter from him to the Rana discloses, be it known to Rana Amra Singh, your artsy, petition, arrived, and the accounts of your mother gave me great grief. But against the decrees of God there is no struggling. Pray for my welfare. Raja Ray Singh made a request for you, you are my own, rest in full confidence and continue in your obedience. The lands of your illustrious ancestors shall all be yours, but this is the time to evince your duty, the rest learn from your own servants, continue to think of me. Your Rajputs have behaved well. It consisted of twenty-two Nakaraban chiefs, i.e. each entitled to a kettle drum, and fifteen Turais, or chiefs, entitled to brass trumpets. As a mark of favor, kettle drums, Nakara, and the right to play them, Nobbit, might be granted to a subject, but he must be a man of the rank of two thousand sawar, troopers, or upwards. As an invariable condition, however, it was stipulated they should not be used when the emperor was present, or within a certain distance from his residence, Irvine, Army of the Indian Moguls, 30, 208 f. In lieu of all, what reward does Britain hold out to the native population to be attached? Heavy duties exclude many products of their industry from the home market. The rates of pay to civil officers afford no security to integrity. And the faithful soldier cannot aspire to higher reward than 120 pounds per annum, were his breast studded with medals. Even their prejudices are often too little considered, prejudices, the violation of which lost the throne of India, in spite of every local advantage, to the descendants of Aurangzeb. Jizya, meaning tribute, was a capitation tax imposed on subjects, Zimi, who did not follow the state religion, Islam. Its hardship lay in the fact that it was additional to, and about the same amount as the revenue demand, the latter being thus nearly doubled. Great merchants in the time of Aurangzeb paid 13.8 rupees, the middle class 6.12 rupees, the poor 3 rupees. 8 per annum per head, Manuchi 2. 234, on the Jizya C. Hughes, Dictionary Islam, 248, Smith, Akbar the Great Mogul, 65 F, Keen, Turks in India, 153 FF, Grant Duff, History of the Marathas, 145, Jadunath Sarkar, Life of Aurangzeb, 3. 305 FF. Rampura Banpura, City of the Sun, to distinguish it from Rampura Tonk. Rao Gopal was of the Shandarawat clan. See note. Rao Dulput Bundela of Daisha, a portion of whose memoirs were presented to me by the reigning prince, his descendant. A. D. 1706-7. The Marathas crossed the Nirbutta in 1705, Grant Duff, History Marathas, 177, Malcolm, Memoir Central India, I. 58 FF. The latter remarks that they came to attack the government, not the people, 
and acted with the concurrence of the Hindu chiefs discontented with the policy of Aurangzeb. Rao Dolput, Bundela, and Rao Ram Singh, Hara. 20 miles south of Agra, June 7, 1707. Nawab Bai, daughter of the Raja of Rajori, Kashmir, who died in 1690, Manuchi II. 57, note, dot. See History of the Tribes, Article, Jots. AD 1709-10. Memoirs of Iradat Khan, translated by Captain Jonathan Scott. Extracts from the work of Iradat Khan will be found in Elliot Dowson 7. 534 F. Also autograph letters of all those princes, with files of the regular newspapers, Akbars, of the day, in my possession, dated from the emperor's camp. Memoirs of Iradat Khan. Hence the corruption of Horde. Newspapers, dated 3rd Rajab, San. 3, 3rd year of his reign. Newspapers, 10th Rajab, San. 3. Newspapers, 5th Shavel, San. 3. The following edict, which caused this action, I translated from the archives. It is addressed to the son of Sawaldas, Maharna Amra Singh to Rathor Ray Singh Saldasit, race of Sawaldas, lay waste your villages and the country around you, your families shall have other habitations to dwell in, for particulars consult Dulit. Singh Khandawat, obey these. Asoj, S. 1764, December. A.D. 1708. February 18, A.D. 1712. The Musulman authorities do not corroborate the assertion that he was poisoned. Hussein Ali and Abdul L.A. Khan. Next to kind killing was the article inhibiting the introduction of the Adalat, or British Courts of Justice, into the Rajput states, in all their treaties with the British government in A.D. 1817-18, the very name of which is abhorrent to a native. The title of Hussein Ali, as Kutbu el Mulk, the axis of the state, was that of his brother Abdul L.A. A white swelling or tumor on the back. The ceremony is described, as it was celebrated, with true Asiatic pomp. The Amir al Amra conducted the festivities on the part of the bride, and the marriage was performed with a splendor and magnificence till then unseen among the princes of Hindustan. Many pompous insignia were added to the royal cortege upon this occasion. The illuminations rivaled the planets, and seemed to upbraid the faint luster of the stars. The nuptials were performed at the palace of the Amir al Amra, whence the emperor conveyed his bride with the highest splendor of imperial pomp to the citadel. Amidst the resoundings of musical instruments and the acclamations of the people, Scott's History of Aurangzeb's Successors, Volume I, for the cure of Faruxiar by Surgeon W. Hamilton C. C. R. H. Wilson, Early Annals of the English in Bengal, 2. 235. There is a monument of Hamilton in St. John's Church, Calcutta, IGI, X. 280. Dot. Inayatu LLA Khan, a Persian of Nishapur, was tutor of Zebuan Nisa Begam, daughter of Aurangzeb, and held high office in his reign and in that of Faruxiar. He died in 1726, Beale, S.V. 13 rupees on every 2,000 rupees. Altanga, the Red Seal, technically, a royal grant. On its remission by Babur C. Erskine, History of India, I. 467. Elliot remarks that the Altanga as a tax was enforced as early as the time of Alauddin and Firas Shah, Elliot Dowson 3. 365. For the use of the seal see Memoirs of Jahangir, Trans. Rogers Beveridge, 23. Memorandum of Requests. 1. The Mansab of 7000, the highest grade of rank. 2. Farman of engagement under the Panja private seal and sign that the jizya shall be abolished, that it shall no longer be imposed on the Hindu nation, at all events, that none of the Shagatai race shall authorize it in Muir. Let it be annulled. 3. The contingent of 1,000 horse for service in the Deccan to be excused. 4. All places of Hindu faith to be rebuilt, with perfect freedom of religious worship. 5. If my uncles, brothers, or chiefs, repair to the presence, to meet no encouragement. 6. The Bhumias of Deolia, Banswara, Dungarpur, and Sirahi, besides other zamindars over whom I am to have control, 
they shall not be admitted to the presence. 7. The forces I possess are my chiefs, what troops you may require for a given period, you must furnish with rations, petty, and when the service is over, their accounts will be settled. 8. Of the Hactors, Zamindars, Mansabdars, who serve you with zeal and from the heart, let me have a list, and those who are not obedient I will punish, but in effecting this no demand is to be made for Paymali. List of the districts attached to the Panjazari, at present under sequestration, to be restored, Fulia, Mandalgar, Bad Noor, Pur, Basar, Gayaspur, Pardhar, Banswara, Dungarpur. Besides the five thousand of old, you had on ascending the throne granted an increase of one thousand, and on account of the victory at Sinzaini one thousand more, of two and three horse. Of three crores of dams in gift, Inam, namely, two according to Farman, and one for the payment of the contingent in the Deccan, and of which two are immediately required, you have given me in lieu thereof Sirahi. Districts now desired, Idar, Kekri, Mundal, Jahajpur, Malpur, and another illegible. Destruction of property, alluding to the crops which always suffered in the movements of disorderly troops. Mansab of five thousand. It was usual to allow two and three horses to each cavalier when favor was intended. Forty dams to the rupee. Sahu, the honest, respectable man, a title given by Aurangzeb to Savaji, son of Sambaji, Grant Duff, 184. Dot. Desmukhi from Sardsmuk, an officer exercising police and revenue jurisdiction under the Marathas. These taxes were confirmed in favor of Savaji in 1665, Ibid, 94. Dot. Chapter 15. Rana Sangram Singh II, AD 1710-34. Sangram Singh, the Lion of Battle, succeeded, a name renowned in the annals of Muir, being that of the opponent of the founder of the Mughals. He ascended the throne about the same time with Muhammad. Shah, the last of the race of Timur who deserved the name of Emperor of India. During the reign of Sangram, from A.D. 1716 to 1734, this mighty empire was dismembered. When, in lieu of one paramount authority, numerous independent governments started up, which preserved their uncertain existence until the last revolution, which has given a new combination to these discordant materials, Mohammedan, Maratha, and Rajput, in the course of one century under the dominion of a handful of Britons, like the satraps of the ancient Persian, or the lieutenants. Of Alexander, each chief proclaimed himself master of the province, the government of which was confided to his loyalty and talents. And it cannot fail to diminish any regret at the successive prostration of Bengal, Oud, Hyderabad, and other less conspicuous states, to remember that they were founded in rebellion and erected on ingratitude, and that their rulers were destitute of those sympathies, which could alone give stability to their ephemeral greatness, by improving the condition of their subjects. With the Marathas the case is different, their emergence to power claims our admiration, when tyranny transformed the industrious husbandman, and the minister of religion, into a hardy and enterprising soldier, and a skillful functionary of government had their ambition been restrained within legitimate bounds. It would have been no less gratifying than politically and morally just that the family of Savaji should have retained its authority in countries which his active valor wrested from Aurangzeb. But the genius of conquest changed their natural habits, they devastated instead of consolidating. And in lieu of that severe and frugal simplicity, and that energy of enterprise, which were their peculiar characteristics, they became distinguished for mean parsimony, low cunning, and dastardly depredation. Had they, retaining their original character, been content with their proper sphere of action, the Deccan, they for seventy-three might yet have held the sovereignty of that vast region, where their habits and language assimilated them with the people. 
but as they spread over the north they encountered national antipathies, and though professing the same creed, a wider difference in sentiment divided the Maratha from the Rajput. Then from the despots of Delhi, whose tyrannical intolerance was more endurable, because less degrading, than the rapacious meanness of the South Ron. Rajasthan benefited by the demolition of the empire, to all but Muir it yielded an extension of power. Had the national mind been allowed to repose, and its energies to recruit, after so many centuries of demoralization, all would have recovered their strength, which lay in the opinions and industry of the people. A devoted tenantry and brave vassalage, whom we have so often depicted as abandoning their habitations and pursuits to aid the patriotic views of their princes. Deposition of Faruxiar, Nizamuel Mulk. The short reign of Faruxiar was drawing to a close. Its end was accelerated by the very means by which that monarch hoped to emancipate himself from the thraldom of the Sayyids, against whose authority the faction of Anayatu Lla was but a feeble counterpoise, and whose arbitrary habits in the re-establishment of the Jizya lost him even the support of the father of his queen. It was on this occasion that the celebrated Nizamu el Mulk, the founder of the Hyderabad state, was brought upon the stage, he then held the unimportant charge of the district of Muradabad. But possessed of high talents, he was bought over by the promise of the government of Malva to further the views of the Sayyids. Supported by a body of ten thousand Marathas, these makers of kings soon manifested their displeasure by the deposal of Faruxiar, who was left without any support but that of the princes of Amber and Bundy. Yet they would never have abandoned him had he hearkened to their counsel to take the field and trust his cause to them, but, cowardly and infatuated, he refused to quit the walls of his palace and threw himself upon the mercy of his enemies who made him dismiss the faithful Rajputs and admit a guard of honor of their troops into the citadel. 474 Murder of Faruxiar, May 16, 1719 Faruxiar hoped for security in the inviolability of the harem, but he found no sanctuary even there, to use the words of the Mughal memoir. Night advanced, and day, like the fallen star of the emperor, sunk in darkness. The gates of the citadel were closed upon his friends, the Wazir and Ajit Singh remained within. This night was dreadful to the inhabitants of the city. No one knew what was passing in the palace, and the troops under the Amiru el Amara, with ten thousand Marathas, remained under arms, mourning. Came, and all hope was extinguished by the royal band, Nabat. Announcing the deposal of Faruxiar. In the proclamation of Raphia de Darajat, his successor. The interval between the deposal and the death of an Asiatic prince is short, and even while the heralds vociferated, Long live the king, to the new puppet. The bowstring was on the neck of the contemptible Faruxiar. 475 Accession of Raphia de Darajat. The first act of the new reign. AD 1719 was one of conciliation towards Ajit Singh and the Rajputs, namely, the abrogation of the Jizya and the Sayyids. Further showed their disposition to attach them by conferring the important office of Diwan on one of their own faith, Raja Rutan. Chand was accordingly inducted into the ministry in lieu of Inayatu Lla. Accession of Roshan Akhtar Muhammad Shah, AD 1719-48. 3. Phantoms of royalty flitted across the scene in a few months. Till Roshan Akhtar, the eldest son of Bahadur Shah, was enthroned with the title of Muhammad Shah, A.D. 1720, during whose reign of nearly thirty years the empire was completely dismembered, and Marathas from the south disputed its spoils. With the Afghan mountaineers. The haughty demeanor of the 
Sayyids disgusted all who acted with them, especially there. Coadjutor the Nizam, of whose talents, displayed in restoring. Malva to prosperity, they entertained a dread. It was impossible. To cherish any abstract loyalty for the puppets they established. And treason lost its name, when the Nizam declared for independence. Which the possession of the fortresses of Assur and Burhampur enabled him to secure. The brothers had just cause. For alarm. The Rajputs were called upon for their contingents. For seventy-six and the princes of Kota and Nirvar gallantly interposed their own retainers to cut off the Nizam from the Nirbutta, on which occasion the Kota prince was slain. The independence of the Nizam led to that of Aud. Sadat Khan was then but the commandant of Bayana, but he entered into the conspiracy to expel the Sayyids, and was one of those who drew lots to assassinate the Amiru el Amara. The deed was put into execution on the march to reduce the Nizam, when Haidar Khan buried his poniard in the Amir's heart. The emperor then in camp, being thus freed, returned against the Wazir, who instantly set up Ibrahim and marched against his opponents. The Rajputs wisely remained neutral, and both armies met. The decapitation of Ruddin Chand was the signal for the battle, which was obstinate and bloody, the Wazir was made prisoner, and subjected to the bowstring. For the part Sadat Khan acted in the conspiracy. He was honored with the title of Bahadur Jang, and the government of Aud. The Rajput princes paid their respects to the conqueror, who confirmed the repeal of the Jizya, and as the reward of their neutrality the Rajas of Amber and Jodhpur, Jai, Singh and Ajit, were gratified the former with the government of the province of Agra, the last with that of Gujarat and Ujmer, of which latter fortress he took possession. Gurdhardas was made governor of Malva to oppose the Marathas, and the Nizam was invited from his government of Hyderabad to accept the office of Wazir of the Empire. The policy of Muir The policy of Muir was too isolated for the times. Her rulers clung to forms and unsubstantial homage, while their neighbors, with more active virtue, plunged into the tortuous policy of the imperial court and seized every opportunity to enlarge the boundaries of their states, and while Amber appropriated to herself the royal domains almost to the Jumna, while Marvar planted her banner on the battlements of Ajmer, dismembered Gujarat and pushed her clans far into the desert and even to the world's end. Muir confined her ambition to the control of her ancient feudatories of Abu. For seventy-seven Adar, and the petty states which grew out of her, Dungarpur and Benswara. The motive for this policy was precisely the same. Which had cost such sacrifices in former times, she dreaded. Amalgamating with the imperial court, and preferred political inferiority to the sacrifice of principle. The internal feuds of her two great clans also operated against her aggrandizement. And while the brave Saktawat, Jeth Singh, expelled the Rator from Idar and subdued the wild mountaineers even to Kalawara, the conquest was left incomplete by the jealousy of his rival, and he was recalled in the midst of his success. From these and other causes an important change took place in the internal policy of Muir, which tended greatly to impair her energies. To this period none of the vassals had the power to erect places of strength within their domains, which, as already stated, were not fixed, but subject to triennial change. Their lands were given for subsistence, their native hills were their fortresses, and the Frontier strongholds defended their families in time of invasion. As the Mughal power waned, the general defensive system was abandoned, while the predatory warfare which succeeded compelled them to stud their country with castles, in order to shelter their effects from the Maratha and Patan. 
and then later. Times to protect rebels. Rana Sangram ruled 18, 24, years, under Himur was respected, and the greater portion of her lost territory was regained. His selection of Biharidas Pancholi evinced his penetration, for never had Muir a more able or faithful minister, and numerous autograph letters of all the princes of his time attest his talent and his worth as the oracle of the period. He retained his office during three reigns, but his skill was unable to stem the tide of Maratha invasion, which commenced on the death of Sangram. Anecdotes of Rana Sangram Singh too. Tradition has preserved. Many anecdotes of Sangram, which aid our estimate of Rajput. Character, whether in the capacity of legislators or the more. Retired sphere of domestic manners. They uniformly represent. This Rana as a patriarchal ruler, wise, just, and inflexible, steady. In his application to business, regulating public and private. For 78 expenditure, and even the sumptuary laws, which were rigidly adhered to and on which the people still expatiate, giving homely illustrations of the contrast between them and the existing profusion. The Chauhan of Kotharia, one of the highest class of chieftains, had recommended in addition to the folds of the court robe, and as courtesy forbids all personal denial, his wish was assented to, and he retired to his estate pluming himself on his sovereign's acquiescence. But the Rana, sending for the minister, commanded the sequestration of two villages of Kotharia, which speedily reaching the ears of the chief, he repaired to court, and begged to know the fault which had drawn upon him this mark of displeasure. None, Rauji. But on a minute calculation, I find the revenue of these two villages will just cover the expense of the superfluity of garment which obedience to your Wishes will occasion me, and as every iota of my own income is appropriated. I had no other mode of innovating on our ancient costume than by making you bear the charge attending a compliance with your suggestion. It will readily be believed that the Chauhan prayed the revocation of this edict, and that he was careful for the future of violating the sumptuary laws of his sovereign. On another occasion, from lapse of memory or want of consideration, he broke the laws he had established, and alienated a village attached to the household. Each branch had its appropriate fund, whether for the kitchen, the wardrobe, the privy purse, the queens, these lands were called thua, and each had its officer, or thwater, all of whom were made accountable for their trust to the prime minister. It was one of these he had alienated. Seated with his chiefs in the rasora, or banqueting hall, there was no sugar forthcoming for the curds, which has a place in the dinner cart of all Rajputs, and he chid the superintendent for the omission. And Data, giver of food, replied the officer, the minister says you have given away the village set apart for sugar. Just, replied the Rana, and finished his repast without further remark, and without sugar to his curds. Another anecdote will show his inflexibility of character and his resistance to that species of interference in state affairs which is the bane of Asiatic governments. Sangram had recently emancipated himself from the trammels of a tedious minority, during which his mother, according to custom, acted a conspicuous 479 part in the guardianship of her son and the state. The chieftain of Dariawad had his estate confiscated, but as the Rana never punished from passion or pardoned from weakness, none dared to plead his cause, and he remained proscribed from court during two years. When he ventured a petition to the Queen Mother through the Bandarans, for the reversion of the decree, accompanied with a note for two lakhs of rupees, and a liberal donation to the fair mediators. It was the daily habit of the Rana to pay his respects to his mother before dinner, and on one of these visits she introduced the Ranavat's request, and begged the restoration of the estate. It was customary, on the issue of every grant, that eight days should elapse from the mandate to the promulgation of the edict, to which eight official seals were attached. But on the present occasion the Rana commanded the execution of the deed at once, and to have it ere he left the Ra'ala. On its being brought, he placed it respectfully in his mother's hands, begging her to return the note to the Ranavat. Having made this sacrifice to duty, he bowed and retired. The next day he commanded dinner an hour earlier, without the usual visit to the Ra'ala, 
all were surprised, but none so much as the Queen Mother, the day passed, another came, still no visit, and to a confidential message. She received a ceremonious reply. Alarmed for the loss of her son's affections, she pondered on the cause, but could find none, except the grant, she entreated the minister's interference. He respectfully intimated that he was interdicted from the discussion of state affairs but with his sovereign, she had recourse to other expedients, which proving alike fruitless, she became sullen, punished her damsels without cause. And refused food, Sangram still remained obdurate. She talked of a pilgrimage to the Ganges, and befitting equipage and escort were commanded to attend her, the moment of departure was at hand, and yet he would not see her. She repaired by amber on her route to Mathura, to worship the Apollo of Raj, when the great Raja Jai Singh, married to the Rana sister, for eighty advanced and conducted her to his new city of Jaipur. And to evince his respect, put his shoulder to the traveling litter or paki, and promised to return with her and be a suppliant to his brother-in-law for the restoration of his regard. She made a tour of the sacred places, and on return accepted the escort of the Prince of Amber. The laws of hospitality amongst the Rajputs are rigid, the Rana could not refuse to his guest the request for which he had left his capital, but averse to owing reconciliation to external intercession. And having done enough for the suppression of intrigue, he advanced to meet the cortege when within one march of Udaipur, as if to receive the Amber Prince. But proceeding direct to his mother's tents, he asked her blessing, and having escorted her to the palace, returned to greet and conduct his brother Prince. All the allusion he made to the subject was in the simple but pithy expression, family quarrels should be kept in the family. Another anecdote shows him as the vigilant shepherd watching over the safety of his flock. As he sat down to dinner, tidings arrived of an invasion of the Malva Patans, who had rifled several villages at Mandasar, carrying the inhabitants into captivity. Pushing the platter from him, he ordered his armor, and the Nakara to beat the assemblage of his chieftains. With all speed a gallant band formed on the terrace below, but they prevailed on the Rana to leave the punishment of the desultory aggression to them, as unworthy of his personal interference. They departed, for eighty-one several hours after, the chief of Kainar arrived, having left a sick bed and with a tertian come in obedience to his sovereign summons. Vain was his prince's dissuasion to keep him back, and he joined the band as they came up with the invaders. The foe was defeated and put to flight, but the sick chieftain fell in the charge, and his son was severely wounded by his side. On the young chief repairing to court he was honored with a bira from the Rana's own hand, a distinction which he held to be an ample reward for his wounds, and testimonial of the worth of his father. The existence of such sentiments are the strongest tests of character. On another occasion, some parasite had insinuated suspicions against the chief of the nobles, the Rawad of Salumbar, who had just returned victorious in action with the royal forces at Malva, and had asked permission to visit his family on his way to court. The Rana spurned the suspicion, and to show his reliance on the chief, he dispatched a messenger for Salumbar to wait his arrival and summon him to the presence. He had reached his domain, given leave to his vassals as they passed their respective abodes, dismounted, and reached the door of the Raala, when the herald called aloud, The Rana salutes you, Rawaji, and commands this letter. With his hand on the door where his wife and children awaited him, he demanded his horse, and simply leaving his duty for his mother, he mounted, with half a dozen attendants, nor loosed the rein until he reached the capital. It was midnight. His house empty no servants, no dinner, but his sovereign had foreseen and provided, and when his arrival was announced, provender for his cattle, and vessels of provision prepared in the royal kitchen, were immediately sent to his abode. Next morning Salumbar attended the court. The Rana was unusually gracious, and not only presented him with the usual tokens of regard, a horse, and jewels, but moreover a grant of land. With surprise he asked what service he had performed to merit such distinction and from a sentiment becoming the descendant of Kanda solemnly refused to accept it, observing, that even if he had lost his head, the reward was 482 excessive. But if his prince would admit of his preferring a request, it would be, that in remembrance of his sovereign's favor, when he, or his, in after times, should on the summons come from their estate to the capital. The same number of dishes from the royal kitchen should be sent to his abode, it was granted, and to this day his descendants enjoy the distinction. 
These anecdotes paint the character of Sangram far more forcibly than any labored effort. His reign was as honorable to himself as it was beneficial to his country, in whose defense he had fought eighteen actions. But though his policy was too circumscribed, and his country would have benefited more by a surrender of some of those antique prejudices which kept her back in the general scramble for portions of the dilapidated monarchy of the Mughals. Yet he was respected abroad, as he was beloved by his subjects, of whose welfare he was ever watchful, and to whose wants ever indulgent. Rana Sangram was the last prince who upheld the dignity of the Gaddi of Baparaval, with his death commenced Maratha ascendancy, and with this we shall open the reign of his son and successor. Rana Jagat Singh II, AD 1734-51 Difficulties of Rajput Combination Jagat Singh II, the eldest of the four sons of Sangram, succeeded S. 1790, AD 1734 The commencement of His reign was signalized by a revival of the Triple Alliance formed by Rana Amra and broken by Raja Ajit's connection with the Sayyids and the renewal of matrimonial ties with the empire. The abjuration whereof was the basis of the treaty. The present engagement, which included all the minor states, was formed at Hura, a town in Muir on the Ujmer frontier, where the Confederate princes met at the head of their vassals. To ensure unanimity, the Rana was invested with paramount control, and headed the forces which were to take the field after the reigns, already set in. Unity of interests was the chief character. For eighty-three of the engagement, had they adhered to which, not only the independence, but the aggrandizement, of Rajasthan, was in their power, and they might have alike defied the expiring efforts of Mughal tyranny and the Parthian-like warfare of the Maratha. They were indeed the most formidable power in India at this juncture. But difficult as it had ever proved to coalesce the Rajputs for mutual preservation, even when a paramount superiority of power, both temporal and spiritual, belonged to the Ranas, so now, since Amber and Marvar had attained an equality with Muir, it was found still less practicable to prevent the operation of the principles of disunion. In fact, a moment's reflection must discover that the component parts of a great feudal federation, such as that described, must contain too many discordant particles, too many rivalries and national antipathies, ever cordially to amalgamate. Had it been otherwise, the opportunities were many and splendid for the recovery of Rajput. Freedom. But though individually enamored of liberty, the universality of the sentiment prevented its realization, they never would submit to the control required to work it out, and this, the best opportunity which had ever occurred, was lost. A glance at the disordered fragments of the throne of Akbar will show the comparative strength of the Rajputs. League of Nizamu-el-Mulk with Rajputs and Marathas. Nizamu-el-Mulk. For 84 had completely emancipated himself from his allegiance, and signalized his independence, by sending the head of the imperial general, who ventured to oppose it, as that of a traitor, to the emperor. He leagued with the Rajputs, and instigated Bajirao to plant the Maratha standard in Malva and Gujarat. In defending the former, Daya Bahadur fell. And Jai Singh of Amber, being nominated to the trust, delegated it to the invader, and Malva was lost. The extensive province of Gujarat soon shared the same fate. For in the vacillating policy of the court, the promise of that government to the Radors had been broken, and Abhai Singh, son of Ajit, who had expelled Sarbiland Khan after a severe contest, following the example of his brother Prince of Amber, connived with the invaders, while he added its most northern districts to Marvar. In Bengal, Behar, and Orissa, Shujodi Dalla, and his deputy Alawardi Khan, were supreme, and Safter Jang, son of Sadat Khan, was established in Oud. 
the basis disloyalty marked the rise of this family, which owed everything to Muhammad Shah. It was Sadat Khan who invited Nadir Shah, whose invasion gave the final stab to the empire. And it was his son, Safter Jang, who, when commandant of the artillery, Miraiadish, turned it against his sovereign's palace, and then conveyed it to Oud. Of the Diwans of Bengal we must speak only with reverence. But, whether they had any special dispensation, their loyalty to the descendant of Faruxiar has been very little more distinguished than that of the satraps enumerated, though the original tenure of Bengal is still apparent. And the feudal obligation to the suzerain of Delhi manifested, in the homage of petite surgentry, in transmitting with the annual fine of relief, 100 mohurs, the spices of the eastern archipelago. Yet of all those who gloried in the title of Fidwi Padsha I Ghazi, the only a slave of the victorious king, who has been generous to him in the day of his distress, is the Diwan of Bengal, better known as the English. 485 East India Company. In the hour of triumph they rescued the blind and aged descendants of the illustrious Babur from a state of degradation and penury, and secured to him all the dignity and comfort which his circumstances could lead him to hope. And the present state of his family, contrasted with the thraldom and misery endured while fortune favored the Maratha, is splendid. Yet perhaps the most acute stroke of fortune to this fallen monarch was when the British governor of India lent his aid to the descendant of the rebellious Safter Jang to mount the throne of Oud, and to assume, in lieu of the title of Wazir of the Empire, that of King. We can appreciate and commiserate the feeling, for the days of power were yet too recent for Akbar. Sani, the second, to receive such intelligence without a shock, or without comparing his condition with him whose name he bore. It is well to pause upon this page of Eastern history, which is full of instruction. Since by weighing the abuses of power, and its inevitable loss through placing a large executive trust in the hands of those who exercised it without sympathy towards the governed, we may at least retard the day of our decline. Maratha Raids The campaign of Nadir Shah, the Maratha Establishments in Malva and Gujarat constituted a nucleus for others to form upon, and like locusts, they crossed the Nirbuddha. In swarms. When the Holkars, the Sindhias, the Puars, and other less familiar names, emerged from obscurity. When the plow was deserted for the sword, and the goat herd made a lance of his crook. They devastated, and at length settled upon, the lands of the indigenous Rajputs. For a time the necessity of unity made them act under one standard, and hence the vast masses under the first Bajirao, which bore down all opposition, and afterwards dispersed themselves over those long oppressed regions. It was in A.D. 1735 that he first crossed the Chumbul and appeared before Delhi, which he blockaded, when his retreat was purchased by the surrender of the Choth, or fourth of the 486 gross revenues of the empire. The Nizam, dreading the influence such pusillanimous concession might exert upon his rising power, determined to drive the Marathas from Malva, where, if once fixed, they would cut off his communications with the north. He accordingly invaded Malva, defeated Bajirao in a pitched battle, and was only prevented from following it up by Nadir. Shah's advance, facilitated by the Afghans, who, on becoming independent in Kabul, laid open the frontiers of Hindustan. In this emergency, great hopes were placed on the valor of the Rajputs. But the spirit of devotion in this brave race, by whose aid the Mughal power was made and maintained, was irretrievably alienated, and not one of those high families, who had throughout been so lavish of their blood in its defense, would obey the summons to the royal standard, 
when the fate of India was decided. On the plains of Karnal. A sense of individual danger. Brought together the great home feudatories, when the Nizam. And Sadat Khan, now Wazir, united their forces under the. Imperial commander. But their demoralized levies were no. Match for the Persian and the northern mountaineer. The. Amiru el Amara was slain, the Wazir made prisoner, and Muhammad. Shah and his kingdom were at Nadir's disposal. The disloyalty of the Wazir filled the capital with blood, and subjected his sovereign to the condition of a captive. Jealous of the Nizam, whose diplomatic success had obtained him the office of Amiru el Amara, he stimulated the avarice of the conqueror by exaggerating the riches of Delhi and declared that he alone could furnish the ransom negotiated by the Nizam. Nadir's love of gold overpowered his principle, the treaty was broken, the keys of Delhi were demanded, and its humiliated emperor was led in triumph through the camp of the conqueror, who, on March 8, A.D. 1739, took possession of the palace of Timur and coined money bearing this legend. King over the kings of the world. Is Nadir, king of kings, and lord of the period. Plunder and massacre at Delhi. The accumulated wealth of India contained in the royal treasury, notwithstanding the lavish expenditure during the civil wars, and the profuse rewards. For eighty-seven scattered by each competitor for dominion, was yet sufficient to gratify even avarice itself. Amounting in gold, jewels, and plate. To forty million sterling, exclusive of equipages of every denomination. But this enormous spoil only kindled instead of satiating. The appetite of Nadir, and a fine of two millions and a half was. Exacted, and levied with such unrelenting rigor and cruelty on. The inhabitants. That men of rank and character could find no. Means of escape but by suicide. A rumor of this monster's death excited an insurrection, in which several Persians were killed. The provocation was not lost, the conqueror ascended a mosque and commanded a general massacre, in which thousands were slain. Pillage accompanied murder, whilst the streets streamed with blood, the city was fired, and the dead were consumed in the conflagration of their late habitations. If a single ray of satisfaction could be felt amidst such a scene of horror, it must have been when Nadir commanded the minister of the wretch who was the author of this atrocity, the infamous Sadat Khan, to send, on pain of death, an inventory of his own and his master's wealth, demanding meanwhile the two millions and a half, the original composition settled by the Nizam, from the Wazir alone. Whether his coward conscience was alarmed at the mischief he had occasioned, or mortification at discovering that his ambition had o'erleaped itself, and recoiled with vengeance on his own head, tempted the act, it is impossible to discover. But the guilty sought it became his own executioner. He swallowed poison, an example followed by his Diwan, Raja Majlis Ray, in order to escape the rage of the offended Nadir. By the new treaty, all the western provinces, Kabul, Tata, Sindh, and Multan, were surrendered and united to Persia, and on the vernal equinox, Nadir, gorged with spoil, commenced his march from the desolated Delhi. The philosophic for 88 comment of the native historian on these events is so just, that we shall transcribe it verbatim. The people of Hindustan at this period thought only of personal safety and gratification. Misery was disregarded by those who escaped it. And man, centered wholly in self, felt not for his kind. This selfishness, destructive of public and private virtue, was universal. In Hindustan at the invasion of Nadir Shah, nor have the people become more virtuous since, and consequently neither more happy nor more independent. 
results to the Rajputs. At this eventful era in the political history of India, the Rajput nation had not only maintained their ground amidst the convulsions of six centuries under the paramount sway of the Islamite, but two of the three chief states, Marvar and Amber, had by policy and valor created substantial states out of petty principalities, junior branches from which had established their independence, and for 89 still enjoy it under treaty with the British government. Muir at this juncture was defined by nearly the same boundaries as when Mahmud of Ghazni invaded her in the 10th century, though her influence over many of her tributaries, as Bundi, Abu, Idar, and Diolia, was destroyed. To the west, the fertile district of Godwar carried her beyond her natural barrier, the Aravali, into the desert, while the Chumbal was her limit to the east. The Kuri separated her from Ujmer, and to the south she adjoined Malva. These limits comprehended 130 miles of latitude and 140 of longitude, containing 10,000 towns and villages, with upwards of a million sterling of revenue. Raised from a fertile soil by an excellent agricultural population, a wealthy mercantile community, and defended by a devoted vassalage. Such was this little patriarchal state after the protracted strife which has been related. We shall have to exhibit her, in less than half a century, on the verge of annihilation from the predatory inroads of the Marathas. The coming of the Marathas. In order to mark with exactitude the introduction of the Marathas into Rajasthan, we must revert to the period when the dastardly intrigues of the advisers of Muhammad Shah surrendered to them as tribute the Chauf, or fourth of his revenues. Whether in the full tide of successful invasion, these spoilers deemed any other argument than force to be requisite in order to justify their extortions. They had in this surrender a concession of which the subtle Marathas were well capable of availing themselves. And as the Mughal claimed, sovereignty over the whole of Rajasthan, they might plausibly urge their right of chauf, as applicable to all the territories, subordinate to the empire, the Rajput coalition. The rapidity with which these desultory bands flew from conquest to conquest appears to have alarmed the Rajputs, and again brought about a coalition, which, with the characteristic peculiarity of all such contracts, was commenced by matrimonial alliances. On this occasion, Bijai Singh, the heir of Marvar, was affianced to the Rana's daughter, who, at the same time reconciled the princes of Marvar and Amber, whose positions at the court of the Mughal often brought their national jealousies into conflict, as they alternately took the lead in his councils, for it was rare to find both in the same. 490 line of politics. These matters were arranged at Udaipur. But, as we have often had occasion to observe, no public war. For 91 general benefit ever resulted from these alliances, which were obstructed by the multitude of petty jealousies inseparable from clanship. Even while this treaty was in discussion, the fruit of the Triple League formed against the tyranny of Aurangzeb was about to show its baneful influence, as will presently appear. Bajirao visits Muir. Negotiations with the Marathas. When Malva was acquired by the Marathas, followed by the cession of the Chauf, their leader, Bajirao, repaired to Muir, where his visit created great alarm. The Rana desired to avoid a personal for 92 interview, and sent as his ambassadors, the chief of Salumbar, and his prime minister, Bihari Das. Long discussions followed as. For 93 to the mode of Bajirao's reception, which was settled to be on the same footing as the Raja of Banera, and that he should be seated in front of the throne. A treaty followed, stipulating an annual. For 94 tribute, which remained in force during ten years, when grasping 
At the whole they despised a part, and the treaty became a nullity. The dissensions which arose soon after, in consequence of the Rajput engagements, afforded the opportunity sought for to mix in their internal concerns. Right of primogeniture. It may be recollected that in the family engagements formed by Rana Amra there was an obligation to invest the issue of such marriage with the rights of primogeniture and the death of Sawai Jai Singh of Amber, too. Years after Nadir's invasion, brought that stipulation into effect. His eldest son, Isari Singh, was proclaimed Raja, but a strong party supported Madho Singh, the Rana's nephew, and the stipulated, against the natural order of succession. We are left in doubt as to the real designs of Jai Singh in maintaining his guarantee, which was doubtless inconvenient. But that Madho Singh was not brought up to the expectation is evident. From his holding a fief of the Rana Sangram, who appropriated the domain of Rampara for his support, subject to the service of 1,000 horse and 2,000 foot, formally sanctioned by his father, who allowed the transfer of his services. On the other hand, the letter of permission entitles him Kshima, prosperous. An epithet only applied to the heir apparent of Jaipur. Five years, however, elapsed before any extraordinary exertions were made to annul the rights of Isari Singh, who led his vassals to the Sutledge in order to oppose the first invasion of the Duranis. It would be tedious to give even an epitome of the intrigues for the development of this object, which properly belonged to the Annals of Amber, and whence resulted many of the troubles of Rajputana. The Rana took the field with his nephew, and was met by Isari Singh, supported by the Marathas, but the Sisodias did not evince in the Battle of Rajmahal that gallantry, which must have its source in moral strength, they were defeated and fled. The Rana vented his indignation in a galling sarcasm. For ninety-five he gave the sword of state to a common courtesan to carry in. Procession, observing, it was a woman's weapon in these degenerate. Times, a remark the degrading severity of which made a lasting impression in the decline of Muir. Elated with this success, Isari Singh carried his resentments and his auxiliaries. Under Sindhya, against the Harris of Kota and Bundy, who supported the cause of his antagonist. Kota stood a siege and was gallantly defended, and Sindhya, a Paji, lost an arm, on this occasion both the states suffered a diminution of territory and were subjected to tribute. The Rana, following the example of the Kachwahas, called in as auxiliary Mulhar Rao Holkar, and engaged to pay 64 lakhs of rupees, 800,000 pounds, on the depot sal of Isari Singh. To avoid degradation this unfortunate prince resolved on suicide, and a dose of poison gave Madho Singh. The Guddi, Holkar his bribe, and the Marathas a firm hold upon. Rajasthan. Such was the cause of Rajput abasement. The moral force of the vassals was lost in a contest unjust in all its associations, and from this period we have only the degrading spectacle of civil strife and predatory spoliation till the existing treaty of ad 1817 death of rana jugat singh II, ad 1751 in s 1808 ad 1752 rana jugat singh died addicted to pleasure his habits of levity and profusion totally unfitted him for the task of governing his country at such a juncture he considered his elephant. Fights of more importance than keeping down the Marathas. Like all his family, he patronized the arts, greatly enlarged the palace, and expended 250,000 pounds in embellishing the islets of the Piccola. The villas scattered over the valley were all erected by him, and many of those festivals devoted to idleness and dissipation, and now firmly rooted at Udaipur, were instituted by Jugat Singh II. Chapter 16. Rana Partap Singh II, 
AD 1751-54. Part Top 2. Succeeded in. AD 1752. Of the history of this prince, who renewed the most. Illustrious name in the annals of Muir, there is nothing to record. Beyond the fact, that the three years he occupied the throne were. Marked by so many Maratha invasions and war contributions. By a daughter of Raja Jai Singh of Amber he had a son, who succeeded him. Rana Raj Singh II, A.D. 1754-61. Rana Raj Singh II was as little entitled to the name he bore as his predecessor. During the seven years he held the dignity at least seven shoals of the sovereigns over Muir, and so exhausted this country, that the Rana was compelled to ask pecuniary aid from the Brahmin, collector of the tribute, to enable him to marry the Rator, chieftain's daughter. On his death the order of succession retrograde, devolving on his uncle. Rana Arsi Singh II, A.D. 1761-73. Rana Arsi, in S. 1818. A.D. 1762. The levity of Jagat Singh, the inexperience of his successors Pertop and Raj Singh, with the ungovernable temper of Rana Arsi, and the circumstances under which he succeeded to power, introduced a train of disorders which proved fatal to Muir. Until this period not a foot of territory had been alienated. The wisdom of the Pancholi ministers, and the high respect paid by the organ of the Satara government, for a while preserved its integrity. But when the country was divided by factions, and the Marathas, ceasing to be a federate body, prowled in search of prey under leaders, each having an interest of his own, they formed political combinations to suit the ephemeral purposes of the former, but from which they alone reaped advantage. An attempt to depose Partop and set up his uncle. Nathji introduced a series of rebellions, and constituted Mulhar. Rao Holkar, who had already become master of a considerable for ninety-seven portion of the domain of Muir, the umpire in their family. Disputes. Mulhar Rao Holkar invades Muir. Famine, A.D. 1764. The ties of blood or of princely gratitude are feeble bonds if political. Expediency demands their dissolution. And Madho Singh, when firmly established on the throne of Amber, repaid the immense sacrifices by which the Rana had effected it by assigning his fief of Rampura, which he had not a shadow of right to alienate. 2. Holkar, this was the first limb severed from Muir. Holkar had also become the assignee of the tribute imposed by Bajirao but from which the Rana justly deemed himself exempt, when the terms of all further encroachment in Muir were set at naught. On the plea of recovering these arrears, and the rent of some districts on the Chumbal, Mulhar, after many threatening letters, invaded Muir, and his threats of occupying the capital were only checked by draining their exhausted resources of six hundred thousand pounds. In the same year a famine afflicted them, when flour and tamarinds were equal in value, and were sold at the rate of a rupee for one pound and a half. For years. Subsequent to this, civil war broke out and continued to influence all posterior proceedings, rendering the inhabitants of this unhappy country a prey to every invader until 1817, when they tasted repose under British protection. Civil War in Muir. Revolt of Rudan Singh. The real cause of this rebellion must ever remain a secret, for while some regard it as a patriotic effort on the part of the people to redeem themselves from foreign domination, others discover its motive in the selfishness of the hostile clans who supported or opposed the succession of Rana Arsi. This prince is accused of having unfairly acquired the crown, by the removal of his nephew Raj. Singh. But though the traditional anecdotes of the period furnish 
For 98 strong grounds of suspicion, there is nothing which affords a direct confirmation of the crime. It is, however, a public misfortune. When the line of succession retrogrades in Muir, R.C. had no right to expect the inheritance he obtained, having long held a seat below the sixteen chief nobles. And as one of the infants, Babas, he was incorporated with the second class of nobles with an uppunage of only three thousand pounds per annum. His defects of character had been too closely contemplated by his compeers and had kindled too many enmities to justify expectation that the adventitious dignity he had attained would succeed in obliterating the memory of them and past familiarity alone destroyed the respect which was exacted by sudden greatness. His insolent demeanor estranged the first of the home nobility, the Sudri chieftain, whose ancestor at Haldegat acquired a claim to the perpetual gratitude of the Sisodias, while to an unfeeling pun on a personal defect of Jusvant Singh of Diagar is attributed the hatred and revenge of this powerful branch of the Kandawats. These chiefs formed a party which eventually entrained many of lesser note to depose their sovereign, and immediately set up a youth called Ratna Singh, declared to be the posthumous son of the last Rana by the daughter of the chief of Goganda. Though, to this hour disputes run high as to whether he was really the son of Raj Singh, or merely the puppet of a faction. Be the fact as it may, he was made a rallying point for the disaffected, who soon comprehended the greater portion of the nobles, while out of the sixteen greater chiefs five only withstood the for ninety-nine defection, of these, Salumbar, the hereditary premier, at first, espoused, but soon abandoned, the cause of the pretender. Not from the principle of loyalty which his descendants take credit. For, but from finding the superiority of intellect of the heads of the rebellion, which now counted the rival Saktawats, too powerful for the supremacy he desired. Basant Pau, of the Depra tribe, was invested with the office of pardon to the pretender. The ancestor of this man accompanied Samarsi in the twelfth century from Delhi, where he held a high office in the household of Prithiraj, the last emperor of the Hindus. And it is a distinguished proof of the hereditary quality of official dignity to find his descendant, after the lapse of centuries, still holding office with the nominal title of pardon. The Futuri, by which name the court still designates the pretender, took post with his faction in Cumhomer, where he was formally installed, and whence he promulgated his decrees as Rana of Muir. With that heedlessness of consequences and the political debasement, which are invariable concomitants of civil dissension, they had the meanness to invite Scindia to their aid, with a promise of a reward of more than one million sterling on the dethronement of R.C. Zalem Singh of Kota. This contest first brought into notice one of the most celebrated Rajput chiefs of India, Zalem Singh of Kota, who was destined to fill a distinguished part in the annals of Rajasthan, but more especially in Muir, where his political sagacity first developed itself. Though this is not the proper place to delineate his history, which will occupy a subsequent portion of the work, it is impossible to trace the events with which he was so closely connected without adverting slightly to the part he acted in these scenes. The attack on Kota, of which his father was military governor, during the struggle to place Madho Singh on the throne of Amber, by Isari Singh, in conjunction with Sindhya, was the first avenue to his distinguished career, leading to an acquaintance with the Maratha chiefs, which linked him with their policy for more than half a century. Zalem having lost his prince's favor, whose path in love, five hundred he had dared to cross, repaired, on his banishment from Kota, to the Rana, who, observing his talents, enrolled him amongst 
his chiefs, and conferred on him, with the title of Raj Rana. The lands of Chitarkara for his support. By his advice the Maratha. Leaders, Raghu Pegawala and Dala Mayan, with their bands, were called in by the Rana, who, setting aside the ancient Pancholi ministry, gave the seals of office to Agarji Mehta. At this period, s. 1824, A.D. 1768, Mahadaji Sindhya was at Ujjain. Whither the conflicting parties hastened, each desirous of obtaining the chieftain's support. But the pretender's proposals had been already entertained, and he was then encamped with Sindhya on the banks of the Sipra. Battle at the Sipra, and Siege of Udaipur, A.D. 1769. The Rana's force, conducted by the chief of Salumbar, the Rajas of Shapura and Banera, with Zalem Singh and the Maratha. Auxiliaries, did not hesitate to attack the combined camp, and for a moment they were victorious. Driving Mahadaji and the pretender from the field, with great loss, to the gates of Ujjain. Here, however, they rallied, and being joined by a fresh body of troops, the battle was renewed with great disadvantage to the Rajputs, who, deeming the day theirs, had broken and dispersed to plunder. The chiefs of Salumbar, Shapura, and Banera were slain, and the auxiliary Dalamayan, Raja Man, ex-prince of Narvar, and Raj Kalyan, the heir of Sudri, severely wounded. Zalem Singh had his horse killed under him, and being left wounded on the field, was made prisoner, but hospitably treated by Trimbak. Rao, father to the celebrated Umbaji. The discomfited troops retreated to Udaipur while the pretender's party remained with Sindhya, inciting him to invest that capital and place Ratna on the throne. Some time, however, elapsed before he could carry this design into execution. When at the head of a large force the Maratha chief gained the passes and besieged the city. The Rana's cause now appeared hopeless. Beam Singh of Salumbar, uncle and successor to the chief slain at Ujjain, with the Rator, chief of Badnor, descendant of Jaimal, were the only nobles of high rank who defended their prince and capital in this emergency. But the energies of an individual saved both. Amar Chand, minister of Muir. Amra Chand Barwa, of the 501 mercantile class, had held office in the preceding reigns, when his influence retarded the progress of evils which no human means could avert. He was now displaced, and little solicitous of recovering his transient power, amidst hourly increasing difficulties, with a stubborn and unpopular prince, a divided aristocracy, and an impoverished country. He was aware also of his own imperious temper, which was as ungovernable as his sovereigns, and which experienced no check from the minor Partop, who regarded him as his father. During the ten years he had been out of office, mercenaries of Sindh had been entertained and established on the forfeited lands of the clans, perpetuating discontent and stifling every latent spark of patriotism. Even those who did not join the pretender remained sullenly at their castles, and thus all confidence was annihilated. A casual incident brought Amra forward at this critical juncture. Udaipur had neither ditch nor walls equal to its defense. Arsi was engaged in fortifying Eklingar, a lofty hill south of the city, which it commanded, and attempting to place thereon an enormous piece of ordnance, but it baffled their mechanical skill to get it over the scraggy ascent. Amra happened to be present. When the Rana arrived to inspect the proceedings, excuses were made to avert his displeasure, when turning to the ex-minister, he inquired what time and expense ought to attend the completion of such an undertaking. The reply was, a few rations of grain and some days, and he offered to accomplish 
the task, on condition that his orders should be supreme in the valley during its performance. He collected the whole working population, cut a road, and in a few days gave the Rana a salute. From Eklingar. The foster brother of the Rana had succeeded. The Jala chieftain, Ragu Deo, in the ministerial functions. The city was now closely invested on every side but the west, where communications were still kept open by the lake, across which the faithful mountaineers of the Aravali, who in similar dangers never failed, supplied them with provisions. All defense rested on the fidelity of the mercenary Sindhis, and they were at this very moment insolent in their clamors for arrears of pay. Nor were the indecisive measures daily passing before their eyes, calculated to augment their respect or stimulate their courage. Not satisfied with demands, they had the audacity to seize the 502 Rana by the skirt of his robe as he entered the palace, which was torn in the effort to detain him. The haughtiness of his temper gave way to this humiliating proof of the hopelessness of his condition. And while the Dabai, foster brother, counseled escape by water to the mountains, whence he might gain Mandalgar, the Sulumbar chief confessed his inability to offer any advice save that of recourse to Amra Chand. He was summoned, and the uncontrolled charge of their desperate affairs offered to his guidance. He replied that it was a task of which no man could be covetous, more especially himself, whose administration had formerly been marked by the banishment of corruption and disorder, for that he must now call in the aid of these vices and assimilate the means to the times. You know. Also, he added, my defect of temper, which admits of no control. Wherever I am, I must be absolute, no secret advisers. No counteraction of measures. With finances ruined, troops. Mutinous, provisions expended, if you desire me to act, swear. That no order, whatever its purport, shall be countermanded. And I may try what can be done, but recollect, Amra the just. Will be the unjust. And reverse his former character. The Rana pledged himself by the patron deity to comply with all his demands. Adding this forcible expression, should you even send to the queen's apartment and demand her necklace or nafna, it shall be granted. The advice of the Dabai encountered the full flood of Amra's wrath. The counsel is such as might be expected from your condition. What will preserve your prince? At Mandalgar if he flies from Udaipur, and what hidden resources have you there for your support? The project would suit you. Who might resume your original occupation of tending buffaloes and selling milk, more adapted to your birth and understanding than state affairs, but these pursuits your prince has yet to learn. The Rana and his chiefs bent their heads at the bold bearing of Amra. Descending to the terrace, where the Sindhi Leaders and their bands were assembled, he commanded them to follow him, exclaiming, Look to me for your arrears, and as for your services, it will be my fault if you fail. The mutineers, who had just insulted their sovereign, rose without reply, and in a body left the palace with Amra, who calculated their arrears. 503 and promised payment the next day. Meanwhile, he commanded. The banders, repositories, to be broken open, as the keeper of. Each fled when the keys of their trust were demanded. All the. Gold and silver, whether in bullion or in vessels, were converted. Into money, jewels were pledged, the troops paid and satisfied. Ammunition and provisions laid in, a fresh stimulus supplied. The enemy held at defiance. And the siege prolonged during six. Months. The pretender's party had extended their influence over a great part of the crown domain, even to the valley of Udaipur. But unable to fulfill the stipulation to Sindhya, the baffled Maratha, to whom time was treasure, negotiated with Amra to raise the siege, 
and abandoned the pretender on the payment of seventy locks. But scarcely was the treaty signed, when the reported disposition of the auxiliaries, and the plunder expected on a successful assault, excited his avarice and made him break his faith, and twenty locks additional were imposed. Amra tore up the treaty, and sent back the fragments to the faithless Maratha with defiance. His spirit increased with his difficulties, and he infused his gallantry into the hearts of the most despairing. Assembling the Sindhis and the home clans who were yet true to their prince, he explained to them the transaction, and addressed them in that language which speaks to the souls of all mankind, and to give due weight to his exhortation. He distributed amongst the most deserving, many articles of cumbrous ornament lying useless in the treasury. The stores of grain in the city and neighborhood, whether public or private, were collected and sent to the market, and it was proclaimed by beat of drum that every fighting man should have six months' provision on application. Hitherto grain had been selling at little more than a pound for the rupee, and these unexpected resources were matter of universal surprise, more especially to the besiegers. The Sindhis, having no longer cause for discontent, caught the spirit of the brave Amra, and went in a body to the palace to swear in public never to abandon the Rana, whom their leader, Adil Beg. Thus 504 addressed, We have long eaten your salt and received numerous favors from your house, and we now come to swear never to abandon you. Udaipur is our home, and we will fall with it. We demand no further pay, and when our grain is exhausted, we will feed on the beasts, and when these fail we will thin the ranks of the sovereigns and die sword in hand. Such were the sentiments that Amra had inspired, the expression of which extorted tears from the Rana, a sight so unusual with this stern prince, as to raise frantic shouts from the Sindhis and his Rajputs. The enthusiasm spread and was announced to Sindhya with all its circumstances by a general discharge of cannon on his advanced posts. Apprehensive of some desperate display of Rajput valor, the wary Maratha made overtures for a renewal of the negotiation. It was now Amra's turn to triumph, and he replied that he must deduct from the original terms the expense they had incurred in sustaining another six-month siege. Thus outwitted, Sindhya was compelled to accept sixty locks, and three and a half for official expenses. Sessions made to Sindhya. Thirty-three locks in jewels and specie, gold and silver plate, and assignments on the chiefs, were immediately made over to Sindhya, and lands mortgaged for the liquidation of the remainder. For this object the districts of Jawad, Jiran, Nimak, and Morwan were set aside to be superintended by joint officers of both governments, with an annual investigation of accounts. From S. 1825 to S. 1831, A.D. 1768 to 74. No infringement took place of this arrangement, but in the latter year Sindhya dismissed the Rana's officers from the management and refused all further settlement. And with the exception of A. Temporary occupation on Sindhya's reverse of fortune in S. 1851. A.D. 1794, these rich districts have remained severed from Muir. In S. 1831, A.D. 1774, the great officers of the Maratha Federation began to shake off the trammels of the Peshwas. Authority. And Sindhya retained for the state of which he was. The founder, all these lands except Morwan, which was made. Over to Holkar, who the year after the transaction demanded of. The Rana the surrender of the district of Nambahara, threatening. In the event of non-compliance, to repeat the part is predatory. 505 Coadjutor Sindhya had just performed. The session was unavoidable. Thus terminated, in S. 1826, A.D. 1769, the siege of Udaipur, with the dislocation of these fine districts from Muir. But let it be remembered that they were only mortgaged, and although the continued degradation of the country from the same causes has prevented their redemption, the claim to them has never been abandoned. Their recovery was stipulated by the ambassadors of the Rana in the Treaty of A.D. 1817 with the British government. But our total ignorance of the past transactions of these countries, added to our amicable relations with Sindhya, prevented any pledge of the reunion of these districts. And it must ever be deeply lamented that, when the treacherous and hostile conduct of Sindhya gave a noble opportunity for their restoration, it was lost, from policy difficult to understand. 
and which must be subject to the animadversions of future historians of that important period in the history of India. It yet remains for the wisdom of the British government to decide whether half a century's abeyance, and the inability to redeem them by the sword, render the claim a dead letter. At all events, the facts here recorded from a multiplicity of public documents, and corroborated by living actors in the scene, may be useful at some future day, when expedience may admit of their being re annexed to Muir. Rutten Singh defeated. Amra's defense of the capital, and the retreat of the Marathas, was a death blow to the hopes of the pretender, who had obtained not only many of the strongholds, but a footing in the valley of the capital. Rajnagar. Reaper, and Untala were rapidly recovered, many of the nobles returned to the Rana and to their allegiance. And Ratna was left in Kumhamar with the Depra minister, and but three of the sixteen principal nobles, namely Diagar, Binder, and Amet. These contentions lasted till S. 1831 A.D. 1774, when the chiefs above named also abandoned him but not until their rebellion had cost the feather in the crown of Muir. The rich province of God War, the most fruitful of all her possessions, and containing 506 the most loyal of her vassalage, the Ranavats, Rathors, and Solunkis, was nearly all held on tenure of feudal service. And furnished 3,000 horse besides foot, a greater number than the aggregate of the Kondawats. This district, which was won with the title of Rana from the Parihara prince of Mandar, before Jodhpur was built, and whose northern boundary was confirmed by the blood of the Kondawat chief in the reign of Jodha, was confided by the Rana to the care of Raja Bijai, Singh of Jodhpur, to prevent its resources being available to the pretender, whose residence, come Homer, commanded the approach to it, and the original treaty yet exists in which the Prince of Marvar binds himself to provide and support a body of three thousand men for the Rana service, from its revenues. Assassination of Rana Ari Singh, A.D. 1773. This province might have been recovered. But the evil genius of Arsi Rana at this time led him to Bundy to hunt at the spring festival, the Ahiria, with the Hara prince, in spite of the prophetic warning of the Sati, who from the funeral pile denounced a practice which had already thrice proved fatal to the princes of Muir. Rana Arsi fell by the hand of the Bundy prince, and God War, withheld from his minor successor, has since remained severed. The Bundy heir, who perpetrated this atrocious assassination, was said to be prompted by the Muir nobles, who detested their sovereign, and with whom, since the late events, it was impossible. They could ever unite in confidence. Implacable in his disposition. He brooded over injuries, calmly awaiting the moment to avenge them. A single instance will suffice to evince this, as well as the infatuation of Rajput devotion. The Salumbar chief, whose predecessor had fallen in support of the Rana's cause at the battle. Of Ujjain, having incurred his suspicions, the Rana commanded him to eat the pan, beetle leaf, presented on taking leave. Startled. At so unusual an order, he remonstrated, but in vain. And with the conviction that it contained his death warrant he obeyed. Observing to the tyrant, my compliance will cost you and your family dear, words fulfilled with fearful accuracy, for to this and similar acts is ascribed the murder of Arsi and the completion 507 of the ruin of the country. A color of pretext was afforded to the Bundy chief in a boundary dispute regarding a patch of land, yielding only a few good mangoes. But, even admitting this as a palliative, it could not justify the inhospitable act, which in the Mode of execution added cowardice to barbarity, for while both were pursuing the boar, the Bundy heir drove his lance through the heart of the Rana. The assassin fell a victim to remorse, the deed being not only disclaimed, 
but severely reprobated by his father and all the Hara tribe. A cenotaph still stands on the site of the murder where the body of Arsi was consumed, and the feud between the houses remains unappeased. Rana Hammer Singh II, AD 1773-78 Rana Arsi left two sons. Hammer and Beam Singh. The former, a name of celebrity in their annals, succeeded in S. 1828, A.D. 1772, to the little enviable title of Rana. With an ambitious mother, determined to control affairs during his minority, a state pronounced by the bard. Peculiarly dangerous to a Rajput dynasty, and the vengeful competition of the Salumbar chief, successor to the murdered noble who was equally resolved to take the lead, combined with an unextinguishable enmity to the Saktawats who supported the policy of the Queen Mother, the demoralization of Muir, was complete, her fields were deluged with blood, and her soil was the prey of every paltry marauder. Outbreak of the Sindhis The mercenary Sindhis, who, won by the enthusiasm of Amra, had for a moment assumed the garb of Fidelity threw it off at their prince's death, taking possession of the capital, which it will be remembered had been committed to the charge of the Salumbar chief, whom they confined and were about to subject to the torture of the hot iron to extort their arrears of pay. When he was rescued from the indignity by the unlooked for return of Amra from Bundy, this faithful minister determined to establish the rights of the infant prince against all other claimants for power. But he knew mankind, and had attained, what is still more difficult, the knowledge of himself. Aware that his resolution to maintain his post at all hazards and against every competitor, would incur the imputation of self-interest, he, like our own Wolsey, though from far different motives, made an inventory of his wealth, in gold, jewels, and plate, even to his wardrobe, and sent the whole in trays to the 508 Queen Mother. Suspicion was shamed and resentment disarmed. By this proceeding, and to repeated entreaties that he would receive it back he was inflexible, with the exception of articles of apparel that had already been in use. This imperious woman was a daughter of Goganda. She possessed considerable talents, but was ruled by an artful intrigant, who, in her turn, was governed by a young um de fair, then holding an inferior office, but who subsequently acted a conspicuous part, slew and was slain, like almost all who entered into the politics of this tempestuous period. The Queen Mother, now supported by the Kandawats opposed the minister, who maintained himself by aid of the Sindhis, kept the Marathas from the capital, and protected the crown land. But the ungrateful return made to his long-tried fidelity rendered his temper ungovernable. Rampiari. Such the name of the intrigant, repaired on one occasion to the office of the minister, and in the name of the regent queen, reviled him for some supposed omission. Amra, losing all temper. At this intrusion, applied to the fair Abigail the coarsest epithets. Used to her sex, bidding her be gone as a Kothi Ki Rand, a phrase. We shall not translate, which was reported with exaggeration to. The queen. Who threw herself into a litter and set off to the Salumbar. Chief. Amra, anticipating an explosion, met the. Cavalcade in the street and enjoined her instant return to the palace. Who dared disobey? Arrived at the door of the Ra'ala, he made his obeisance, and told her it was a disgrace to the memory of her lord that she should quit the palace under any pretext. That even the potter's wife did not go abroad for six months after her husband's death, while she, setting decorum, at defiance, had scarcely permitted the period of mourning to elapse. He concluded by saying he had a duty to perform, and that he would perform it in spite of all obstacles, 
in which, as it involved her own and her children's welfare, she ought to cooperate instead of thwarting him. But Baiji Raj, the royal mother, was young, artful, and ambitious, and persevered in her hostility till the demise of this uncompromising minister shortly after, surmised to be caused by poison. His death yielded a flattering comment on his life, he left not funds sufficient to cover the funeral expenses, and is, and will probably continue. The sole instance on record in Indian history of a minister. 509 Having his obsequies defrayed by subscription among his fellow citizens. The man who thus lived and thus died would have done honor to any, even the most civilized, country, where the highest incentives to public virtue exist. What, therefore, does not his memory merit, when amongst a people who, through long oppression, were likely to hold such feelings in little estimation, he pursued its dictates from principle alone. His sole reward that which the world could not bestow, the applause of the monitor within? But they greatly err who, in the application of their own overweening standard of merit, imagine there is no public opinion in these countries. For recollections of actions like this, of which but a small portion is related, they yet love to descant upon, and an act of vigor and integrity is still designated Amrakanda. Evincing that if virtue has few imitators in this country, she is not without ardent admirers. Revolt of the Chief of Begun. In S. 1831 A.D. 1775, the Rebellion of the Begun Chief, head of a grand division of the Kondawats, the Megawat, obliged the Queen Mother to call upon Scindia for his reduction, who recovered the crown lands. He had usurped and imposed on this refractory noble a fine of 12 lakhs of rupees, or 100,000 pounds sterling. But instead of confining himself to punishing the guilty and restoring the lands to the young Rana, he inducted his own son-in-law Burji. Tap into the districts of Ratangar Kerry and Singoli. And at the same time made over those of Ernia, Jaff, Bitcher, and Nadway. To Holkar, the aggregate revenue of which amounted to six lakhs. Annually. Besides these alienations of territory, the Marathas levied no less than four grand war contributions in S. 1830-31. While in S. 1836 their rapacity exacted three more. Inability. 510 to liquidate these exorbitant demands was invariably a signal for further sequestration of land. Amidst such scenes of civil strife and external spoliation, one Maratha following another. In the same track of Rapin, Hammer died before he had attained. Even Rajput majority, in S. 1834, A.D. 1778. Recapitulation we may here briefly recapitulate the diminution of territory and wealth in Muir from the period of the first Maratha visitation in A.D. 1736, to the death of Hammer. It were a waste of time to enumerate the rapacious individuals who shared in the spoils of this devoted country. We may be content to say their name was Legion. These forty years were surcharged with evil. The Mughal princes observed at least the forms of government and justice, which occasionally tempered their aggressions. The Marathas were associations of vampires, who drained the very lifeblood wherever the scent of spoil attracted them. In three payments, we have seen the enormous sum of one crore and eighty-one lakhs, upwards of two millions English money, exacted from Muir, exclusive of individual contributions levied on chiefs, ministers, and the pretender's party, and a schedule drawn up by the reigning prince of contributions levied up to his own time, amounts to five million pounds sterling. Yet the land would eventually have reimbursed these sums, but the penalty inflicted for deficiencies of payment renders the evil irremediable for the alienated territory which then produced an annual revenue of 28 lakhs, or 323,000 pounds sterling, exceeds in amount the sum total now left, 
whether fiscal or feudal, in the present impoverished state of the country. September 29, 1719. Nizam Elmulk, a soft jaw, titles of Chin Kilich Khan, a Turkmen officer in the service of Aurangzeb, governor of the Deccan, died May 22, 1748. Amongst the archives of the Rana to which I had access, I discovered an autograph letter of Raja Jai Singh, addressed at this important juncture to the Rana's Prime Minister, Biharidas. The Amir al Amara has arrived, and engagements through Balaji Pundit have been agreed to, he said that he always had friendship for me, but advised me to march, a measure alike recommended by Kishan Singh and Jiwa Lal. On this I presented an artsy to His Majesty, stated the advice, but desired to have His Majesty's commands. When the king sanctioning my leave, such being the general desire, on Thursday the 9th of Falgun I moved, and pitched my tents at Sarbal Sarai. I told the Rao Raja, of Bundi, to accompany me, but it did not reach his mind, and he joined Kutbu El Mulk, who gave him some horse, and made him encamp with Ajit Singh. Beam Singhs, of Kota, army arrived, and an engagement took place, in which Jeth Singh Hara was killed, and the Rao Raja fled to Alawardi Khan Sarai. I sent troops to his aid. The king has made over the baths and wardrobe to the Sayyids, who have everything their own way. You know the Sayyids, I am on my way back to my own country, and have much to say viva voce to the Huser, come and meet me. Falgun, S. 19, 1775, A.D. 1719. Sid Sri Maharaja Dhiraj Sri Sangram Singhi, received the mudra of Raja Sawai Jai Singh. Here all is well, your welfare is desired, you are the chief, nor is there any separation of interests, my horses and Rajputs are at your service. Command when I can be of use. It is long since I have seen the royal mother, Sri Baiji Raj, if you come this way, I trust she will accompany you. For news I refer you to Dip Chan Puncholi. Asoj 6, S. 1777. Huser signifies the presence. Such was the respectful style of the Amber Prince to the Rana, to illustrate which I shall add another letter from the same prince, though merely complimentary, to the Rana. Mudra is a salutation of respect used to a superior. For a sketch of the history of this period see Keen, Sketch of the History of Hindustan, 304 FF. Raja Jai Singh to Biharidas, the Rana's minister, you write that your lord dispatches money for the troops, I have no accounts thereof. Put the treasure on camels and send it without delay. The Nawab Nizamu El Mulk is marching rapidly from Ujjain, and Chabal Ram is coming hither, and according to accounts from Agra he has crossed at Kalpi. Let the Diwan's army form a speedy junction. Make no delay, in supplies of cash everything is included. Baden, 4th S, 1776, AD 1720. Letter from Raja Bhakta Singh of Najer to Biharidas the Rana's Prime Minister, your letter was received, and its contents made me happy. Sri Diwan's Rukha reached me and was understood. You tell me both the Nawabs, Sayyids, had taken the field, that both the Maharajas attended, and that your own army was about to be put in motion, for how could ancient friendships be severed? All was comprehended. But neither of the Nawabs will take the field, nor will either of the Maharajas proceed to the Deccan they will sit and enjoy themselves quietly in talking at home. But should by some accident the Nawabs take the field, espouse their cause. If you cling to any other you are lost, of this you will be convinced ere long, so guard yourself, if you can wind up our own thread, don't give it to another to break, you are wise, and can anticipate intentions. Where there is such a servant as you, that house can be in no danger. Haidar Khan assassinated Hussein Ali on September 18, 1720. Gurdhardas was a Nagar Brahmin, son of Chabal Ram, the chief secretary of Rutan Chand. Jagatkunt, the jugged point, of our maps, at Dvarka, where the Badhels, a branch of the Rathors, established themselves. In the dialect, Chari Masbut T, his rod was strong, a familiar phrase, which might be rendered, scepter, a long rod with an iron spike on it, often placed before the Gaddi, or throne. The dames attendant on the queens, the lady Massams of every female court in Rajasthan. 25,000 pounds. There were eight ministers, from this the Marathas had their ashed pardons, 
the number which formed the ministry of Rama. Krishna. I discovered the following letter from one of the princesses of Amber to Rana Sangram, written at this period. It is not evident in what relation she stood to him, but I think she must have been his wife, and the sister of Jai Singh. To Sid Sri Sangram Singh, happiness. The Kachwaha Rani, Queen, writes, read her asses, blessing. Here all is well. The welfare of the Sri Dewanji is desired. You are very dear to me, you are great, the son of Hindustan, if you do not thus act, who else can? The action is worthy of you, with your house is my entire friendship. From ancient times we are the Rajputs of your house, from which both Rajas have had their consequence increased, and I belong to it of old, and expect always to be fostered by it, nor will the Sri Dewanji disappoint us. My intention was to proceed to the feet of the Sri Dewanji, but the wet weather has prevented me, but I shall soon make my appearance. S. 1778, A.D. 1722. Asses is benediction, which only ladies and holy men employ in epistolary writing or in verbal compliment. Amber and Marvar. This expression denotes the letter to have been written on intermarriage with the Rana's house, and shows her sense of such honor. The bayra is the beetle or pan leaf folded up, containing aromatic spices, and presented on taking leave. The Kaner chieftain, being of the second grade of nobles, was not entitled to the distinction of having it from the sovereign's own hand. Treaty. Sri Aklinga. A. Agreed. Sita Rama Jaiti. C. Agreed. Vraj Aedis. B. Abhai Singh. D. 1. All are united, in good and in evil, and none will withdraw therefrom, on which oaths have been made, and faith pledged, which will be lost by whoever acts contrary thereto. The honor and shame of one is that of all, and in this everything is contained. 2. No one shall countenance the traitor of another. 3. After the rains the affair shall commence, and the chiefs of each party assemble at Rampara. And if from any cause the head cannot come, he will send his kunwar, heir, or some personage of weight. For, should from inexperience such kunwar commit error, the rana alone shall interfere to correct it. 5. In every enterprise all shall unite to effect it. A. B. C. All these seals of Muir, Marvar, and Amber bear respectively the names of the tutelary divinity of each prince and his tribe Svisthisri. By the United Chiefs the underwritten has been agreed to, from which no deviation can take place. Sawan City 13, S. 1791, A.D. 1735, Kampura. A. Eklinga, or Mahadava of the Sisodias of Muir. B. Vraj Aedes, the Lord of Vraj, the country round Mathura, the epithet of Krishna, seal of the Hara Prince, C. Victory to Sita and Rama, the demigod, ancestor of the princes of Amber, D. Abhai Singh, prince of Marvar. Subadar of Malva, killed in battle at Tala Nirdar in 1732, Grant Duff 227. Sarbiland Khan was superseded by Abhai Singh, Ibid 226. Mahabat Jang, in 1740 usurped the government of Bengal, over which he reigned for 16 years, died April 10, 1756 N.S., Buried at Morshidabad, Beal, S.V. Nephew and son in law of Baranu El Mulk, Saadat Khan, was appointed Wazir in 1748, died October 17, 1754. Akbar Shatu, King of Delhi, reigned from 1806 to 1827. I have conversed with an aged sheikh who recollected the splendor of Muhammad Shah's reign before Nadir's invasion. He was Daroga, superintendent, to the Duab Canal and described to me the fate on its opening. Sindhya's family were husbandmen. Holkar was a goat herd. The ford near Dolpur still is called Bayagat. Bajirao appeared at Delhi in 1736, Grant Duff 226. A.D. 1740. Near Puniput, February 13, 1739, Elphinstone 717. It is yet pointed out to the visitor of this famed city. The Golden Mosque of Roshanadi Dalla, Fanshaw, Delhi Past and Present, 50. This is not certain. 
Many officials committed suicide, and Saadat Khan was believed to have been among these. It is certain that he died the night before the massacre. Keen, Sketch History Hindustan, 324. Dot. As the hour of departure approached, the cruelties of the ruthless invaders increased, to which the words of the narrator, an eyewitness, can alone do justice, a type of the last day afflicted the inhabitants of this once happy city. Hitherto it was a general massacre, but now came the murder of individuals. In every house was heard the cry of affliction. Basant Ray, agent for pensions, killed his family and himself, Kalikir Khan stabbed himself, many took poison. The venerable chief magistrate was dishonored by stripes, sleep and rest forsook the city. The officers of the court were beaten without mercy, and a fire broke out in the imperial Farashkena, and destroyed effects to the amount of a crore, a million sterling. There was a scarcity of grain, two seers of coarse rice sold for a rupee, and from a pestilential disorder crowds died daily in every street and lane. The inhabitants, like the affrighted animals of the desert, sought refuge in the most concealed corners. Yet four or five crores, millions, more were thus extracted. On the April 5th, Nadir's seals were taken off the imperial repositories, and his farmans sent to all the feudatories of the empire to notify the place and to inculcate obedience to his dear brother, which, as a specimen of Eastern diplomatic phraseology, is worth insertion. It was addressed to the Rana, the Rajas of Marvar and Amber, Najer, Satara, the Peshwa Bajirao, etc. Between us and our dear brother, Muhammad Shah, in consideration of the regard and alliances of the two sovereigns, the connections of regard and friendship have been renewed, so that we may be esteemed as one soul in two bodies. Now our dear brother has been replaced on the throne of this extensive empire, and we are moving to the conquest of other regions, it is incumbent that ye, like your forefathers, walk in the path of submission and obedience to our dear brother as they did to former sovereigns of the house of Timur. God forbid it, but if accounts of your rebelling should reach our ears, we will blot you out of the pages of the Book of Creation, Memoirs of Iradat Khan, Scott's History of Dekan, Volume 2. Bikaner and Kishangar arose out of Marvar, and Macheri from Amber, to which we might add Shaikavadi, which, though not separate, is tributary to Amber, now Jaipur. A.D. 1735 these documents are interesting, if merely showing the high respect paid by every Rajput prince to the Ranas of Muir, and illustrating what is recorded in the reign of Pertop, who abjured all intercourse with them. Number 1. From Kunwar Bijai Singh of Marvar to the Maharna Sri Sri Sri. Jagat Singh's presence, let my mudra, obedience, be known. You honored me by sending Rawat Kesri Singh and Bihari Das, and commanding a marriage connection. Your orders are on your child's head. You have made me a servant. To everything I am agreed, and now I am your child, while I live I am yours. If a true Rajput, my head is at your disposal. You have made twenty thousand Rattors your servants. If I fail in this, the Almighty is between us. Whoever is of my blood will obey your commands, and the fruit of this marriage shall be sovereign, and if a daughter, should I bestow her on the Turkana, I am no true Rajput. She shall be married to a proper connection, and not without your advice, and even should Sri Bhavaji, an epithet of respect to his father, or others of our elders, recommend such proceeding, I swear by God I shall not agree. I am the Diwans, let others approve or disapprove. Asar Sudi Punam, Full Moon, Thursday, S. 1791, A.D. 1735-36. N.B. This deed was executed in the balcony of the Kishambalas by Rawat Kesri Singh and Pancholi Bihari Das, and written by Pancholi Lalji, namely, Marriage Deed of Kunwar Bijai Singh, son of Bakht Singh. Number 2. From Bijai Singh to Rana Jagat Singh. Here all is well. Preserve your friendship and favor for me, and give me tidings of your welfare. That day I shall behold you will be without price, Amolak. You have made me a thorough Rajput, never shall I fail in whatever service I can perform. You are the father of all the tribes, and bestow gifts on each according to his worth, the support and preservation of all around you, to your enemy destruction. Great in knowledge, and wise like Brahma. May the Lord of the world keep the Rana happy. Asar 13. Number 3. 
Rajabakt Singh to the Rana. To Maharna Sri 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 Jagat Singh, let Bakht Singh's respects, Mudra, be made known. You have made me a thorough Rajput, and by such your favor is known to the world. What service I can perform, you will never find me backward. The day I shall see you I shall be happy, my heart yearns to be with you. Asar 11. Number 4. Sawai Jai Singh to the Rana. May the respects of Sawai Jai Singh be known to the Maharna. According to the Sri Diwan's commands, Hukm, I have entered into terms of friendship with you, Abhai Singh of Marvar. For neither Hindu nor Musulman shall I swerve therefrom. To this engagement God is between us, and the Sri Diwanji is witness. Asar Sudhi 7. Number 5. Rajabakht Singh to the Rana. Your cause Rukha, note in the Rana's own hand, I received, read, and was happy. Jai Singh's engagement you will have received, and mine also will have reached you. At your commands I entered into friendship with him, and as to my preserving it have no doubts, for having given you as my guarantee, no deviation can occur, do you secure his. Whether you may be accounted my father, brother, or friend, I am yours. Besides you I care for neither connection nor kin. Asar 6. Number 6. From Raja Abhai Singh to the Rana. To the presence of Maharna Jagat Singh, Maharaja Abhai Singh writes, read his respects, Mudra. God is witness to our engagement, whoever breaks it may he fare ill. In good and in evil we are joined, with one mind let us remain united, and let no selfishness disunite us. Your chiefs are witnesses, and the true Rajput will not deviate from his engagement. Asoj 3, Thursday. Abhai Singh and Bakht Singh were brothers, sons of Raja Ajit of Marvar, to whom the former succeeded, while Bakht Singh held Najar independently. His son was Bijai Singh, with whom this marriage was contracted. He ultimately succeeded to the government of Marvar or Jodhpur. He will add another example of political expediency counteracting common gratitude, in seizing on domestic convulsions to deprive the Rana's grandson of the province of Godwar. Zalem Singh was the fruit of this marriage, who resided during his elder brothers, Fateh Singh, lifetime at Udaipur. He was brave, amiable, and a distinguished poet. The Yadi, priest, who attended me during twelve years, my assistant in these researches, was brought up under the eye of this prince as his amanuensis, and from him he imbibed his love of history and poetry. In reading which he excelled all the bards of Rajwara. Letters from Rana Jagat Singh to Bihari Das Pancholi. Number 1. Svisthi Sri, Chief of Ministers, Panchaliji, read my Juhar. The remembrance of you never leaves me. The Dakani question you have settled well, but if a meeting is to take place, let it be beyond Eolia, nearer is not advisable. Lessen the number of your troops, by God's blessing there will be no want of funds. Settle for Rampura according to the preceding year and let Dalit Singh know the opportunity will not occur again. The royal mother is unwell. Gararo and Guy Monik fought nobly, and Sundar Guy played a thousand pranks. I regretted your absence. How shall I send Sabram? Asoj 6, S. 1791, A.D. 1735. Number 2. To the same. I will not credit it, therefore send witnesses and a detail of their demands. Bajirao is come, and he will derive reputation from having compelled a contribution from me, besides his demand of land. He has commenced with my country, and will take twenty times more from me than other rajas, if a proportionate demand, it might be complied with. Mulhar came last year, but this was nothing, Bajirao this, and he is powerful. But if God hears me he will not get my land. From Devakand learn particulars. Thursday. S. 1792. At the holy all was joy at the Jagmander, but what is food without salt? What do I pour without Biharidas? Number 3. Same to the same. With such a man as you in my house I have no fears for its stability, but why this appearance of poverty? Perhaps you will ask, what fault have you committed, that you sit and move as I direct? The matter is thus, money is all in all and the troubles on foot can only be settled by you, and all other resolutions are useless. 
You may say, you have got nothing, and how can you settle them, but already two or three difficulties have occurred, in getting out of which, both your pinions and mine, as to veracity, have been broken. So that neither scheming nor wisdom is any longer available. Though you have been removed from me for some time, I have always considered you at hand. But now it will be well if you approach nearer to me, that we may raise supplies, for in the act of hiding you are celebrated, and the sun, beta, hides none, therefore your hoarding is useless, and begets suspicions. Therefore, unless you have a mind to efface all regard for your master and your own importance at my court, you will get ready some jewels and bonds under good security and bring them to me. There is no way but this to allay these troubles, but should you think you have got ever so much time, and that I will send for you at all events, then have I thrown away mine in writing you this letter. You are wise, look to the future, and be assured I shall write no second letter. S. 1792. This letter will show that the office of Prime Minister is not a bed of roses. The immediate descendants of Biharidas are in poverty like their prince, though some distant branches of the family are in situations of trust. His ambassador to Delhi, and who subsequently remained with me as medium of communication with the Rana, was a worthy and able man, Kishandas Pancholi. I shall subjoin another letter from the Satara prince to Rana Jagat Singh, though being without date it is doubtful whether it is not addressed to Jagat Singh I. This is, however, unimportant, as it is merely one of compliment, but showing the high respect paid by the sovereign of the Peshwas to the house whence they originally sprung. Svisthi Sri, worthy of all praise, Atma, from whose actions credit results, the worshipper of the remover of troubles, the ambrosia of the ocean of the Rajput race, Amrita Ratnakra Kshatriya Kula, resplendent as the sun. Who has made a river of tears from the eyes of the wives of your warlike foes, in deeds munificent. Sriman Maharaja Dhiraj Maharna Sri Jagat Singhi, of all the prince's chief, Sriman Sahu Shatarpati Raja writes, read his Ram, Ram. Here all is well. Honor me by good accounts, which I am always expecting, as the source of happiness. Your favor was received by the Pundit Pardon with great respect. And from the period of the arrival of Raj Sri Rawat Udai Singh to this time my goodwill has been increasing towards him, let your favor between us be enlarged. What more can I write? A compliment used from a superior to any inferior. To the Peshwa is the illusion. As the Rana never expected his confidential notes to be translated into English, perhaps it is a liberal to be severe on them. Or we might say, his elephants are mentioned more con amore than his sick mother or state affairs. I obtained many hundreds of these autograph notes of this prince to his prime minister. The Hindu Saturnalia held in the island, the minster of the world. The Rana always styled him father. The ocean has the poetical appellation of Ratnakara, or house of gems, mine of jewels. The fable of the churning of the ocean is well known, when were yielded many bounties, of which the Amrita, or, immortal food, of the gods was one, to which the Rana, as head of all the Rajput tribes, is likened. This expression induces the belief that the letter is written by the Peshwa in his sovereign's name, as they had at this time commenced their usurpation of his power. It was to the second Jagat Singh that an offer was made to fill the Satara throne by a branch of his family, then occupied by an imbecile. A younger brother of the Rana, the ancestor of the present heir presumptive, Shiadan Singh, was chosen, but intrigues prevented it, the Rana dreading a superior from his own family. The descendant of Bhim, son of Rana Raj Singh. The seat assigned to Bajirao was made the precedent for the position of the representative of the British government. The Rawat of Banera, on succession, has the right of receiving a sword, on the arrival of which he goes to Udaipur to be installed, Erskine II. A. 92. Dot. The amount was 160,000 rupees, divided into three shares of 53,333.04 and a half assigned to Holkar, Sindhya, and the Puar. The management was entrusted to Holkar, subsequently Sindhya acted as receiver general. This was the only regular tributary engagement Muir entered into. See letter number 2, in. A.D. 1743. A.D. 1747. The great Jai Singh built a city which he called after himself, and henceforth Jaipur will supersede the ancient appellation, Amber. Apaji was one of Sindhya's best officers. 
suffering from a painful disease, he committed suicide in 1797 by drowning himself in the Jumna, Compton, European Military Adventurers, 132. See letters from Rana Jagat Singh to Biharidas, p. The leaders of these invasions were Satwaji, Jankoji, and Raghunat Rao. In S. 1812, Raja Bahadur, in 1813, Mulhar Rao Holkar and Vithal Rao, in 1814, Ranaji Bursha. In 1813 three war contributions were levied, namely, by Sadashio Rao, Govind Rao, and Kanaji Jaden. This was in S. 1808, A.D. 1752. Portions, however, remained attached to the Fisk of Muir for several years, besides a considerable part of the feudal lands of the Shandarawa chief of Ahmad. Of the former, the Rana retained Hinglajgar in the tapas of Jarda Kindra and Budsu. These were surrendered by Raj Singh, who rented Budsu under its new appellation of Malhargar. Budsu, etc. Holkar advanced as far as Antala, where Arjun Singh of Kurabar and the Rana's foster brothers met him, and negotiated the payment of 51 lakhs of rupees. S. 1820, A.D. 1764. An autograph letter of this chief's to the minister of the day I obtained, with other public documents, from the descendant of the Pancholi. To Jusvant Rao Pancholi, Raj Rana Ragudio writes. After compliments. I received your letter, from old times you have been my friend, and have ever maintained faith towards me, for I am of the loyal to the Rana's house. I conceal nothing from you, therefore I write that my heart is averse to longer service, and it is my purpose in Asar to go to Gaia. When I mentioned this to the Rana, he sarcastically told me I might go to Dvarka. If I stay, the Rana will restore the villages in my fief, as during the time of Jethji. My ancestors have performed good service, and I have served since I was fourteen. If the Darbar intends me any favor, this is the time. Gaya is esteemed the proper pilgrimage for the Rajputs. Dvarka, the resort for religious and unwarlike tribes. Salumbar, Kandawat, Bijolia, Amet, Ganerao, and Badnor. Binder, Saktawat, Diagar, Sudri, Gogunda, Delwara, Bedla, Kotharia, and Kaner. Agitator, or Disturber. 1 crore and 25 locks. The Sipa River in Malva, passes Ujjain, and finally joins the Chumbal, IGI, 23. 14F. Eklingar, 2 miles south of Udaipur city, 2,469 feet above sea level. The Nose Jewel, which even to mention is considered a breach of delicacy. To Amra's credit it is related, that his own brother-in-law was the first and principal sufferer, and that to his remonstrance and hope that family ties would save his grain pits, he was told. That it was a source of great satisfaction that he was enabled through him to evince his disinterestedness. See Grant to this chief's son, P. Mudasadi Karch, Mudasadi, a clerk, accountant, Karch, expenses, or dosur to the officers of government, was an authorized article of every Maratha Muamla or war contribution. Little Maloney, now Gungapur, with its lands, was the only place decidedly alienated, being a voluntary gift to Sindhya, to endow the establishment of his wife, Gangabai, who died there. Zalem Singh of Kota, and Lalaji Belal, both now dead. In 1382 Rana Kaith Singh was murdered by Lal Singh of Banbada, brother of Bar Singh, Rao of Bundi. Rana Rutan Singh too. And Rao Surajmal killed each other while shooting at Bundi in 1531. The feud between the two houses is not yet forgotten, Erskine too. A. 25. Dot. A heated platter used for baking bread, on which they place the culprit. The beloved of Rama. Amra Chand, it will be recollected, was the name of the minister. The treaty by which Sindhya holds these districts yet exists, which stipulates their surrender on the liquidation of the contribution. The Rana still holds this as a responsible engagement, and pleaded his rights in the treaty with the British government in AD 1817-18. But half a century's possession is a strong bond, which we dare not break. Though the claim now registered may hereafter prove of service to the family. 1830, Mahadaji Sindhya's contribution, Muamla, on account of begun, 1831, Burji taps Muamla through Govind and Gunput Rao. 
1831, Umbaji Inglia, Bapu Holkar, and Daduji Pundit's joint Muamla. 1. Apaji and Makaji Gidia, on Holkar's account, 2. Takuji Holkar's, through Samji, 3. Ali Bahadur's, through Samji. The age of 18. Namely, S. 1808, by Rana Jagat Singh to Holkar. Locks. 1820, Pertap and Arsi Rana to Holkar. 1826, Arsi Rana to Mahadaji Sindhya. 64. Total. S. 1808, Rampura, Banpura. Locks. 1826, Jawad, Jiran, Nimak, Nimbahara. Four and a half. 1831, Ratanger Kerry, Singoli, Ernia, Jaff, Nadwe, etc., etc. 1831, God War. 9. Total. 28 and a half. Chapter 17. Rana Beam Singh, A.D. 1778-1828. Rana Beam Singh, the reigning prince who succeeded his brother in S. 1834, A.D. 1778, was the fourth minor in the space of forty years who inherited Muir and the half-century during which he has occupied the throne has been as fruitful in disaster as any period of her history. Already recorded. He was but eight years of age on his accession, and remained under his mother's tutelage long after his minority had expired. This subjection fixed his character. Naturally defective. In energy, and impaired by long misfortune, he continued to be swayed by faction and intrigue. The cause of the pretender, though weakened, was yet kept alive. But his insignificance eventually left him so unsupported that his death is not even recorded. Feud of Kondawats and Saktawats. In S. 1840, A.D. 1784, the Kondawats reaped the harvest of their allegiance and made the power thus acquired subservient to the indulgence of ancient animosities against the rival clan of Saktawat. Salumbar with his relatives Arjun Singh of Karabar and Pertap Singh of Amet, now ruled the councils, having the Sindhi mercenaries under their leaders Chandan and Sadik at their command. Mustering Therefore all the strength of their kin and clans, they resolved on the prosecution of the feud, and invested Binder, the castle of Mokum the chief of the Saktawats, against which they placed their batteries. Sangram Singh, a junior branch of the Saktawats, destined to play a conspicuous part in the future events of Muir, was then rising into notice, and had just completed a feud with his rival the Purawat, whose abode, Lawa, he had carried by escalade. And now, determined to make a diversion in favor of his chief, he invaded the estate of Karabar, engaged against Binder, and 512 was driving off the cattle, when Salim Singh the heir of Karabar intercepted his retreat. And an action ensued in which Salim was slain by the lance of Sangram. The afflicted father, on hearing the fate of his son, threw the turban off his head, swearing never to replace it till he had tasted revenge. Feigning a misunderstanding with his own party he withdrew from the siege, taking the road to his estate, but suddenly abandoned it for Shiagar, the residence of Lalji the father of Sangram. The castle of Shiagar, placed amidst the mountains and deep forests of Chapin, was from its difficulty of access deemed secure against surprise, and here Sangram had placed the females and children of his family. To this point Arjun directed his revenge, and found Shiagar destitute of defenders save the aged chief but though seventy summers had whitened his head, he bravely met the storm and fell in opposing the foe. When the children of Sangram were dragged out and inhumanly butchered, and the widow of Lalji ascended the pyre. This barbarity aggravated the hostility which separated the clans, and together with the minority of their prince and the yearly aggressions of the Marathas, accelerated the ruin of the country. But Bhim Singh, the Khandawat leader, was governed by insufferable vanity, and not only failed in respect to his prince, but offended the queen regent. He parceled out the crown domain from Chitter to Udaipur amongst the Sindhi bands, and whilst his sovereign was obliged to borrow money to defray his marriage at Adar, 
this ungrateful noble had the audacity to disperse upwards of one hundred pounds. Zero 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 on the marriage of his own daughter. Such conduct determined the royal mother to supplant the Kondawats, and calling in the Saktawats to her aid, she invested with power the chiefs of Binder and Lawa. Aware, however, that their isolated authority was insufficient to withstand their rivals, they looked abroad for support, and made an overture to Zalem Singh of Kota, whose political and personal resentments to the Kondawats. 513 as well as his connection by marriage with their opponents, made him readily listen to it. With his friend the Maratha, Lalaji Belal, he joined the Saktawats with a body of 10,000 men. It was determined to sacrifice the Salumbar chief, who took post in the ancient capital of Chitter, where the garrison was composed chiefly of Sindhis, thus effacing his claim to his prince's gratitude, whom he defied. While the pretender still had a party in the other principal fortress, Kumhomer. Maharaja Bhim Singh, Prince of Udaipur. To face page 512. Battle of Lalsit, May 1787. Such was the state of things. When the ascendancy of Mahadaji Sindhya received a signal check. From the combined forces of Marvar and Jaipur. And the battle. Of Lalsit, in which the Maratha chief was completely defeated. Was the signal for the Rajputs to resume their alienated territory. Nor was the Rana backward on the occasion, when there appeared. A momentary gleam of the active virtue of past days. Maldas. Mehta was civil minister, with Mauji Ram as his deputy, both. Men of talent and energy. They first effected the reduction of. Nimbahara and the smaller garrisons of Marathas in its vicinity. Who from a sense of common danger assembled their detachments. In Jawad, which was also invested. Sivaji Nana, the governor capitulated, and was allowed to march out with his effects. At the same time, the Sons of the Black Cloud assembling drove the Marathas from Begun, Singoli, etc., and the districts on the plateau, while the Kondawats redeemed their ancient fief of Rampura, and thus for a while the whole territory was recovered. Elated by success, the United Chiefs advanced to Chardo on the banks of the Rarkia, a streamlet dividing Muir. From Malva, preparatory to further operations. Had these been confined to the maintenance of the places they had taken, and which had been withheld in violation of treaties, complete success might have crowned their efforts. But in including Nambahara, in their capture they drew upon them the energetic Ahulyabai, the regent queen of the Holkar state, who unluckily for them was at hand and who coalesced with Sindhya's partisans to check. 514 This reaction of the Rajputs. Talaji Sindhya and Sri Bai, with 5,000 horse, were ordered to support the discomfited. Shiva Nana, who had taken refuge in Mandasar, where he rallied. All the garrisons whom the Rajputs had unwisely permitted to capitulate. Defeat of the Rajputs. Murder of Samji. On Tuesday, the 4th of Mafes, 1844, the Rana's troops were surprised and defeated with great slaughter, the minister slain, the chiefs of Kaner and Sudri with many others severely wounded, and the latter made prisoner. The newly made conquests were all rapidly lost, with the exception of Jawad, which was gallantly Maintained for a month by Dip Chand, who, with his guns and rockets, effected a passage through the Marathas. And retired. With his garrison to Mandalgar. Thus terminated an enterprise. Which might have yielded far different results but for a misplaced. Security. All the chiefs and clans were united in this patriotic. Struggle except the Kondawats, against whom the Queen Mother and the new minister, Samji, had much difficulty to contend for the establishment of the miners' authority. At length overtures were made to Salumbar when the fair Rampiari was employed to conciliate the obdurate chief, who condescended to make his appearance at Udaipur and to pay his respects to the prince. He pretended to enter into the views of the minister and to coalesce in his plans, 
but this was only a web to ensnare his victim, whose talent had diminished his authority, and was a bar to the prosecution of his ambitious views. Samji was seated in his bureau when Arjun Singh of Kurabar and Sardar Singh of Baidsar entered, and the latter, as he demanded how he dared to resume his thief, plunged his dagger into the minister's breast. The Rana was passing the day at one of the villas in the valley called the Sahelia Bari, the Garden of Nymphs, attended by Jeff Singh of Badnor. When the brothers of the 515 minister suddenly rushed into the presence to claim protection against the murderers. They were followed by Arjun of Kurabar, who had the audacity to present himself before his sovereign with his hands yet stained with the blood of Samji. The Rana, unable to punish the insolent chief, branding him as a traitor, bade him be gone. When the whole of the actors in this nefarious scene with their leader Salumbar, returned to Chitter, Shiotas and Satadas, brothers to the murdered minister, were appointed to succeed him, and with the Saktawats fought several actions against the rebels, and gained one decisive battle at Akola, in which Arjun of Kurabar commanded. This was soon balanced by the defeat of the Saktawats at Kuroda. Every triumph was attended with ruin to the country. The agriculturist, never certain of the fruits of his labor, abandoned his fields, and at length his country. Mechanical industry found no recompense. And commerce was at the mercy of unlicensed spoliation. In a very few years Muir lost half her population, her lands lay waste, her mines were unworked, and her looms, which formerly Supplied all around, forsaken. The prince partook of the general. Penury, instead of protecting, he required protection. The bonds which united him with his subjects were snapped, and each individual or petty community provided for itself that defense. Which he could not give. Hence arose a train of evils, every cultivator, whether fiscal or feudal, sought out a patron, and entered into engagements as the price of protection. Hence, every Rajput who had a horse and lance, had his clients. And, not a camel load of merchandise could pass the abode of one of these cavaliers without paying fees. The effects of such disorder. 516 were felt long after the cause ceased to exist, and claims difficult. To adjust arose out of these licentious times, for the having. Prescriptive right was deemed sufficient to authorize their continuance. Here were displayed the effects of a feudal association. Where the powers of government were enfeebled. These feuds. Alone were sufficient to ruin the country. But when to such. Internal ill shoals of Maratha plunderers were added, no art is. Required to describe the consequences. Aid sought from Sindhya. The Rana and his advisers at. Length determined to call in Sindhya to expel the rebellious Kandawats from the ancient capital. A step mainly prompted by Zalem Singh, now regent of Kota, who with the Rana's ministers was deputed to the Maratha chieftain, then enjoying himself at the sacred lake of Pushkar. Since the overthrow of Lalsat he had reorganized his brigades under the celebrated Da Boini, through whose conduct he had redeemed his lost influence. In Rajputana by the battles of Merta and Patan, in which the brave Rattors, after acts of the most devoted gallantry, were completely overthrown. Sindhya's plans coincided entirely with the object of the deputation, and he readily acquiesced in the Rana's desire. This event introduced on the political stage some of the most celebrated men of that day, whose actions offer a fair picture of manners, and may justify our entering a little into details. Negotiations by Zalem Singh Zalem Singh had for some years become regent of Kota, and though to maintain himself in power, and the state he controlled in an attitude to compel the 
respect of surrounding foes, was no slight task. Yet he found the field too contracted for his ambition, and his secret views had long been directed to permanent influence in Muir. His skill in reading character convinced him that the Rana would be no. 517 bar to his wishes, the attainment of which, by giving him the combined resources of Heraity and Muir, would bestow the lead in Rajasthan. The Jaipur court he disregarded, whose effeminate army he had himself defeated single-handed. With the Kota troops, and the influence he established amongst the leading chiefs of Marvar held out no fear of counteraction. From that quarter, the stake was high, the game sure, and success would have opened a field to his genius which might have entirely altered the fate of Hindustan. But one false move was irretrievable, and instead of becoming the arbitrator of India, he left only the reputation of being the Nestor of Rajputana. The restriction of the Rana's power was the cloak under which he disguised all his operations, and it might have been well for the country had his plan succeeded to their full extent. To re-establish the Rana's authority, and to pay the charges of the reduction of Chitter, he determined that the rebels chiefly should furnish the means, and that from them and the fiscal lands, mostly in their hands. Sixty-four locks should be levied, of which three-fifths should be appropriated to Scindia, and the remainder to replenish the Rana's treasury. Preliminaries being thus arranged, Zalem was furnished with a strong corps under Umbaji Inglia, while Scindia followed, hanging on the Marvar frontier, to realize the contributions of that state. Zalem Singh and Umbaji moved towards Chitter, levying from the estates of those obnoxious to Zalem's views. Hamagar, whose chief, Diraj Singh, a man of talent and courage, was the principal adviser of Bhim Singh, the Salumbar chief, was besieged, and stood several assaults during six weeks' vigorous operations. When the destruction of the springs of the wells from the concussion of the guns compelled its surrender, and the estate was sequestrated. The force continued their progress, and after a trifling altercation at Basai, a Kandawat fief, also taken, they took up a position at Chitter, and were soon after joined by the main body under Sindhya. Zalem Singh and Sindhya at Udaipur. Zalem, to gratify. Mahadaji's vanity, who was desirous of a visit from the Rana, which even the Peshwa considered an honor, proceeded to Udaipur to effect this object. When the Rana, placing himself under his guidance, marched for this purpose, and was met at the Tiger Mount, within a few miles of his capital, by Sindhya. 518 who received the Rana, and escorted him to the besieging army. But in this short interval, Umbaji, who remained with the army. At Chitter, intrigued with the rebel Kandawat to supplant the predominant influence of his friend Zalem Singh, and seized the opportunity of his absence to counteract him. By communicating his plans to Salumbar. Aware that, unless he broke with Zalem, he could only hope to play a secondary part under him. Though the ulterior views of Zalem were kept to his own breast. They could not escape the penetration of the crafty Maratha. His very anxiety to hide them furnished Umbaji with the means of detection. Had Zalem possessed an equal share of meanness with his political antagonist, he might have extricated himself from the snare. But once overreached, he preferred sinking to grasping at an unworthy support. Beam Singh, Salumbar privately negotiated with Umbaji the surrender of Chitter, engaging to humble himself before the Rana, and to pay a contribution of twenty lakhs, levied on the clans, provided Zalem Singh was ordered to retire. This suggestion, apparently founded on the rebellious chief's antipathy to Zalem, but in reality prompted by Umbaji, ensured the approbation, as it suited the views, of all parties, but especially Sindhya, who was desirous of repairing to Pune. Zalem, the sole obstacle to this arrangement, furnished to his enemies the means of escape from the dilemma, and lost the opportunity of realizing his long-cherished scheme of wielding the united resources of Muir and Heraity. Zalem had always 
preserved a strict amity with Umbaji wherever their interests did. Not clash, and his regard had the cement of gratitude to the Maratha, whose father Trimbakji had saved Zalem's life and procured his liberty. When left wounded and a prisoner at the Battle of Ujjain. On Zalem's return with the Rana, Umbaji touched on the terms of Bhim Singh's surrender, hinting that Zalem's presence was the sole obstacle to this desirable result. Who, the more to mask his views, which any expressed reluctance to the measure might expose, went beyond probability in asseverations of readiness to be no bar to such arrangement, even so far as to affirm that Besides being tired of the business from the heavy expense it entailed on him, he had his prince's wish for his return to Kota. There is one ingredient in Zalem's character, which has never been totally merged in the vices acquired from the tortuous policy of a long life, and which in the vigor 519 of youth had full sway, namely, pride, one of the few virtues left to the Rajput defrauded of many others by long oppression. But Zalem's pride was legitimate, being allied to honor, and it has retained him an evident superiority through all the mazes of ambition. Umbaji skillfully availed himself of this defect in his friend's political character. A pretty story, indeed. You tell this to me. It might find credit with those who did not know you. The sarcasm only plunged him deeper into a severation. Is it then really your wish to retire? Assuredly. Then, retorted the crafty Ambaji, your wish shall be gratified. In a few minutes. Giving him no time to retract, he called for. His horse and galloped to Sindhya's tent. Zalem relied on Sindhya. Not acceding to the proposition. Or if he did, that the Rana, over whom he imagined he had complete influence, would oppose it. His hopes of Sindhya rested on a promise privately made to leave troops under his authority for the restoration of order in Muir. And a yet stronger claim, the knowledge that without Zalem he could not realize the stipulated sums for the expulsion of the Kandawat from Chitter. Umbaji had foreseen and prepared a remedy for these difficulties, and upon their being urged offered himself to advance the amount by bills on the Deccan. This argument was irresistible. Money, and the consequent prosecution of his journey to Pune, being attained, Sindhya's engagements with Zalem and the Rana ceased to be a matter of importance. He nominated Umbaji his lieutenant, with the command of a large force, by whose aid he would reimburse himself for the sums thus advanced. Having carried his object with Sindhya, Umbaji proceeded direct from his tent to that of the Ranas. Ministers, Shiotas and Satadas, with whom, by the promise of cooperation in their views, and perfect subserviency to the Rana's interests, he was alike successful. Umbaji, with the rapidity necessary to ensure success, having in a few hours accomplished his purpose, hastened back to Zalem, to acquaint him. That his wish to retire had met with general acquiescence. And so well did he manage, that the Rana's mace-bearer arrived at the same moment to announce that the Kailat of leave awaited his acceptance. Zalem being thus outwitted, the Salumbar chief descended from Chitter, and touched the Rana's feet. Sindhya pursued his march to the Deccan and Umbaji was left sole. Arbiter of Muir. The Saktawats maintained the lead at court. 520 and were not backward in consigning the estates of their rivals. To the incubus now settled on the country, while the mortified. Zalem, on his retreat, recorded his expenses. To be produced on. Some fitting occasion. Sindhya's instructions to Umbaji. Umbaji remained eight. Years in Muir, reaping its revenues and amassing those hordes of wealth which subsequently gave him the lead in Hindustan and enabled him nearly to assert his independence. Yet, although 
he accumulated two million pounds sterling from her soil, exacting one half of the produce of agricultural industry. The suppression of feuds and exterior aggressions gave to Muir a degree of tranquility and happiness to which she had long been a stranger. The instructions delivered to Umbaji were 1. The entire restoration of the Rana's authority and resumption of the crown lands from rebellious chiefs and mercenary Sindhis. 2. The expulsion of the pretender from Kumhamer. 3. The recovery of God War from the Raja of Marvar. 4. To settle the Bundi feud for the murder of Rana Arsi. A schedule, Pandri, for the twenty locks stipulated was made and levied, twelve from the Kandawat estates and eight from the Saktawats. And the sum of sixty locks was awarded, besides the expense of Umbaji's army, when the other specified objects should be attained. Within two years the pretender was expelled come Homer, Jahajpur was recovered from a rebellious Ranavat, and the crown lands were redeemed from 521 the nobles. The personal domain of the Rana, agricultural and commercial, still realized nearly 50 lakhs of rupees. After these services, though God War was still unredeemed, the Bundi feud unappeased, and the lands mortgaged to the Marathas were not restored, Umbaji assumed the title of Subadar of Muir, and identified himself with the parties of the day. Yet so long as he personally upheld the interests of the Rana, his memory is done justice to, notwithstanding he never conformed to the strict letter of his engagements. The Rana's ministers, fearing lest their brother's fate should be theirs in the event of the Kandawats again attaining power, and deeming their own and their sovereign security dependent on Umbaji's presence, made a subsidiary engagement with him, and lands to the amount of 75,000 rupees monthly, or 8 lakhs annually, were appropriated for his force. But so completely were the resources of the country diverted from their honest use, that when, in s. 1851, a marriage was negotiated between the Rana's sister and the Prince of Jaipur, the Rana was obliged to borrow 50,000 pounds from the Maratha commander to purchase the nuptial presents. The following year was marked by a triple event, the death of the Queen Mother, the birth of a son and heir to the Rana, and the bursting of the embankment of the lake which swept away a third of the city and a third of its inhabitants. Superstition attributed this catastrophe to the Rana's impiety, in establishing a new festival to Gori, the Isis of Rajasthan. Anarchy in Muir Umbaji, who was this year nominated by Sindhya his viceroy in Hindustan, left Ganesh Pant as his lieutenant in Muir, with whom acted the Rana's officers, Sawai and Shurji Mehta who applied themselves to make the most of their ephemeral power with so rapacious a spirit that Umbaji was compelled to displace Ganesh Pant and appoint the celebrated Ray Chand. To him they would not yield, and each party formed a nucleus for disorder and misrule. It would be uninteresting. 522 and nauseating to the reader to carry him through all the scenes of villainy which gradually desolated this country. For whose spoil pilfering Marathas, savage Rohillas, and adventurous Franks were all let loose. The now humbled Kandawats, many of whose fiefs were confiscated, took to horse, and in conjunction with lawless Indies scoured the country. Their estates were attacked, Kurabar was taken, and batteries were placed against Salumbar whence the Sindhis fled and found refuge in Diagar. In this exigence, the Kandawats determined to send an envoy to Umbaji, who was then engaged in the siege of Daisha, and Ajit Singh, since prominent in the intrigues of Muir, was the organ of his clan on this occasion. For the sum of ten lakhs the avaricious Maratha agreed to recall his deputy from Muir to renounce Shiotas and the Saktawats, and lend his support to the Kandawats. The Salumbar chief again took the lead at court, and with Agarji Mehta as minister, the Saktawats. 523 were attacked, the stipulated ten locks raised from their estates, and two fiefs of note, Hintha and Samari, confiscated. 524 Death of Mahadaji Sindhya, January 12, 1794 the death of Mahadaji Sindhya, and the accession of his nephew Dalatro. His murder of the Shenvi Brahmins, 
and his quarrels with the bays, princesses, wives of the deceased Scindia, all occurred at this time, and materially influenced the events in Muir. The power of Umbaji as Subadar of Hindustan was strengthened by the minority of Scindia, although contested by Lakwa and the Bays, supported by the Kichi prince, Durjan Sal, and the Daisha. Raja, who fought and died for the princesses. Lakwa wrote to the Rana to throw off Umbaji's yoke and expel his lieutenant. While Umbaji commanded his deputy to eject the Shenvi Brahmins. 525 supporters of Lakwa, from all the lands in Muir. 2. This end Ganesh Pant called on the Rana's ministers and chiefs who, consulting thereon, determined to play a deep game. And, while they apparently acquiesced in the schemes of Ganesh, they wrote the Shinvis to advance from Jawad and attack him, promising them support. They met at Sawa, Nana was defeated, with the loss of his guns, and retired on Chitter. With a feint of support, the Khandawats made him again call in his garrison and Try another battle, which he also lost and fled to Hammergar. Then, uniting with his enemies, they invested the place with 15,000 men. Nana bravely maintained himself, making many sallies, in one of which both the sons of Viraj Singh, the chief of Hammergar, were slain. Shortly after, Nana was relieved by some battalions of the new raised regulars sent by Umbaji under Gulab Rao Kadam, upon which he commenced his retreat on Ajmer. At Musamusi he was forced to action, and success had nearly crowned the efforts of the clans, when a horseman, endeavoring to secure a mare, calling out, Bagi! Bagi! She flies! She flies! The word spread, while those who caught her, exclaiming, Milgai! Milgai! She is taken. But. Equally significant with going over to the enemy caused a. General panic, and the Khandawats, on the verge of victory. Disgraced themselves, broke and fled. Several were slain, among. Whom was the Sindhi leader Chandan? Shapura opened its gates. To the fugitives led by the Goliath of the host, the chief of Diagar. It was an occasion not to be lost by the bards of the rival clan, and many a ribald stanza records this day's disgrace. Umbaji's lieutenant, however, was so roughly handled that several chiefs redeemed their estates, and the Rana much of the Fisk, from Maratha control. Contest of Umbaji and Lakwa. Muir now became the arena on which the rival satraps Umbaji and Lakwa contested the 526 Exalted Office of Sindhya's Lieutenancy in Hindustan. Lakwa was joined by all the chiefs of Muir, his cause being their own. And Hamargar, still held by Nana's party, was reinvested. Two thousand shot had made a practicable breach, when Bala Rao. Inglia, Bapu Sindhya, Jusvant Rao Sindhya, a brigade under the European Mudda Field with the auxiliary battalions of Zalem. Singh of Kota, the whole under the command of Umbaji's son, arrived to relieve the lieutenant. Lakwa raised the siege, and took post with his allies under the walls of Chitter, whilst the besieged left the untenable Hamargar, and joined the relief at Gosunda. The rival armies were separated only by the Barak River on whose banks they raised batteries and cannonaded each other, when a dispute arose in the victor camp regarding the pay of the troops, between Bala Rao, brother of Umbaji, and Nana. And the latter withdrew and retreated to Sanginar. Thus, disunited, it might have been expected that these congregated masses would have dissolved, or fallen upon each other, when the Rajputs might have given the coup de grace to the survivors. But they were Marathas, and their politics were too complicated. To end in simple strife, almost all the actors in these scenes lived. To contest with, and be humiliated by, the British. George Thomas. 
the defection of Nana equalized the parties. But Bala Rao, never partial to fighting, opportunely recollected. A debt of gratitude to Lakwa, to whose clemency he owed his life when taken by storm in Gugul Chepra. He also wanted money to pay his force, which a private overture to Lakwa secured. They met, and Bala Rao retired boasting of his gratitude. To which, and the defection of Nana, soon followed by that. Of Bapu Sindhya, the salvation of Lakwa was attributed. Sutherland. With a brigade was detached by Ambaji to aid Nana, but. A dispute depriving him of this reinforcement, he called in a. Partisan of more celebrity, the brave George Thomas. Ambaji's. 527 Lieutenant and Lakwa were once more equal foes, and the Rana his chiefs and subjects being distracted between these conflicting bands, whose leaders alternately paid their respects to him, were glad to obtain a little repose by espousing the cause of either combatant, whose armies during the monsoon encamped for six weeks within sight of each other. Pillage in Muir. Durjan Sal, Kichi, with the nobles of Muir, hovered round Nana's camp with five thousand horse to cut off his supplies, but Thomas escorted the convoys from Shapura with his regulars, and defied all their efforts. Thomas at length advanced his batteries against Lakwa, on whose position a general assault was about taking place, when a tremendous storm, with torrents of rain which filled the stream, cut off his batteries from the main body, burst the gates of Shapura, his point de puy, and laid the town in ruins. Lakwa seized the moment, and with the Muir chiefs stormed and carried the isolated batteries, capturing fifteen pieces of cannon. And the Shapura Raja, threatened at once by his brother nobles and the vengeance of heaven, refused further provision to Nana, who was compelled to abandon his position and retreat to Sanginer the discomfited lieutenant vowed vengeance against the estates of the Muir chieftains, and after the rains, being reinforced by Umbaji, again took the field. Then commenced a scene of carnage, pillage, and individual defense. The whole of the Kondawat estates under the Aravali range were laid waste. Their castles assaulted, some taken and destroyed, and heavy. Sums levied on all. Thomas besieged Diagar and Amet, and both fought and paid. Kasital and Lasani were captured, and the latter raised for its gallant resistance. Thus they were proceeding in the work of destruction, when Umbaji was dispossessed of the government of Hindustan, to which Lakwa was nominated, and Nana was compelled to surrender all the fortresses and towns he held in Muir. 528 Dalit Rao Sindhya reduces Muir. From this period must be dated the pretensions of Sindhya to consider Muir as tributary. To him, we have traced the rise of the Marathas and the progress of their baneful influence in Muir. The abstractions of territory from S. 1826 to 1831, A.D. 1769 to 74, as pledges for contributions, satisfied their avarice till 1848, A.D. 1791, when the Salumba Rebellion brought the great Sindhya to Chitter, leaving Umbaji as his lieutenant, with a subsidiary force, to recover the Rana's lost possessions. We have related how these conditions were fulfilled. How Umbaji, inflated with the wealth, of Muir, assumed almost regal dignity in Hindustan, assigning the devoted land to be governed by his deputies, whose contest with other aspirants made this unhappy region the stage for constant struggles for supremacy. And while the secret policy of Zalem Singh stimulated the Saktawats to cling to Umbaji, the Khandawats gave their influence and interest to his rival Lakwa. The unhappy Rana and the peasantry paid for this rivalry. While Sindhya, whose power was now in its zenith, 
fastened one of his desultory armies on Muir, in contravention of former treaties. Without any definite views, or even instructions to its commander. It was enough that a large body should supply itself without assailing him for prey, and whose services were available when required. Lacqua dad Amarada Viceroy. Lacqua, the new viceroy. Marched to Muir, Agarji Mehta was appointed minister to the Rana, and the Kandawats again came into power. For the sum of six lakhs Lakwa dispossessed the Shapura of Jahajpur, for the liquidation of which thirty-six of its towns were mortgaged. Zalem Singh, who had long been maneuvering to obtain Jahajpur, administered to the necessities of the Maratha, paid the note of hand, and took possession of the city and its villages. A contribution of twenty-four lakhs was imposed throughout the country, and levied by force of arms, after which first act of the new viceroy he quitted Muir for Jaipur, leaving Jusvant Rao Bayo as his deputy. Mauji Ram, the deputy of Agarji, the Rana's minister, determined to adopt the European mode of discipline, now become general amongst all the native powers of India. But, when the chiefs were called upon to contribute to the support of mercenary regulars in a field artillery, they evinced their patriotism by confining this zealous minister. Sadadas was 529 once more placed in power, and his brother Shiodas recalled from Kota, whither he had fled from the Kondawats, who now appropriated to themselves the most valuable portions of the Rana's personal domain. Holkar defeated at Indore. Plunder of Nathadvara, image. Removed. The Battle of Indore, in A.D. 1802, where at least 150,000 men assembled to dispute the claim to predatory empire. Wrested the ascendancy from Holkar, who lost his guns, equipage, and capital, from which he fled to Muir. Pursued by Sindhias. Victorious army led by Sadashio and Bala Rao. In his flight he plundered Rutlam and passing Binder, the castle of the Saktawat. Chief, he demanded a contribution, from which and his meditated visit to Udaipur, the Rana and his vassal were saved by the activity of the pursuit. Failing in these objects, Holkar retreated on Nathadvara, the celebrated shrine of the Hindu. Apollo it was here this active soldier first showed symptoms of mental derangement. He upbraided Krishna, while prostrate, before his image, for the loss of his victory, and levied three locks of rupees on the priests and inhabitants, several of whom he carried to his camp as hostages for the payment. The portal Dwara, of the god, Nath, proving no bar either to Turk or equally. Impious Maratha, Damodarji, the high priest, removed the god of Raj from his pedestal and sent him with his establishment to Udaipur for protection. The Chauhan chief of Kotharia, one of the sixteen nobles, in whose estate was the sacred fane, undertook the duty, and with twenty horsemen, his vassals, escorted the shepherd god by intricate passes to the capital. On his return, he was intercepted by a band of Holkar's troops, who insultingly desired the surrender of their horses. But the descendant of the illustrious Prithiraj preferred death to dishonor, dismounting. He hamstrung his steed, commanding his vassals to follow his example. And sword in hand courted his fate in the unequal conflict, in which he fell, with most of his gallant retainers. There are many such isolated exploits in the records of this eventful period, of which the Chauhans of Kotharia had their full share. Spoil, from whatever source, being welcome to these depredators. Nathadvara remained long abandoned. And Apollo, after 536 months' residence at Udaipur, finding insufficient protection, took another flight to the mountains of Gassir, where the High priest threw up fortifications for his defense. And spiritual. Thunders being disregarded, the pontiff henceforth buckled on. 
the armor of flesh, and at the head of four hundred cavaliers. With lance and shield, visited the minor shrines in his extensive diocese. The inroad of Holkar. To return to Holkar. He pursued his route by Banera and Shapura, levying from both, to Ujmer. Where he distributed a portion of the offerings of the followers of Krishna amongst the priests of Muhammad at the mosque of Khwajapir. Thence he proceeded towards Jaipur. Sindhya's leaders on reaching Muir renounced the pursuit, and Udaipur was cursed with their presence, when three lakhs of rupees were extorted from the unfortunate Rana, raised by the sale of household effects and the jewels of the females of his family. Jesvant Rao Bayo, the Subadar of Muir, had prepared another schedule. Pandri, which he left with Tantia, his deputy, to realize. Then followed the usual scene of conflict, the attack of the chieftains. Estates, distraining of the husbandman, seizure of his cattle, and his captivity for ransom, or his exile. Muir quarrels. The celebrated Lakwa, disgraced by his prince, died at this time in sanctuary at Salumbar. And Bala. Rao, brother to Umbaji, returned, and was joined by the Saktawats. And the minister Sadadas, who expelled the Khandawats for their control over the prince. Zalem Singh, in furtherance of his schemes and through hatred of the Khandawats, united himself to this faction, and Devi Chand, minister to the Rana, set up by the Khandawats, was made prisoner. Bala Rao levied and destroyed their estates with unexampled ferocity, which produced a bold attempt at deliverance. The Khandawat leaders assembled at the Chao Gan, the Champ de Mars, to consult on their safety. The insolent Maratha had preceded them to the palace, demanding the surrender of the minister's deputy, Maoji Ram. The Rana indignantly refused them, the Maratha importuned, threatened, and at length commanded his troops to advance to the palace, when the intrepid minister pinioned the audacious plunderers, and secured his adherents, including their old enemy, Nana Ganesh, Jamalkar, and Yudha Kunwar. The latter, a 531 notorious villain, had an elephant's chain put round his neck. While Bala Rao was confined in a bath. The leaders thus. Arrested, the Khandawats sallied forth and attacked their camp. In the valley, which surrendered. Though the regulars under. Hirzi retreated in a hollow square, and reached Gadarmala in. Safety. Zalem Singh determined to liberate his friend Bala Rao. From peril and aided by the Saktawats under the chiefs of Binder and Lawa, advanced to the Chaija Pass, one of the defile leading to the capital. Had the Rana put these chiefs to instant death, he would have been justified, although he would have incurred the resentment of the whole Maratha nation. Instead of this, he put himself at the head of a motley levy of 6,000 Sindhis, Arabs, and Gosains, with the brave Jai. Singh and a band of his gallant Kichis, ever ready to poise the lance against a Maratha. They defended the pass for five days. Against a powerful artillery. At length the Rana was compelled to liberate Bala Rao, and Zalem Singh obtained by this interference. Possession of the fortress and entire district of Jahajpur. A schedule of war contribution, the usual finale to these events. Followed Bala's liberation, and no means were left untried to realize the exaction, before Holkar, then approaching, could contest the spoil. Holkar plunders Udaipur. This chief, having recruited his shattered forces, again left the south. Binder felt his resentment for non-compliance with his demands on his retreat after the Battle of Indore. The town was nearly destroyed, but spared for two. Locks of rupees, for the payment of which villages were assigned. Thence he repaired to Udaipur, being met by Ajit Singh, the Rana's ambassador, when the enormous sum of forty lakhs, or 
500,000 pounds, was demanded from the country, of which one third was commanded to be instantly forthcoming. The palace was denuded of everything which could be converted into gold, the females were deprived of every article of luxury and comfort, by which, with contributions levied on the city, twelve locks were 532 obtained. While hostages from the household of the Rana and chief citizens were delivered as security for the remainder, and immured in the Maratha camp. Holkar then visited the Rana. Lala and Badnor were attacked, taken, and restored on large payments. Diagar alone was mulcted four and a half locks. Having devastated Muir during eight months, Holkar marched to Hindustan, Ajit Singh accompanying him as the Rana's representative. While Bala Ram Seth was left to levy the balance of the forty locks. Holkar had reached Shapura. When Sindhya entered Muir, and their camps formed a junction to allow the leaders to organize their mutual plans of hostility to the British government. These chieftains, in their efforts to cope with the British power, had been completely humiliated and their resources broken. But Rajasthan was made to pay the penalty of British success, which riveted her chains, and it would be but honest, now we have the power to diminish that penalty. Sindhya and Holkar in Muir. The rainy season of A.D. 1805. Found Sindhya and Holkar encamped in the plains of Badnor. Desirous, but afraid, to seek revenge in the renewal of war. Deprived. Of all power in Hindustan, and of the choicest territory. North and south of the Nirbutta, with numerous discontented. Armies now let loose on these devoted countries, their passions. Inflamed by defeat. And blind to every sentiment of humanity. They had no alternative to pacify the soldiery and replenish their own ruined resources but indiscriminate pillage. It would require a pen powerful as the pencil of Salvatore Rosa to paint the horrors which filled up the succeeding ten years, to which the author was an eyewitness, destined to follow in the train of Rapin, and to view in the traces of Maratha camps the desolation. 533 and political annihilation of all the central states of India. Several of which aided the British in their early struggle for dominion. But were now allowed to fall without a helping hand. The scapegoats of our successes. Peace between the Marathas. And British was, however, doubtful, as Sindhya made the restoration of the rich provinces of Gohad and Gwalior a sine qua non and unhappily for their legitimate ruler, who had been inducted into the seat of his forefathers, a governor-general, Lord Cornwallis, of ancient renown, but in the decline of life, with views totally unsuited to the times, abandoned our allies, and renounced all for peace, sending an ambassador to Scindia, to reunite the bonds of a perpetual friendship. Holkar saves Muir from Scindia. The Maratha leaders were anxious, if the war should be renewed, to shelter their families and valuables in the strongholds of Muir, and their respective camps became the rendezvous of the rival factions. Sardar Singh, the organ of the Khandawats, represented the Rana at Sindhya's court, at the head of whose council Zambaji had just been placed. His rancor to the Rana was implacable. From the support given in self defense to his political antagonist, Lakwa, and he agitated the partition of Muir amongst the great Maratha leaders. But whilst his baneful influence was preparing this result, the credit of Sangram Saktawat with Holkar counteracted it. It would be unfair and ungallant not to record that a fair suitor, the Baizabai, Sindhya's wife, powerfully. 534 contributed to the Rana's preservation on this occasion. This lady, the daughter of the notorious Sarji Rao, had unbounded power over Sindhya. Her sympathies were awakened on behalf of the supreme head of the Rajput nation, of which blood she 
had to boast, though she was now connected with the Marathas. Even the hostile clans stifled their animosities on this occasion. And Sardar Singh Khandawat left Sindhya's camp to join his rival. Sangram with Holkar, and aided by the upright Kishandas. Pancholi, united in their remonstrances. Asking Holkar if he had given his consent to sell Muir to Umbaji. Touched by the picture of the Ranas and their country's distresses, Holkar swore. It should not be, advised unity amongst themselves, and caused the representatives of the rival clans to eat opium together. Nor did he stop here, but with the envoys repaired to Sindhya's. Tense, descanted on the Rana's high descent, the master of their master's master, urging that it did not become them to overwhelm him, and that they should even renounce the mortgaged lands which their fathers had too long unjustly held, himself. Setting the example by the restitution of Nimbahara. 2. Strengthen his argument, he expatiated with Sindhya on the policy of conciliating the Rana, whose strongholds might be available in the event of a renewal of hostilities with the British. Sindhya appeared a convert to his views, and retained the envoys. In his camp, the Maratha camps were twenty miles apart. An incessant torrents of rain had for some days prevented all intercourse. In this interim, Holkar received intelligence that Baron Baksh, as envoy from the Rana, was in Lord Lake's camp negotiating for the aid of British troops, then at Tonk, to drive the Marathas from Muir. The incensed Holkar sent for the Rana's ambassadors and assailed them with a torrent of reproach. Accusing them of treachery, he threw the newspaper containing the information at Kishanda's, asking if that were the way in which the Muris kept faith with him? I cared not to break with Sindhya in support of your master, and while combating the Farangis, Franks, when all the Hindus should be 535 as brothers, your sovereign the Rana, who boasts of not acknowledging the supremacy of Delhi, is the first to enter into arms with them. Was it for this I prevented Umbaji being fastened on you? Kishandas here interrupted and attempted to pacify him, when Alakar Tantia, Holkar's minister, stopped him. Short, observing to his prince, you see the faith of these Rangra. They would disunite you and Sindhya, and ruin both. Shake them off, be reconciled to Sindhya, dismiss Sarji Rao, and let Umbaji be Subadar of Muir, or I will leave you and take Sindhya into Malva. The other counselors, with the exception of Bayo Bhaskar, seconded this advice, Sarji Rao was dismissed. And Holkar proceeded northward, where he was encountered and pursued to the Panjab by the British under the intrepid and enterprising lake, who dictated terms to the Maratha at the altars of Alexander. Holkar protects Muir interests. Holkar had the generosity to stipulate, before his departure from Muir, for the security of the Rana and his country, telling Sindhya he should hold him personally amenable to him if Umbaji were permitted to violate his guarantee. But in his misfortunes this threat was disregarded, and a contribution of sixteen lakhs was levied immediately on Muir. Sadashio Rao, with Baptiste's brigade, was detached from the camp in June 1806, for the double purpose of levying it, and driving from Udaipur a detachment of the Jaipur Prince's troops, bringing proposals and preliminary presents for this prince's marriage with the Rana's daughter. The tragedy of Krishna Kunwari. It would be imagined that the miseries of Rana Bhim were not susceptible of aggravation, and that fortune had done her worst to humble him. But his 536 pride as a sovereign and his feelings as a parent were destined to be yet more deeply wounded. The Jaipur cortege had encamped near the capital, to the number of 3,000 men, while the Rana's acknowledgments of acceptance were dispatched, and had reached Shapura. But Raja Man of Marvar also advanced. 
pretensions, founded on the princess having been actually betrothed to his predecessor, and urging that the throne of Marvar, and not the individual occupant, was the object, he vowed. Resentment and opposition if his claims were disregarded. These were suggested, it is said, by his nobles to cloak their own views. And promoted by the Kandawats, then in favor with the Rana. Whose organ, Ajit, was bribed to further them, contrary to the decided wishes of their prince. Krishna Kanwari, the Virgin Krishna, was the name of the lovely object, the rivalry for whose hand assembled under the banners of her suitors, Jagat Singh of Jaipur and Raja Man of Marvar, not only their native chivalry, but all the predatory powers of India. And who, like Helen of old, involved in destruction her own and the rival houses. Sindhya having been denied a pecuniary demand by Jaipur, not only opposed the nuptials, but aided the claims of Raja Man, by demanding of the Rana the dismissal of the Jaipur embassy, which being refused, he advanced his brigades and batteries. And after a fruitless resistance, in which the Jaipur troops joined, forced the pass, threw a corps of eight thousand men into the valley, and following in person, encamped within cannon range of the city. The Rana had now no alternative but to dismiss the nuptial cortege, and agree to whatever was demanded. Sindhya remained a month in the valley, during which an interview took place between him and the Rana at the shrine of Eklinga. 537 Battle of Parbatsar Defeat of the Marvar forces The heralds of Hyman being thus rudely repulsed and its symbols intercepted. The Jaipur prince prepared to avenge his insulted pride and disappointed hopes, and accordingly arrayed a force such as had not assembled since the empire was in its glory. Raja Man eagerly took up the gauntlet of his rival and headed the swords of Maru. But dissension prevailed in Marvar, where rival claimants for the throne had divided the loyalty of the clans, introducing there also the influence of the Marathas. Raja Man who had acquired the scepter by party aid, was obliged to maintain himself by it, and to pursue the demoralizing policy of the period by ranging his vassals against each other. These nuptials gave the malcontents an opportunity to display their long-curbed resentments and following the example of Muir. They set up a pretender, whose interests were eagerly espoused, and whose standard was erected in the array of Jaipur. The prince at the head of 120,000 men advancing against his rival, who with less than half the number met him at Parbatsar, on their mutual frontier. The action was short, for while a heavy cannonade opened on either side, the majority of the Marvar nobles went over to the pretender. Raja Man turned his poniard against himself, but some chiefs yet faithful to him rested the weapon from his hand, and conveyed him from the field. He was pursued to his capital, which was invested, besieged, and gallantly defended during six months. The town was at length taken and plundered, but the castle of Jodha laughed a siege to scorn. In time with the aid of finesse, the mighty host of Jaipur, which had consumed the forage of these arid plains for Twenty miles around, began to crumble away, intrigue spread through every rank, and the siege ended in pusillanimity and flight. The Xerxes of Rajwara, the effeminate Kachwaha, alarmed at length for his personal safety, sent on the spoils of 538 Parbatsar and Jodhpur to his capital. But the brave nobles of Marvar, drawing the line between loyalty and patriotism, and determined that no trophy of rat or degradation should be conveyed by the Kachwahas from Marvar, attacked the cortege and redeemed the symbols of their disgrace. The colossal array of the invader was soon dismembered, and the lion of the world, Jugat Singh, humbled and crestfallen, skulked from the desert retreat of his rival, indebted to a partisan corps for safety and convoy to his capital around whose walls the wretched remnants of this ill-starred confederacy long lagged. In expectation of their pay, 
while the bones of their horses and the ashes of their riders whitened the plain and rendered it a Golgotha. Nawab Amir Khan, by the aid of one of the most notorious villains India ever produced, the Nawab Amir Khan, the pretenders. Party was treacherously annihilated. This man with his brigade of artillery and horse was amongst the most efficient of the foes of Raja Man. But the Ori Sacra fames not only made him desert the side on which he came for that of the Raja, but for a specific sum offer to rid him of the pretender and all his associates. Like Judas, he kissed whom he betrayed, took service with the pretender, and at the shrine of a saint of his own. Faith exchanged turbans with their leaders. And while the two credulous Rajput chieftains celebrated this acquisition to their party in the very sanctuary of hospitality, crowned by the dance and the song, the tents were cut down, and the victims thus enveloped, slaughtered in the midst of festivity by showers of grape. Thus finished the underplot but another and more noble victim was demanded before discomfited ambition could repose, or the curtain drop on this eventful drama. Neither party 539 would relinquish his claim to the fair object of the war. And the torch of discord could be extinguished only in her blood. To the same ferocious Khan is attributed the unhallowed suggestion, as well as its compulsory execution. The scene was now changed from the desert castle of Jodha to the smiling valley of Udaipur soon to be filled with funereal lamentation. The Tragedy of Krishna Kanwari Krishna Kanwari by the Virgin Princess Krishna, was in her sixteenth year, her mother was of the Chawara race, the ancient kings of Anhawara. Sprung from the noblest blood of Hind, she added beauty of face and person to an engaging demeanor, and was justly proclaimed the flower of Rajasthan when the Roman father pierced the bosom of the dishonored Virginia, appeased virtue applauded the deed. When Iphigenia was led to the sacrificial altar, the salvation of her country yielded a noble consolation. The votive victim of Jephthah's success had the triumph of a father's fame to sustain her resignation. And in the meekness of her sufferings we have the best parallel to the sacrifice of the lovely. Krishna, though years have passed since the barbarous immolation, it is never related but with a faltering tongue and moistened eyes, albeit in use to the melting mood. The rapacious and bloodthirsty Patan, covered with infamy, repaired to Udaipur, where he was joined by the pliant and subtle Ajit. Meek in his demeanor, unostentatious in his habits. Despising honors, yet covetous of power, religion, which he followed with the zeal of an ascetic, if it did not serve as a cloak, was at least no hindrance to an immeasurable ambition, in the attainment of which he would have sacrificed all but himself. When the Patan revealed his design, that either the princess should wed Raja Man, or by her death seal the peace of Rajwara, whatever arguments were used to point the alternative. The Rana was made to see no choice between consigning his beloved child to the rat or prince, or witnessing the effects of a more extended dishonor from the vengeance of the Patan. And the storm of his palace by his licentious adherence, the fiat passed that Krishna Kanwari should die. But the deed was left for women to accomplish, the hand of man refused it. The Rala of an eastern prince is a world within itself, it is the labyrinth containing the strings that move 540 the puppets which alarm mankind. Here intrigue sits enthroned, and hence its influence radiates to the world always at a loss to trace effects to their causes. Maharaja Dalit Singh, descended for generations ago from one common ancestor with the Rana, was first sounded to save the honor of Udaipur, but, horror-struck, he exclaimed, accursed the tongue that commands it. Dust on my allegiance, if thus to be preserved. The Maharaja Jawandas, a natural brother, was then called upon, the dire necessity was explained, and it was urged that no common hand could be armed for the purpose. He accepted the poniard, but when in youthful loveliness Krishna appeared before him, the dagger fell from his hand, and he returned more wretched than the victim. The fatal purpose thus revealed, the shrieks of the frantic mother reverberated through the palace, as she implored mercy, or execrated the murderers of her child, 
who alone was resigned to her fate. But death was arrested, not averted. To use the phrase of the narrator, she was excused the steel, the cup was prepared, and prepared by female hands. As the messenger presented it in the name of her father, she bowed and drank it, sending up a prayer for his life and prosperity. The raving mother poured imprecations on his head, while the lovely victim, who shed not a tear, thus endeavored to console her, why afflict yourself, my mother, at this shortening of the sorrows of life? I fear not to die. Am I not your daughter? Why should I fear death? We are marked out for sacrifice from our birth, we scarcely enter the world but to be sent out again, let me thank my father that I have lived so long. Thus she conversed till the nauseating 541 draft refused to assimilate with her blood. Again the bitter potion was prepared. She drained it off, and again it was rejected, but, as if to try the extreme of human fortitude, a third was administered. And, for the third time, nature refused to aid the horrid purpose. It seemed as if the fabled charm, which guarded the life of the founder of her race, was inherited by the virgin Krishna. But the bloodhounds, the Patan and Ajit, were impatient till their victim was at rest, and cruelty, as if gathering strength from defeat, made another in a fatal attempt. A powerful opiate was presented, the Kasumba draft. She received it with a smile, wished the scene over, and drank it. The desires of barbarity were accomplished. She slept, a sleep from which she never awoke. The wretched mother did not long survive her child. Nature was exhausted in the ravings of despair, she refused food, and her remains in a few days followed those of her daughter to the funeral pyre. Even the ferocious Khan, when the instrument of his infamy, Ajit, reported the issue, received him with contempt, and spurned him from his presence, tauntingly asking, if this were the boasted Rajput valor? But the wily traitor had to encounter language far more bitter from his political adversary, whom he detested. Sangram Saktawat reached the capital only four days after the catastrophe, a man in every respect the reverse of Ajit. Audaciously brave, he neither feared the frown of his 542 sovereign or the sword of his enemy. Without introduction he rushed into the presence, where he found seated the traitor Ajit. O oh, dastard! Who has thrown dust on the Sisodia race, whose blood which has flowed in purity through a hundred ages has now been defiled? This sin will check its course forever, a blot so foul in our annals that no Sisodia will ever again hold up his head. A sin to which no punishment were equal. But the end of our race is approaching. The line of Bapa Ravol is at an end. Heaven has ordained this, a signal of our destruction. The Rana hid his face with his hands, when turning to Ajit, he exclaimed, Thou stain on the Sisodia race, thou impure of Rajput blood, dust be on thy head as thou hast covered us all with shame. May you die childless, and your name die with you. Why this indecent haste? Had the Patan stormed the city? Had he attempted to violate the sanctity of the Roala? And though he had, could you not die as Rajputs, like your ancestors? Was it thus they gained a name? Was it thus our race became renowned, thus they opposed the might of kings? Have you forgotten the Sakas of Chitter? But whom do I address, not Rajputs? Had the honor of your females been endangered, had you sacrificed them all and rushed sword in hand on the enemy, your name would have lived, and the Almighty would have secured the seed of Baparavel. But to owe preservation to this unhallowed deed, you did not even await the threatened danger. Fear seems to have deprived you of every faculty, or you might have spared the blood of Sriji, and if you did not scorn to owe your safety to deception, might have substituted some less noble victim. But the end of our race approaches. Fate of the murderers. The traitor to manhood, his sovereign. And humanity, durst not reply. The brave Sangram is now dead. But the prophetic anathema has been fulfilled. Of ninety-five. Children, sons and daughters, but one son, the brother of Krishna. Is left to the Rana and though his two remaining daughters have been recently married to the princes of Jaslamar and Bikaner, the Salic law, which is in full force in these states. 543 precludes all honor through female descent. His hopes rest solely on the prince, Javana Singh, and though in the flower of 
Youth and health, the marriage bed, albeit boasting no less than. For young princesses, has been blessed with no progeny. The elder brother of Giovanna died two years ago. Had he lived he would have been Amra III. With regard to Ajit, the curse has been fully accomplished. Scarcely a month after, his wife and two sons were numbered with the dead. And the hoary traitor has since been wandering from shrine to shrine, performing penance and alms in expiation of his sins, yet unable to fling from him ambition, and with his beads in one hand, Rama. Rama. Ever on his tongue, and subdued passion in his looks, his heart is deceitful as ever. Enough of him, let us exclaim with Sangram, dust on his head, which all the waters of the Ganges could not purify from the blood of the Virgin Krishna, but rather would the multitudinous see incarnadine. Amir Khan rewarded by the British. His coadjutor, Amir Khan, is now linked by treaties, in amity and unity of interests. 544 with the sovereigns of India. And though he has carried mourning into every house of Rajasthan, yet charity might hope forgiveness would be extended to him, could he cleanse himself from this deed of horror, throwing this pearl away, richer than all his tribe. His career of rapin has terminated with the caresses of the blind goddess, and placed him on a pinnacle to which his sword would never have traced the path. Enjoying the most distinguished post amongst the foreign chieftains of Holkar's state, having the regulars and park under his control, with large estates for their support, he added the epithet of traitor to his other titles. When the British government, adopting the leading maxim of Asiatic policy, divide et impera, guaranteed to him the sovereignty of these districts on his abandoning the Marathas, disbanding his legions, and surrendering the park. But though he personally fulfilled not, nor could fulfill, one single stipulation. This man, whose services were not worth the pay of a single sepoy, who fled from his camp unattended, and sought personal protection in that of the British commander, claimed and obtained the full price of our pledge, the sovereignty of about one-third of his master's dominions, and the districts of Suronj, Tonk, Rampura, and Nambahara, form the domain of the Nawab, Amir Khan, etc., etc., etc. This was in the fitful fever of success, when our arms were everywhere triumphant. But were the Viceroy of Hind to summon the forty tributaries now covered by the aegis of British protection to a meeting, the murderer of Krishna would still occupy a place, though low, in this illustrious Devan. Let us hope that his character being known, he would feel himself ill at ease, and let us dismiss him likewise in the words of Sangram, dust on his head. The mind sickens at the contemplation of these unvarying scenes of atrocity. But this unhappy state had yet to pass through two more lusters of aggravated sufferings, to which the author of these annals was an eyewitness, before their termination, upon the alliance of Muir with Britain. From the 545 period of the forcing of the passes, the dismissal of the Jaipur embassy by Sindhya, and the murder of Krishna Kunwari, the embassy of Britain was in the train of the Maratha leader. A witness of the evils described, a most painful predicament, when the hand was stretched out for succor in vain, and the British flag waved in the center of desolation, unable to afford protection. But this day of humiliation is past, thanks to the predatory hordes who goaded us on to their destruction. Although the work was incomplete, a nucleus being imprudently left in Scindia for the scattered particles again to form. Ruin of Muir by the Marathas. In the spring of 1806, when the embassy entered the once fertile Muir, from whose native wealth the monuments the pencil will portray were erected. Nothing but ruin met the eye, deserted towns, roofless houses, and uncultured plains. Wherever the Maratha encamped, Annihilation was ensured, it was a habit, and twenty-four hours sufficed to give to the most flourishing spot the aspect of a desert. The march of destruction was always to be traced for days afterwards. By burning villages and destroyed cultivation. Some 
satisfaction may result from the fact that there was scarcely an actor in these unhallowed scenes whose end was not fitted to his career. Umbaji was compelled to disgorge the spoils of Muir. And his personal sufferings made some atonement for the ills he had inflicted upon her. This satrap, who had almost established his independence in the fortress and territory of Gwalior, suffered every indignity from Scindia, whose authority he had almost thrown off. He was confined in a mean tent, manacled, suffered. The torture of small lighted torches applied to his fingers, and even attempted suicide to avoid the surrender of his riches. But the instrument, an English penknife, was inefficient, the surgeon to the British embassy sewed up the wounds, and his coffers were eased of fifty-five locks of rupees. Muir was, however, once more delivered over to him, he died shortly after. If report be correct, the residue of his treasures was possessed by his ancient ally, Zalem Singh. In this case, the old politician derived the chief advantage of the intrigues of S. 1848, without the crimes attendant on the acquisition. Scindia's father-in-law, when expelled that chief's camp, according to the treaty, enjoyed the ephemeral dignity of Minister 546 to the Rana, when he abstracted the most valuable records, especially those of the revenue. Cumhomer was obtained by the minister Sadidas from Jusvant Rao Bayo for 70,000 rupees, for which assignments were given on this district, of which he retained possession. Amir Khan in A.D. 1809 led his myrmidons to the capital, threatening the demolition of the temple of Eklinga if refused a contribution of eleven lakhs of rupees. Nine were agreed to, but which by no effort could be raised, upon which the Rana's envoys were treated with indignity, and Kishanda's wounded. The passes were forced, Amir Khan entering by Dabari, and his coadjutor and son-in-law, the notorious Jamshid, by the Cherwa, which made but a feeble resistance. The ruffian Patans were billeted on the city, subjecting the Rana to personal humiliation, and Jamshid left with his licentious Rohillas in the capital. The traces of their barbarity are to be seen in its ruins. No woman could safely venture abroad and a decent garment or turban was sufficient to attract their cupidity. Bapu Sindhya Subadar of Muir. In S. 1867, A.D. 1811. Bapu Sindhya arrived with the title of Subadar, and encamped. In the valley, and from this to 1814 these vampires, representing. Sindhya and Amir Khan, possessed themselves of the entire fiscal. Domain, with many of the fiefs occasionally disputing for the spoils, to prevent which they came to a conference at the Daula. Magra, the White Hill, attended by a deputation from the Rana, when the line of demarcation was drawn between the spoilers. A schedule was formed of the towns and villages yet inhabited, the amount to be levied from each specified, and three and a half locks adjudged to Jamshid, with the same sum to Sindhya, but this treaty was not better kept than the former. Ones. Muir was rapidly approaching dissolution, and every. 547 sign of civilization fast disappearing, fields laid waste, cities in. Ruins, inhabitants exiled, chieftains demoralized, the prince and. His family destitute of common comforts. Yet had Sindhya the. Audacity to demand compensation for the loss of his tribute stipulated to Bapu Sindhya, who rendered Muir a desert, carrying her chiefs, her merchants, her farmers, into captivity, and fetters in the dungeons of Ujmer, where many died for want of ransom and others languished till the treaty with the British. In A. D. 1817, set them free. Brother of Ajit, the negotiator of the treaty with the British. Chief of the Jagawat clan, also a branch of the Kandawats, he was killed in a battle with the Marathas. It is yet held by the successor of Sangram, whose faithful services merited the grant he obtained from his prince, and it was in consequence left unmolested in the arrangement of 1817, from the knowledge of his merits. The father of Rawat Jawan Singh, whom I found at Udaipur as military minister, 
acting for his granduncle Ajit the organ of the Khandawats, whose head, Padam Singh, was just emerging from his minority. It was absolutely necessary to get to the very root of all these feuds, when as envoy and mediator I had to settle the disputes of half a century, and make each useful to detect their joint usurpations of the crown domain. She was the grandmother of Man Singh, a fine specimen of a Saktawat cavalier. Lalsit, about forty miles south of Jaipur city. For an account of the battle see Compton, European Military Adventurers, 346 F. Meg Singh was the chief of Begun, and founder of that subdivision of the Khandawats called after him Megawat, and his complexion being very dark, Kala, he was called Kala Meg, the, the Black Cloud. His descendants were very numerous and very refractory. A.D. 1788. He did not recover his liberty for two years, nor till he had surrendered four of the best towns in his fief. Father of the present Hammer Singh, the only chief with whom I was compelled to use severity, but he was incorrigible. He was celebrated for his raids in the Troubles, and from his red whiskers bore with us the name of the Th Red Reaver of Baidsar, more of him by and by. Shiotas and Satidas, with their cousin Jechen. They revenged their brother's death by that of his murderer, and were both in turn slain. Such were these times. The author more than once, when resuming the Khandawat lands, and amongst them Baidsar, the fief of the son of Sardar, was told to recollect the fate of Samji, the advice, however, excited only a smile. He was deemed more of a Saktawat than a Khandawat, and there was some truth in it, for he found the good actions of the former far outweigh the other, who made a boast and monopoly of their patriotism. It was a curious period in his life. The stimulus to action was too high, too constant, to think of self. And having no personal views, being influenced solely by one feeling, the prosperity of all, he despised the very idea of danger, though it was said to exist in various shapes, even in the hospitable plate put before him. But he deemed none capable of such treachery, though once he was within a few minutes' march to the other world, but the cause, if the right one, came from his own cuisinier, or rather boulanger, whom he discharged. See the essay on a feudal system. S. 1847, A.D. 1791. Count Benoit de Boigny, a Savoyard, born at Chambury, 1751, served under Mahadaji Sindhya, and won for him his battles of Patton and Myrta in 1790, defeated Holkar at Lukhari in 1793, resigned his command in 1795, and left India in the next year, died June 21, 1830, Compton, European Military Adventurers, 15 FF. Buckland, Dictionary of Indian Biography, SV. Acquired from the actors in those scenes, the prince, his ministers, Zalem Singh, and the rival chiefs have all contributed. It was levied as follows. Salumbar. Locks. Diagar. Singinger Gosain, their advisor. Kazadal. Amet. Kurabar. Locks. Pandri, Panharapati, a tax on shops, artisans, traders, and persons not engaged in agriculture, levied on their persons, implements, places of work, or traffic, the same as the Madarafa, Wilson, Glossary, S.V. Reaper Rajnagar from the Sindhis, Gurla and Gadarmala from the Purawats, Hamagar from Sardar Singh, and Kurj Kawaria from Salumbar. In Baden, the third month of the rainy season. An account of this festival will hereafter be given. The first of these is now the manager of Prince Jawan Singh's estates, a man of no talent, and the latter, his brother, was one of the ministers on my arrival at Udaipur. He was of invincible good humor, yet full of the spirit of intrigue, and one of the bars to returning prosperity. The cholera carried off this Falstaff of the court, not much to my sorrow. S. 1853, A.D. 1797. This person was nominated the chief civil minister on the author's arrival at Udaipur, an office to which he was every way unequal. The affairs of Muir had never prospered since the faithful Pancholis were deprived of power. Several productions of the descendants of Biharidas have fallen into my hands, their quaint mode of conveying advice may authorize their insertion here. The Pancholis, who had performed so many services to the country, had been for some time deprived of the office of prime minister, which was disposed of as it suited the views of the factious nobles who held power for the time being. 
and who bestowed it on the Metas, Depras, or Dabiais. Amongst the papers of the Pancholis, several addressed to the Rana and to Agarji Meta, the minister of the day, are valuable for the patriotic sentiments they contain, as well as for the general light they throw upon the period. In S. 1853, A.D. 1797, Amrit Rao devised a plan to remedy the evils that oppressed the country. He inculcated the necessity of dispensing with the interference of the Saktawats and Khandawats in the affairs of government, and strengthening the hands of the civil administration by admitting the foreign chieftains to the power he proposed to deprive the former of. He proceeds in the following quaint style. Disease fastened on the country from the following causes, envy and party spirit. With the Turks disease was introduced. But then the prince, his ministers, and chiefs, were of one mind, and medicine was ministered and a cure effected. During Rana Jai Singh's time the disorder returned, which his son Amra put down. He recovered the affairs of government from confusion, gave to everyone his proper rank and dignity, and rendered all prosperous. But Maharna Sangram Singh put from under his wing the Shandarawat of Rampura, and thus opinion of Muir was broken. The calamity of Bihari Das, whose son committed suicide, increased the difficulties. The arrival of the Dakanis under Bajirao, the Jaipur affair and the defeat at Rajmahal, with the heavy expenditure thereby occasioned, augmented the disorder. Add to this in Jugat Singh's time the enmity of the Dabiais towards the Pancholis, which lowered their dignities at home and abroad, and since which time every man has thought himself equal to the task of government. Jagat Singh was also afflicted by the rebellious conduct of his son Pertop, when Shima Solanki and several other chiefs were treacherously cut off. Since which time the minds of the nobles have never been loyal, but black and not to be trusted. Again, on the accession of Pertop, Maharaja Nathji allowed his thoughts to aspire, from which all his kin suffered. Hence animosities, doubts, and deceits, arose on all sides. Add to this the haughty proceeding of Amra Chand now in office. And besides the strife of the Pancholis with each other, their enmity to the Depras. Hence parties were formed which completely destroyed the credit of all. Yet, notwithstanding, they abetted none of their strife, which was the acme to the disease. The feud between Kuman Singh and the Saktawats for the possession of Hintha, aggravated the distresses. The treacherous murder of Maharaja Nathji, and the consequent disgust and retreat of Jusvant Singh of Diagar. The setting up the impostor Ratna Singh and Jala Ragudio struggle for office, with Amra Chan's entertaining the mercenaries of Sindh, brought it to a crisis. The negligence arising out of luxury, and the intrigues of the Dabiais of Rana Arsi, made it spread so as to defeat all attempt at cure. In S. 1829, on the treacherous murder of the Rana by the Bundi prince, and the accession of the minor hammer, Every one set up his own authority, so that there was not even the semblance of government. And now you, to the Rana, listening to the advice of Bhim Singh, Salumbar, and his brother, Arjun, have taken foreigners into pay, and thus riveted all the former errors. You and Sri Baiji Raj, the royal mother, putting confidence in foreigners and Dakanis, have rendered the disease contagious, besides, your mind is gone. What can be done? Medicine may yet be had. Let us unite and struggle to restore the duties of the minister and we may conquer, or at least check its progress. If now neglected, it will hereafter be beyond human power. The Dakanis are the great sore. Let us settle their accounts, and at all events get rid of them, or we lose the land forever. At this time there are treaties and engagements in every corner. I have touched on every subject. Forgive whatever is improper. Let us look the future in the face, and let chiefs, ministers, and all unite. With the welfare of the country all will be well. But this is a disease which, if not now conquered, will conquer us. A second paper as follows. The disease of the country is to be considered and treated as a remittent. Amra Singh cured it and laid a complete system of government and justice. In Sangram's time it once more gained ground. In Jagat Singh's time the seed was thrown into the ground thus obtained. In Pertop's time it sprung up. In Raj Singh's time it bore fruit. In Rana Arsi's time it was ripe. In Hammer's time it was distributed, and all have had a share. And you, Beam Singh, 
the present Rana, have eaten plentifully thereof. Its virtues and flavor you are acquainted with, and so likewise is the country. And if you take no medicine you will assuredly suffer much pain, and both at home and abroad you will be lightly thought of. Be not therefore negligent, or faith and land will depart from you. A third paper to a Garji Meta, then minister. If the milk is curdled it does not signify. Where there is sense butter may yet be extracted, and if the buttermilk, chach, is thrown away it matters not. But if the milk be curdled and black it will require wisdom to restore its purity. This wisdom is now wanted. The foreigners are the black in the curdled milk of Muir. At all hazards remove them. Trust to them and the land is lost. In moonlight what occasion for a blue light? Chandra Jat. Who looks to the false coin of the juggler? Do not credit him who tells you he will make a pigeon out of a feather. Abroad it is said there is no wisdom left in Muir, which is a disgrace to her reputation. The struggle to place the Rana's nephew, Madho Singh, on the throne of Jaipur. The Pancholi must allude to the Maratha subsidiary force under Ambaji. Literally, a moonlight. The particular kind of firework which we call a, a blue light. Mahadaji Sindhya, commonly and erroneously called Madhavarao, died near Pune, January 12, 1794. See his life by H. G. Keen, Rulers of India, Series, Grant Duff, History of Marathas, 343 FF, W. Franklin, History of Shah Alam, 119 FF. There are three classes of Maratha Brahmins, Shenvi, Prabhu, and Maratha. Of the first was Lakwa, Balaba Tantia, Jiwa Dada, Savaji Nana, Lalaji Pundit, and Jusvant Rao Bayo, men who held the mortgaged lands of Muir. There are four groups of Maratha Brahmins, Kankanasthas, Dishasthas, Karhatas, and Kanvas. The Prabhus are not Brahmins, but the writer caste, like the Kayasts of Hindustan, J. Wilson, Indian caste, 1877, 2. 17 ff. The word Shenvi is a corruption of Chayanave, 96, from the supposed number of their sections. I knew him well. He stood six feet six inches, and was bulky in proportion. His limbs rivaled those of the Hercules Farnese. His father was nearly seven feet and died at the early age of twenty-two, in a vain attempt to keep down, by regimen and medicine, his enormous bulk. This is perhaps Captain Butterfield, who served in Scindia's force under Colonel Sutherland. He behaved gallantly in action against Lakwa Dada, for which he received a flattering letter from Perón, no further mention of him has been traced, Compton, Military Adventurers, 344. For Colonel Robert Sutherland, known to natives as Sutledge Sahib, see Compton, 410 ff. For the remarkable career of George Thomas, who nearly succeeded in forming a kingdom of his own on the ruins of the empire in N. India, see Compton, 109 f. W. Franklin, Military Memoirs of Mr. G. Thomas, 1803. Both camps were on the right bank of the Banas, Lakwas at Umli, about ten miles south of Shapura, and Nana's at Kadra, between these towns. Lakwa at this time, S. 1856, A.D. 1799, put the Shapura Raja in possession of the important fortress and district of Jahajpur, which, although the Rana consented to it, covertly receiving from the Raja two lakhs of rupees, disgusted the nobles with Lakwa. Balaba Tantia and Bakshi Narayan Rao were Sindhya's ministers at this period, of the same tribe, the Shenvi, as Lakwa. October 14, 1801, Grant Duff 555. Krishna. 5 and 20, about 30, miles north of Udaipur. On this subject we shall have much to say hereafter. S. 1859, A.D. 1803. Hyder Young Hirzi. 1782-3-1840, son of Captain Harry Thomas Hearsey by a Jot lady, served Scindia under Perón, and also George Thomas. Joined Lord Lake at Dig in 1804, taken prisoner in the Nepal War of 1815, present at the Siege of Bertapur, died near Budon, Buckland, Dict. Indian Biography, S.V. In S. 1860, A.D. 1804. At this juncture an officer of Holkar's, Harnath Chela, 
on passing through Banzine, had some camels carried off by the bills of the Satola estate. Harnath summoned Gulab Singh Khandawat, who came with eight of his relatives, when he was told he should be detained till the cattle were restored. And in the morning, as the Maratha mounted his elephant, he commanded the Raghout chieftain to be seized. Gulab drew his sword and made at Harnath, but his sword broke in the howda, when he plunged his dagger into the elephant. But at length he and all his relations, who nobly plied their swords on the Marathas, were cut to pieces. For a graphic account of these camps C.T. D. Abroughton, Letters Written in a Maratha Camp During the Year 1809, Edition 1892. The Rana of Gohud and Gwalior, the Kichi chiefs of Ragagar and Bahadurgar, and the Nawab of Bhopal, made common cause with us in Warren Hastings' time. The first three possess not a shadow of independence. The last fortunately formed a link in our own policy, and Lord Hastings, in 1818, repaid with liberal interest the services rendered to the government of Warren Hastings in 1782. It was in his power, with equal facility, to have rescued all the other states, and to have claimed the same measure of gratitude which Bhopal is proud to avow. But there was a fatality in the desire to maintain terms with Scindia, whose treachery to our power was overlooked. The author, then a subaltern, was attached to the suite of the ambassador, Mr. Graham Mercer. He left the subsidiary force at Gwalior in December 1805, and the embassy reached Scindia's court in the spring of 1806, then encamped amidst the ruins of Muir. The ministers of Scindia were Umbaji, Bapu Chitnavis, Maduba Huzuria, and Anaji Bhaskar. Baizabai, widow of Dulat Rao Scindia, who died in 1827, was an unscrupulous, designing woman, whose intrigues at Gwalior forced her to take refuge in British territory. She returned after an interval and lived at Gwalior until her death in 1862, IGI, 12. For 24, dot. That is, chief of the race from which issued the Satara sovereigns, whose minister, the Peshwa, accounted Sindhya and Holkar his feudatories. Rangra is an epithet applied to the Rajputs, implying turbulent, from Rana, strife. Rangar is the title of a body of turbulent, predatory Mohammedans, who claim Rajput descent, occupying parts of the E, Panjab and W. Districts of the Ganges Jumna Duab. The derivation suggested is very doubtful, Crook, Tribes and Castes, NWP and Oud, v. 227 ff. In October 1805, Grant Duff 601. Jean Baptiste de La Fontaine Philos, 1775 to 1840, assisted in the campaign against Thomas in 1801. In the war with the English, part of his brigade under Dupont was defeated at Assai. He was afterwards ill-treated by Scindia, but was reinstated. Some of his descendants are still in Scindia's service. Compton, European military adventurers, 352 ff. Sleeman, Rambles, 115, note. He is frequently mentioned in Broughton, letters written in a Maratha camp. To increase his importance, Scindia invited the British envoy and suite to be present on the occasion, when the princely demeanor of the Rana and his sons was advantageously contrasted with that of the Maratha and his suite. It was in this visit that the regal abode of this ancient race, its isles and palaces, acted with irresistible force on the cupidity of this scion of the plough who aspired to, yet dared not seat himself in, the halls of the Caesars. It was even surmised that his hostility to Jaipur was not so much from the refused war contribution, as from a mortifying negative to an audacious desire to obtain the hand of this princess himself. The impression made on the author upon this occasion by the miseries and noble appearance of this descendant of a hundred kings, was never allowed to weaken, but kindled an enthusiastic desire for the restoration of his fallen condition which stimulated his perseverance to obtain that knowledge by which alone he might be enabled to benefit him. Then a young sub, his hopes of success were more sanguine than wise, but he trusted to the rapid march of events, and the discordant elements by which he was surrounded, to effect the redemption of the prince from thraldom. It was a long dream, but after ten years of anxious hope, at length realized, and he had the gratification of being instrumental in snatching the family from destruction and subsequently of raising the country to comparative prosperity. I witnessed the commencement and the end of this drama, and have conversed with actors in all the intermediate scenes. In June 1806 the passes of Udaipur were forced. 
And in January 1808, when I passed through Jaipur in a solitary ramble, the fragments of this contest were scattered over its sandy plains. Amir Khan, ally of the Pindaris and ancestor of the present Nawabs of Tonk. A treaty between him and the British was signed on December 19, 1817, by which his state was recognized. He died in 1834. See his life by Basawan Lal, translated by Toby Princep, Malcolm, Memoirs of Central India, 2nd edition 2. 325 ff. Harem. I knew him well, a plain honest man. Alluding to the custom of infanticide, here, very rare, indeed, almost unknown. With my mind engrossed with the scenes in which I had passed the better part of my life, I went two months after my return from Rajputana, in 1823, to York Cathedral, to attend the memorable festival of that year. The sublime recitations of Handel in Jephthah's Vow, the sonorous woe of Sapio's Deeper and Deeper Still, powerfully recalled the sad exit of the Rajputni. And the representation shortly after of Racine's tragedy of Iphigenie, with Talma as Achille, Dukas Noyes as Clytemnester, and a very interesting personation of the victim daughter of Agamemnon again served to waken the remembrance of this sacrifice. The following passage, embodying not only the sentiments, but couched in the precise language in which the virgin Krishna addressed her father, proving that human nature was but one mode of expression for the same feelings, I am tempted to transcribe. Mon père. Cesses de vous troubler, vous anites point trahi. Quand vous commanderez, vous serez obey. Ma vie est votre bien. Vous voulez le reprendre. Vos ordres, sans detour, pouvant essi faire entendre. Dun oi aussi content, dun cur aussi son mis. K j acceptis elipu k vu amavis promis. J e sorai, sil le faux, victime obeisant. Tendre o fer de calcus un tet innocent. Edi respectant le coup par vu me mordon. Vu rendre tout le sang que vu aimez don. Baparavol. The Kasumba draft is made of flowers and herbs of a cooling quality, into this an opiate was introduced. The simple but powerful expression of the narrator. The tribe of the Rana. That is, without adoption even to perpetuate it. A respectful epithet to the prince, sire. By the same mother. He was nearly carried off by that awful scourge, the cholera, and, singular to remark, was the first person attacked at Udaipur. I remained by his bedside during the progress of this terrible visitation, and never shall I forget his grateful exclamation of surprise, when after a salutary sleep he opened his eyes to health. Shirji Mehta, his chief adviser and manager of his estates, merry as ever, though the heir of Muir was given over, was seized with the complaint as his master recovered, was dead and his ashes blanching on the sands of the streamlet of A.R. within twelve hours. Jovial and good-humored as he was, we could have better spared a better man. He was an adept in intrigue, of Umbaji's school, until death shall extinguish the whole of this, and better morals are born, the country will but slowly improve. Maharna Jawan Singh, 1828-38, succeeded on the death of his father, Bhim Singh, on March 31, 1828. He gave himself up to debauchery, and died without issue on August 30, 1838, being succeeded by his adopted son, Sardar Singh. Since this work has gone to press, the author has been rejoiced to find that an heir has been born from the last marriage by a princess of Rewa of the Bagila tribe. See Genealogical Descendants of Rana Jagat Singh. Appendix, No. This was written at Udaipur in 1820. This old intriguer then attempted to renew the past, as the organ of the Khandawats, but his scheme ended in exile to the sacred city of Benares. And there he may now be seen with his rosary on the consecrated god of the Ganges. Brigadier General Alexander Knox had the honor of dissolving these bands in the only way worthy of us. He marched his troops to take their guns and disperse their legions. And, when in order of battle, the gallant general taking out his watch, gave them half an hour to reflect, their commander Jamshid, second only in villainy to his master, deeming discretion the better part of valor, surrendered. There are full this number of princes holding under the British. This veteran attended me during all these troubles, 
as the medium of communication with the Rana. Though leagued with the Khandawats, he was a loyal subject and good servant. I saw him expire, and was of opinion, as well as the doctor who accompanied me, that his death was caused by poison. The general burst of sorrow from hundreds collected around his house, when the event was announced, is the best encomium on his public character. This monstrous villain, for he was a Goliath, died soon after Muir was rescued, from a cancer in his back. Sadidas, Kishandas, and Rupram. Bapu Sindhya shortly outlived his expulsion from Ujmer, and as he had to pass through Muir in his passage to his future residence, he was hooted by the population he had plundered. While I was attending the Rana's court, someone reporting Bapu Sindhya's arrival at his destination, mentioned that some pieces of ordnance formerly taken from Udaipur had, after saluting him, exuded a quantity of water, which was received with the utmost gravity by the court, until I remarked they were crying because they should never again be employed in plunder, an idea which caused a little mirth. Chapter 18 Degraded Condition of the Rajputs The History of the Ranas Family has now been traced through all the vicissitudes of its Fortunes, from the 2nd to the 19th century, whilst Contending for existence, alternately with Parthians, Bills Tartars, and Marathas Till at length it has become tributary To Britain The last chapter portrays the degraded condition Of their princes, and the utter desolation of their country, in a Picture which embodied the entire Rajput race An era of repose at length dawned upon them. The destruction of that vast predatory system, under the weight of which the prosperity of these regions had so long been repressed, was effected by one short campaign in 1817, which if less brilliant than that of 1803, is inferior to none in political results. The tardy policy of the last-named period, at length accomplished, placed the power of Britain in the East on an expugnable position, and rescued the Rajputs from a progressing destruction. Alliances with the British. To prevent the recurrence of this predatory system it was deemed politic to unite all these settled states, alike interested with ourselves in its overthrow, in one grand confederation. Accordingly, the Rajput states were 548 invited to shelter under our protecting alliance, and with one exception, Jaipur, they eagerly embraced the invitation. The ambassadors of the various governments followed each other. In quick succession to Delhi, where the treaties were to be negotiated. And in a few weeks all Rajputana was united to Britain by compacts of one uniform character. Ensuring to them external protection with internal independence, as the price of acknowledged supremacy, and a portion of revenue to the protecting government. By this comprehensive arrangement, we placed a most powerful barrier between our territories and the strong natural frontier of India. And so long as we shall respect their established usages, and by contributing to the prosperity of the people preserve our motives from distrust, it will be a barrier impenetrable to invasion. Treaty with Muir. Of all the princes who obtained succor, at this momentous crisis in the political history of India, none stood more in need of it than the Rana of Udaipur. On January 16, 1818, the treaty was signed, and in February an envoy was nominated, who immediately proceeded to the Rana's court to superintend and maintain the newly formed relations. The right wing of the Grand Army had already preceded him to Compel the surrender of such territory as was unjustly held by the lawless partisans of Scindia, and to reduce to obedience the refractory nobles, to whom anarchy was endeared from long familiarity. The strongholds in the plains as Reaper, Rajnagar, etc., soon surrendered, and the payment of the arrears of the garrison of Kumhammer put this important fortress in our possession. In his passage from Jahajpur, which guards the range on the east to Kumhamar on the Aravali west, a space of 140 miles, the limits of Muir, 
only two thinly peopled towns were seen 549 which acknowledged the Rana's authority. All was desolate. Even the traces of the footsteps of man were effaced. The Babul, Mimosa, Acacia, Arabica, and gigantic reed, which harbored the boar and the tiger, grew upon the highways, and every rising ground displayed a mass of ruin. Bilvada, the commercial entrepot of Rajputana, which ten years before contained six thousand families, showed not a vestige of existence. All was silent in her streets, no living thing was seen except a solitary dog, that fled in dismay from his lurking place in the temple, scared at the unaccustomed sight of man. Session of Kumhamer An envoy was dispatched by the Rana to congratulate the agent, who joined him in the British camp at Nathadvara, and while he returned to arrange the formalities of reception, the agent obtained the session of Kumhamer which, with the acquisitions before mentioned, paved the way for a joyful reception. The prince, Javan Singh, with all the state insignia, and a numerous cortege, advanced to receive the mission, and conduct it to the capital. A spot was fixed on in a grove of palmyras, about two miles from the city, where carpets were spread, and where the prince received the Agent and sweet in a manner at once courteous and dignified. Of him it might have been said, in the language applied by Jahangir to the son of Rana Amra, his countenance carried the impression of his illustrious extraction. Arrival of the author as agent. We entered the city by the gate of the sun. And through a vista of ruin the mission was inducted into its future residence, once the abode of the fair. Rampiyari. Like all the mansions of Rajputana, it was a quadrangular pile, with an open paved area, the suites of apartments. Carried round the sides, with latticed or open corridors. 550 extending parallel to each suite. Another deputation with the Maimani, consisting of a hundred trays of sweetmeats, dried fruits, and a purse of one thousand rupees for distribution amongst the domestics brought the Rana's welcome upon our arrival in his capital and fixed the next day for our introduction at court. At four in the afternoon, a deputation, consisting of the officiating prime minister, the representative of the Khandawats, with mace bearers and a numerous escort, came to announce the Rana's readiness to receive the mission. Which, with all the pomp and circumstance peculiar to these countries, was marshaled in front of the residency thronged by crowds of well-dressed inhabitants, silently gazing at the unusual sight. The Grand Nicaras having announced the Rana in court, the mission proceeded through streets which everywhere presented marks of rapin, hailed by the most enthusiastic greetings. Jai! Jai! Faranji Ka Raj! Victory, victory to the English government, resounded from every tongue. The bards were not idle, and the unpoetic name of the agent was hitched into rhyme. Groups of musicians were posted here and there, who gave a passing specimen of the tapas of Muir, and not a few of the fair, with brazen ewers of water on their heads, welcomed us with the suelia, or songs of joy. Into each of these vessels the purse-bearer dropped a piece of silver. For neither the songs of the suelia, the tapas of the minstrel, nor encomiastic stave of the bard, are to be received without some acknowledgement that you appreciate their merit and talents however you may doubt the value they put upon your own. As we ascended the main street leading to the Tripolia, or Triple Portal, which guards the sacred enclosure, dense masses of people obstructed our progress, and even the walls of the Temple of Jagannath were crowded. According to etiquette, we dismounted at the port, and proceeded on foot across the ample terrace, on which were drawn up a few elephants and horse, exercising for the Rana's amusement. The Palace at Udaipur the palace is a most imposing pile. 551 of a regular form, built of granite and marble, rising at least a hundred feet from the ground, and flanked with octagonal towers. Crowned with cupolas. Although built at various periods. Uniformity of design has been very well preserved, nor is there. In the east a more striking or majestic structure. It stands upon. The very crest of a ridge running parallel to, but considerably elevated above, the margin of the lake. The terrace, which is 
at the east and chief front of the palace, extends throughout its length, and is supported by a triple row of arches from the declivity of the ridge. The height of this arcaded wall is fully 50 feet. And although all is hollow beneath, yet so admirably is it constructed, that an entire range of stables is built on the extreme verge of the terrace, on which the whole personal force of the rana, elephants, horse, and foot, are often assembled. From this terrace the city and the valley lay before the spectator, whose vision is bounded only by the hills shutting out the plains, while from the summit of the palace nothing obstructs its range over lake and mountain. A band of Sindhis guarded the first entrance to the palace, and being Saturday, the Saktawats were on duty in the great hall of assembly. Through lines of Rajputs we proceeded till we came to the marble staircase, the steps of which had taken the form of the segment of an ellipse, from the constant friction of the foot. An image of Ganesha guarded the ascent to the interior of the palace, and the apartment, or landing, is called Ganesha Diori, from the Rajput Janus. After proceeding through a suite of saloons, each filled with spectators, the herald's voice announced to, the lord of the world, that the English envoy was in his presence. On which he arose, and advanced a few paces in front of the throne, the chieftain standing to receive the mission. Everything being ruled by precedent, the seat allotted for the envoy was immediately in front and touching the royal cushion, Gaddi being that assigned to the Peshwa in the height of Maratha prosperity, the arrangement, which was a subject of regular negotiation, could not be objected to. The apartment chosen for the initiatory visit was the Surya Mahal, or Hall of the Sun, so called from a medallion of the orb in Basarilyeva which decorates the wall. Close there too is placed the Rana's throne, above which, supported by slender silver columns, rises a velvet canopy. The Gaddi, or throne, in the east is but a huge 552 cushion, over which is thrown an embroidered velvet mantle. The chiefs of the higher grade, or the sixteen, were seated, according to their rank, on the right and left of the Rana, next and below these were the princes Amra and Javan Singh. And at right angles, by which the court formed three sides of a square, the chiefs of the second rank. The civil officers of the state were near the Rana in front, and the seneschal, butler, keeper of the wardrobe, and other confidential officers and inferior chieftains, formed a group standing on the extreme edge of the carpet. The Rana's congratulations were hearty and sincere, in a few powerful expressions he depicted the miseries he had experienced, the fallen condition of his state, and the gratitude he felt to the British government which had interposed between him and destruction, and which for the first moment of his existence allowed him to sleep in peace. There was an intense earnestness in every word he uttered, which, delivered with great fluency of speech and dignity of manner, inspired deep respect and sympathy. The agent said that the governor-general was no stranger to the history of his illustrious family, or to his own immediate sufferings. And that it was his earnest desire to promote, by every means in his power, the Rana's personal dignity and the prosperity of his dominions. After conversing a few minutes, the interview was closed with presents to the agent and suite, to the former a caparisoned elephant and horse, jeweled aigrette, and pearl necklace, with shawls and brocades and with the customary presentation of essence of rose and the pan leaf the rana and court rising, the envoy made his salam and retired. In a short time the rana, attended by his second son, ministers, and a select number of the chiefs, honored the envoy with a visit. The latter advanced beyond his residence to meet the prince, who was received with presented arms by the guard, the officers saluting, and conducted to his throne, which had been previously arranged. Conversation was now unrestrained and questions were demanded regarding everything which appeared unusual. After sitting half an hour, the agent presented the Rana with an elephant and two horses, caparisoned with silver and gilt ornaments and velvet embroidered housings, with twenty-one shields of shawls, brocades, muslins, and jewels. To Prince Amra, unable from sickness to attend his father, a horse and five fifty-three eleven shields, and to his brother, the second prince, Javan Singh, a horse and nine shields. To the ministers and chiefs according to rank, the whole entertainment costing about 20,000 rupees, or 2,000 pounds. Amidst these ceremonials, receiving and returning visits of the Rana, his chiefs, his ministers, and men of influence and information commercial and agricultural, 
some weeks passed in silent observation and in the acquisition of materials for action. Political divisions of Muir. For the better comprehension of the internal relations, past and present, of Muir, a sketch is presented, showing the political divisions of the tribes and the fiscal domain from which a better idea may be formed of Rajput feudal economy than from a chapter of dissertation. The princes of Muir skillfully availed themselves of their natural advantages in the partition of the country. The mountain barriers east and west were allotted to the chiefs to keep the mountaineers and foresters in subjection, whose leading passes. 554 were held by a lord marcher, and the quotas of his quarter. And while strong forts guarded the exposed northern and southern entrances, the crown land lay in the center, the safest and the richest. The exterior, thus guarded by a cordon of feudal levies, composed of the quotas of the greater fiefs, the minor and most numerous class of vassals, termed Joel, literally, the mass, and consisting of ten thousand horse, each holding directly of the crown independent of the greater chiefs, formed its best security against both external aggression and internal commotions. Desolation of Muir Such is a picture of the feudal economy of Muir in the days of her renown. But so much had it been defaced through time and accident, that with difficulty could the lineaments be traced with a view to their restoration, her institutions. A dead letter, the prince's authority despised, the nobles. Demoralized and rebellious. Internal commerce abandoned, and the peasantry destroyed by the combined operation of war. Pestilence, and exile. Expression might be racked for phrases. Which could adequately delineate the miseries all classes had. Endured. It is impossible to give more than a sketch of the state. Of the Das Sahas Muir, the ten thousand townships which. Once acknowledged her princes, and of which above three thousand. Still exist. All that remained to them was the valley of the. Capital and though Chitter and Mandelgar were maintained by the fidelity of the Rana's servants, their precarious revenues scarcely sufficed to maintain their garrisons. The Rana was mainly indebted to Zalem Singh of Kota for the means of subsistence. For in the struggle for existence his chiefs thought only of themselves, of defending their own estates, or buying off their foes while those who had succumbed took to horse, scoured the country, and plundered without distinction. Inferior clanships declared themselves independent of their superiors, who in their turn usurped the crown domain, or by bribing the necessities of their prince, obtained his patent for lands, to which, as they yielded him nothing, he became indifferent. The crown tenants purchased of these chiefs the protection, Rockwelly, which the Rana could not grant, and made alienations of the crown. Taxes, besides private rights of the community, which were often extorted at the point of the lance. Feuds multiplied, and the name of each clan became the watchword of alarm or defiance. To its neighbor, castles were assaulted, and their inmates, as 555 at Shiagar and Lawa, put to the sword. The Maras and Bills descended from their hills, or emerged from their forests, and planted ambuscades for the traveler or merchant, whom they robbed or carried to their retreats, where they languished in durance till ransomed. Marriage processions were thus intercepted, and the honeymoon was passed on a cliff of the Aravali, or in the forests on the Mahi. The Rajput, whose moral energies were blunted, scrupled not to associate and to divide the spoil. With these lawless tribes, of whom it might be said, as of the children of Ishmael, their hands were against every man. And every man's hand against them. Yet notwithstanding such entire disorganization of society, external commerce was not stagnant. And in the midst of this rapine, the produce of Europe 
and Kashmir would pass each other in transit through Muir. Loaded it is true by a multiplicity of exactions, but guarded by those who scorned all law but the point of honor, which they were paid for preserving the condition of Udaipur. The capital will serve as a specimen of the country. Udaipur, which formerly reckoned 50,000 houses within the walls, had not now 3,000 occupied. The rest were in ruin, the rafters being taken for firewood. The realization of the spring harvest of 1818, from the entire fiscal land, was about 4,000 pounds. Grain sold for seven sirs the rupee. Though thrice the quantity was procurable within the distance of 80 miles. Insurance from the capital to Nathadvara. 25 miles, was 8%. The Kotharia chief, whose ancestors are immortalized for fidelity, had not a horse to conduct him to his prince's presence, though his estates were of 50,000 rupees annual value. All were in ruins. And the Rana, the descendant of those patriot Rajputs who opposed Babur, Akbar, and Aurangzeb, in the days of Mughal splendor, had not fifty horse to attend him and was indebted for all the comforts he possessed to the liberality of Kota. Reorganization of the state. Such was the chaos from which order was to be evoked. But the elements of prosperity, though scattered, were not extinct. And recollections of the past, deeply engraved in the national mind, became available to reanimate their moral and physical existence. To call these forth demanded. Only the exertion of moral interference, and every other was. Rejected. The lawless freebooter, and even the savage Bill, felt. 556 odd at the agency of a power never seen. To him moral opinion. Compared with which the strength of armies is not, was. Inexplicable, and he substituted in its stead another invisible. Power, that of magic and the belief was current throughout the intricate region of the West that a single individual could carry an army in his pocket and that our power could animate slips of paper cut into the figures of armed men from which no precaution could guard their retreats. Accordingly, at the mere name of the British power, Rapin ceased, and the inhabitants of the wilds of the West, the forest lords, who had hitherto laughed at subjection, to the number of seven hundred villages. Put each the sign of the dagger to a treaty, promising abstinence. From plunder and a return to industrious life, a single individual. Of no rank the negotiator. Moreover, the treaty was religiously. Kept for twelve months, when the peace was broken, not by. Them, but against them. To the Rajput, the moral spectacle of a Peshwa marched into exile with all the quietude of a pilgrimage, effected more than twenty thousand bayonets. And no other auxiliary was required than the judicious use of the impressions from this and other passing events, to relay the foundations of order and prosperity, by never doubting the issue, success was ensured. The British force, therefore, after the reduction of the plans enumerated, was marched to cantonments, the rest was left for time and reason to accomplish. Form of civil government. Before proceeding further, it may be convenient to sketch the form of civil government in Muir, and the characters of its most conspicuous members. The former we shall describe as it was when the machine was in regular action. It will be found simple, and perfectly suited to its object. There are four grand officers of the government. One, the pardon, or prime minister. 2. Bakshi, commander of the forces. 3. Suratnama, keeper of the records. 4. Sahai, keeper of the signet. The first, the pardon, or civil premier, must be of the non-militant 557 tribe. The whole of the territorial and financial arrangements are vested in him. He nominates the civil governors of districts and the collectors of the revenue and custom, and has 14 thuas, or departments, under him which embrace all that relates to expenditure. 2. 
The Bakshi must also be of a non-militant tribe, and one different from the Pardon. His duties are mixed civil and military. He takes the musters, and pays mercenaries, or rations, to the feudal tenants when on extra service, and he appoints a deputy to accompany all expeditions, or to head frontier posts, with the title of fodder, or commander. The royal insignia, the standard, and kettle drums accompany him, and the highest nobles assemble under the general control of this civil officer, never under one of their own body. From the Bakshi's bureau all patents are issued, as also all letters of sequestration of feudal land. The Bakshi has four secretaries. One, draws out deeds. Two, accountant. Three, recorder of all patents or grants. Four, keeps duplicates. Three. The Suratnama is the auditor and recorder of all the household expenditure and establishments, which are paid by his checks. He has four assistants also, who make a daily report, and give a daily balance of accounts. 4. The Sahai. He is secretary both for home and foreign correspondence. He draws out the royal grants or patents of estates, and superintends the deeds of grant on copper plate to religious establishments. Since the privilege appertaining to Salumbar, of confirming all royal grants with his signet the lance, has fallen into desuetude, the Sahai executes this military autograph. To all decrees, from the daily stipend to the pata, or patent of an estate, each minister must append his seal, so that there is a complete system of check. Besides these, the higher officers of government, there are 36 karkanas, or inferior officers, 558 appointed directly by the rana, the most conspicuous of which are the justiciary, the keepers of the register office, of the mint. Of the armory, of the regalia, of the jewels, of the wardrobe, of the stables, of the kitchen, of the band, of the seneschalsy, and of the seraglio. There was no want of aspirants to office, here hereditary. But it was vain to look amongst the descendants of the virtuous Pancholi, or the severe Amrakand, and the prediction of the former, dust will cover the head of Muir when virtue wanders in rags, was strictly fulfilled. There appeared no talent, no influence, no honesty, yet the deficiency was calculated to excite sorrow rather than surprise, to stimulate exertion on their behalf, rather than damp the hope of improvement. Though all scope for action, save in the field of intrigue, was lost and talent was dormant for want of exercise. Incapacity of the Rana The Rana's character was little calculated. To supply his minister's deficiencies. Though perfectly. Versed in the past history of his country, its resources, and their management, though able, wise, and amiable, his talents were nullified by numerous weak points. Vain shows, frivolous amusements, and an ill-regulated liberality alone occupied him. And so long as he could gratify these propensities, he trusted complacently to the exertions of others for the restoration of order and his proper authority. He had little steadiness of purpose, and was particularly obnoxious to female influence. It is scarcely to be wondered that he coveted repose, and was little desirous to disturb the only moment his existence had presented of enjoying it, by inviting the turmoils of business. No man, however, was more capable of advising, his judgment was good. But he seldom followed its dictates, in short, he was an adept. In theory, and a novice in practice. The only man about the Court at once of integrity and efficiency was Kashandas, who had long acted as ambassador, and to whose assiduity the sovereign and the country owed much, but his services were soon cut off by death. Such were the materials with which the work of reform commenced. The aim was to bring back matters to a correspondence with an era of their history, when the rights of the prince, the 559 vassal, and the cultivator, were alike well defined that of Amra Singh. Relations of the Rana with his nobles. The first point to effect was the recognition of the prince's authority by his nobles, the surest sign of which was their presence at the capital, where some had never been, and others only when it suited their convenience or their views. In a few weeks the Rana saw himself surrounded by a court such as had not been known for half a century. 
it created no small curiosity to learn by what secret power they were brought into each other's presence. Even the lawless Hamra, who but a short while before had plundered the marriage dower of the Hari queen coming from Koda, and the chief of the Sangawat clan, who had sworn he might bend his head to woman, but never to his sovereign, left their castles of Baidsar and Diagar, and, placing the royal rescript on their heads, hastened to his presence. And in a few weeks the whole feudal association of Muir was embodied in the capital. Return of the Exiles To recall the exiled population was a measure simultaneous with the assembling of the nobles. But this was a work requiring time, they had formed ties, and incurred obligations to the societies which had sheltered them, which could not at once be disengaged or annulled. But wherever a subject of Muir existed, proclamations penetrated, and satisfactory assurances were obtained, and realized to an extent which belied in the strongest manner the assertion that patriotism is unknown to the natives of Hindustan. The most enthusiastic and cheering proofs were afforded that neither oppression from without, nor tyranny within, could expel the feeling for the Bapoda, the land of their fathers. Even now, though time has chastened the impressions, we should fear to pen but a tithe of the proofs of devotion of the husbandmen of Muir to the solemn. Natale, it would be deemed romance by those who never contemplated humanity in its reflux from misery and despair to the sweet influences of hope. He alone who had witnessed the day of trouble and beheld the progress of desolation, the standing corn grazed by Maratha horse, the rifled towns devoted to the flames, the cattle driven to the camp, and the chief men seized, as hostages for money never to be realized, could appreciate their deliverance. To be permitted to see these evils banished, to behold the survivors of oppression congregated from the most five sixty distant provinces, many of them strangers to each other. And the aged and the helpless awaiting the lucky day to take possession of their ruined abodes, was a sight which memory will not part with. Thus on the 3rd of Sawan, July, a favorite day with the husbandmen, three hundred of all conditions, with their wagons and implements of labor, and preceded by banners and music, marched into Kapasan. And Ganesha was once again Invoked as they reconsecrated their dwellings, and placed his portrait as the Janus of the portals. On the same day, and within eight months subsequent to the signature of the treaty, above three hundred towns and villages were simultaneously re inhabited. And the land, which for many years had been a stranger to the plowshare, was broken up. Well might the superstitious fancy that miracles were abroad for even to those who beheld the work in progression it had a magical result, to see the waste covered with habitations, and the verdant corn growing in the fields where lately they had roused the boar from his retreat. It was a day of pride for Britain. By such exertions of her power, in these distant lands her sway is hallowed. By Britain alone. Can this fair picture be defaced, the tranquility and independence? she has conferred, by her alone may be disturbed. Attraction of capital. To these important preliminary measures, the assembly of the nobles and recall of the population was added a third, without which the former would have been nugatory. There was no wealth, no capital, to aid their patriotism and industry. Foreign merchants and bankers had abandoned the devoted land, and those who belonged to it partook of her poverty and her shame. Money was scarce, and want of faith and credit had increased the usury on loans to a ruinous extent. The Rana borrowed at 36 percent, besides 25 to 40 percent discount for his barats or patents empowering collection on the land, 
a system pursued for some time even. After his restoration to authority, his profusion exceeded even the rapidity of renovation. And the husbandman had scarcely broken up his long waste fields when a call was made by the harpies of the state for an advance on their produce. While he himself had been compelled to borrow at a like ruinous rate for 561 seed and the means of support, to be paid by expectations. 2. Have hoped for the revival of prosperity amidst such destitution. Moral and pecuniary, would have been visionary. It was as necessary to improve the one as to find the other. For poverty and virtue do not long associate, and certainly not in Muir. Proclamations were therefore prepared by the Rana, inviting foreign merchants and bankers to establish connections in the chief towns throughout the country. But as in the days of demoralization little faith was placed in the words of princes. Similar ones were prepared by the agent, guaranteeing the stipulations. And both were distributed to every commercial city in India. The result was as had been foreseen, branch banks were everywhere. Formed, and mercantile agents fixed in every town in the country, whose operations were only limited by the slow growth of moral improvement. The shackles which bound external commerce were at once removed, and the multifarious posts for the collections of transit duties abolished, in lieu of which chain of stations, all levies on goods in transit were confined to the frontiers. The scale of duties was revised, and by the abolition of intermediate posts, they underwent a reduction of from 30 to 50 percent. By this system, which could not for some time be comprehended, the transit and custom duties of Muir made the most certain part of the revenue, and in a few years exceeded in amount what had ever been known. Trade at Bilvara. The chief commercial mart, Bilvara, which showed not a vestige of humanity, rapidly rose from ruin. And in a few months contained twelve hundred houses, half of which were occupied by foreign merchants. Bales of goods, the produce of the most distant lands, were piled up in the streets. Lately overgrown with grass, and a weekly fair was established. For the home manufacturers. A charter of privileges and immunities was issued, exempting them from all taxation for the first year, and graduating the scale for the future. Calculated. With the same regard to improvement, by giving the mind the full range of enjoying the reward of its exertions. The right of electing their own chief magistrates and the assessors of justice was above all things indispensable, so as to render them as independent as possible of the needy servants of the court. A. Guard was provided by the government for their protection, and a competent authority nominated to see that the full extent of 562 their privileges, and the utmost freedom of action, were religiously maintained. The entire success of this plan may at once be recorded to prevent repetition. In 1822, Bilvada contained nearly 3,000 dwellings, which were chiefly inhabited by merchants, bankers, or artisans. An entire new street had been constructed in the center of the town, from the duties levied, and the shops and houses were rented at a moderate rate. While many were given up to the proprietors of their sites, returning from exile, on their paying the price of construction. But as there is no happiness without alloy, so even this pleasing picture had its dark shades to chasten the too sanguine expectation of imparting happiness to all. Instead of a generous emulation, a jealous competition checked the prosperity of Bilvada, the base. Spirit of exclusive monopoly desired a distinction between the native and the stranger merchant, for which they had a precedent, in the latter paying an addition to the town duty of meatage. Mappa. The unreasonableness of this was discussed, and it was shown to be more consonant to justice that he who came from Jeslamar, Surat, Benares, or Delhi, should pay less than the 
merchant whose domicile was on the spot. When at length the parties acquiesced in this opinion, and were entreated and promised to know none other distinction than that of inhabitant of Bilvada, sectarian differences, which there was less hope of reconciling, became the cause of disunion. All the Hindu merchants belong either to the Vaishnava or Jain sects, consequently. Each had a representative head, and the five for the adjudication of their internal arrangements. And these, the wise men of both parties, formed the general council for the affairs of Bilvada. But they carried their religious differences to the judgment seat, where each desired preeminence. Whether the point in dispute hinged on the interpretation of law, which with all these sects is of divine origin, or whether the mammon of unrighteousness was the lurking cause of their bickerings, they assuredly did much harm. For their appeals brought into play what of all things was least desired, the intrigues of the profligate dependence of the court. It will be seen hereafter, in visits to Bilvada, how these disputes were in some degree calmed. The leaders on both sides were distinctly given to understand they would be made to leave the place. Self-interest prevented this extremity. But from the 563 withdrawing of that active interference, which the state of the alliance did not indeed warrant, but which humanity interposed for their benefit, together with the effect of appeals to the court. It is to be apprehended that Bilvada may fail to become what it was intended to be, the chief commercial mart of central India. Reform of the nobility. Of the three measures simultaneously. Projected and pursued for the restoration of prosperity, the industrious portion has been described. The feudal interest remains, which was found the most difficult to arrange. The agricultural and commercial classes required only protection and stimulus, and we could repay the benefits their industry conferred by the lowest scale of taxation, which, though in fact equally beneficial to the government was constructed as a boon. But, with the feudal lords there was no such equivalent to offer in return for the sacrifices many had to make for the re-establishment of society. Those who were well inclined, like Kotharia, had everything to gain, and nothing left to surrender. While those who, like Diagar, Salumbar, or Badnor, had preserved their power by foreign aid, intrigue, or prowess, dreaded the high price. They might be called upon to pay for the benefit of security, which the new alliance conferred. All dreaded the word restitution. And the audit of half a century's political accounts, yet the adjustment of these was the cornerstone of the edifice, which anarchy and oppression had dismantled. Feuds were to be appeased, a difficult and hazardous task and usurpations, both on the crown and each other, to be redeemed. To bring the wolf and the goat to drink from the same vessel, was a task of less difficulty than to make the Kondawat and Saktawat labor, in concert for the welfare of the prince and the country. In fine, a better idea cannot be afforded of what was deemed the hopelessness. 564 of success than the opinion of Zorawar Singh, the chief of the latter clan, who had much to relinquish, were Parmesvara. The Almighty, to descend. He could not reform Muir. We judged better of them than they did of each other. Negotiations with the chiefs. It were superfluous to detail all. The preparatory measures for the accomplishment of this grand object. The meetings and adjournments, which only served to keep alive discontent. On the 27th of April, the treaty with the British government was read, and the consequent change in their relations explained. Meanwhile, a charter, defining the respective rights of the crown and of the chiefs, with their duties to the community, was prepared, and a day named for a general assembly of the chieftains to sanction and ratify this engagement. The 
1st of May was fixed, the chiefs assembled, the articles, ten in number, were read and warmly discussed. When with unmeaning expressions of duty, and objections to the least prominent, they obtained through their speaker, Gokuldas of Diagar, permission to reassemble at his house to consider them, and broke up with the promise to attend next day. The delay, as apprehended, only generated opposition, and the second and third passed in intercommunications of individual hope and fear. It was important to put an end to speculation. At noon, on the 4th of May, the Grand Hall was again filled, when the Rana, with his sons and ministers, took their seats. Once more the articles were read, objections raised and combated, and midnight had arrived without the object of the meeting being advanced, when an adjournment proposed by Gokuldas, till the arrival of the Rana's plenipotentiary from Delhi, met with a firm denial, and the Rana gave him liberty to retire, if he refused his testimony of loyalty. The begun chief, who had much to gain, at length set the example, followed by the chiefs of Amet and Diagar, and in succession by all the sixteen nobles, who also signed as the proxies of their relatives, unable from sickness to attend. The most powerful of the second grade also signed for themselves and the absent of their clans, each, as he gave in his adhesion, retiring, and it was three in the morning of the fifth of May ere the ceremony was over. The chief of the Saktawats, determined to be conspicuous, was the last of his own class to sign. During this lengthened and painful discussion of fifteen hours' continuance, the Rana conducted himself with such judgment and firmness as to give 565 sanguine hopes of his taking the lead in the settlement of his affairs. Enforcement of the treaty. This preliminary adjusted, it was important that the stipulations of the treaty should be rigidly, if not rapidly affected. It will not be a matter of surprise, that some months passed away before the complicated arrangements arising out of this settlement were completed. But it may afford just grounds for gratulation that they were finally accomplished. Without a shot being fired, or the exhibition of a single British soldier in the country, nor, indeed, within one hundred miles of Udaipur. Opinion was the sole and all-sufficient ally affecting this political reform. The Rajputs, in fact, did not require the demonstration of our physical strength, its influence had reached far beyond Muir. When the few firelocks defeated hundreds of the foes of public tranquility, they attributed it to the strength of the company's salt, the moral agency of which was proclaimed the true basis of our power. Satcharaj was the proud epithet applied by our new allies to the British government. In the East, a title which distinguished the immortal Alfred. The upright. It will readily be imagined that a reform, which went to touch 566 the entire feudal association, could not be accomplished without harassing and painful discussions, when the object was the renunciation of lands. To which in some cases the right of inheritance could be pleaded, in others, the cognizance of successful revenge, while to many prescriptive possession could be asserted. It was the more painful, because although the shades which marked the acquisition of such lands were varied, no distinction could be made in the mode of settlement, namely, unconditional surrender. In some cases, the Rana had to revoke his own grants, wrung either from his necessities or his weakness. But in neither predicament could arguments be adduced to soften renunciation, or to meet the powerful and pathetic and often angry appeals to justice or to prejudice. Counter appeals to their loyalty, and the necessity for the re-establishment of their sovereign's just weight and influence in the social body, without which their own welfare could not be secured, were adduced. But individual views and passions were too absorbing to bend to the general interest. Weeks thus passed in interchange of visits, in soothing pride, and in flattering vanity by the revival of past recollections, which gradually familiarized the subject to the mind of the chiefs, and brought them to compliance. 
time, conciliation, and impartial justice, confirmed the victory thus obtained. And when they were made to see that no interest was overlooked, that party views were unknown, and that the system included every class of society in its beneficial operation, cordiality followed concession. Some of these sessions were alienations from the crown of half a century's duration. Individual cases of hardship were unavoidable without incurring the imputation of favoritism, and the dreaded revival of ancient feuds, to abolish which was indispensable, but required much circumspection. Castles and lands in this predicament could therefore neither be retained by the possessor nor returned to the ancient proprietor without rekindling the torch of civil war. The sole alternative was for the crown to take the object of contention, and make compensation from its own domain. It would be alike tedious and uninteresting to enter into the details of these arrangements, where one chief had to relinquish the levy of transit duties in the most important outlet of the country. Asserted to have been held during seven generations, as in the case of the chief of Diagar. Of another, the binder chief, who held forty-three towns and villages, in addition to his grant, of a met, of 567 Baidsar, of Dabla, of Lawa, and many others who held important fortresses of the crown independent of its will. And other claims, embracing every right and privilege appertaining to feudal society, suffice it, that in six months the whole arrangements were effected. The case of Arja. In the painful and protracted discussions. Attendant on these arrangements, powerful traits of national. Character were developed. The castle and domain of Arja half. A century ago belonged to the crown, but had been usurped by the Purawats, from whom it was wrested by storm about fifteen years back by the Saktawats, and a patent sanctioning possession was obtained on the payment of a fine of one thousand pounds to the Rana. Its surrender was now required from Fateh Singh, the second brother of Binder, the head of this clan, but being regarded as the victorious completion of a feud it was not easy to silence their prejudices and objections. The renunciation of the forty-three towns and villages by the chief of the clan caused not half the excitation, and every Saktawat seemed to forego his individual losses in the common sentiment expressed by their head, Arja, is the price of blood, and with its session our honor is surrendered. To preserve the point of honor, it was stipulated that it should not revert to the Purawats, but be incorporated with the Fisk, which granted an equivalent. When letters of surrender were signed by both brothers, whose conduct throughout was manly and confiding, Badnor and Amet. The Badnor and Amet chiefs, both of the superior grade of nobles, were the most formidable obstacles to the operation of the Treaty of the 4th of May. The first of these by name Jeth Singh, the victorious, chief, lion, was of the Mertia clan, the bravest of the brave race of Rator, whose ancestors had left their native abodes on the plains of Marvar, and accompanied the celebrated Mira Bai on her marriage with Rana Kumba. His descendants, amongst whom was Jaimal, of immortal memory, enjoyed honor in Muir equal to their birth and high deserts. It was the more difficult to treat with men. Like these, whose conduct had been a contrast to the general license of the times, and who had reason to feel offended. When no distinction was observed between them and those who had disgraced the name of Rajput, instead of the submission expected from the Rator, so overwhelmed was he from the magnitude. 568 of the claims, which amounted to a virtual extinction of his power, that he begged leave to resign his estates and quit the country. In prosecution of this design, he took post in the chief hall of the palace, from which no entreaties could make him move, until the Rana, to escape his importunities, and even restraint, obtained his promise to abide by the decision of the agent. The forms of the Rana's court, from time immemorial, prohibit all personal communication between the sovereign and his chiefs in matters of individual interest, by which indecorous altercation is avoided. But the ministers, whose office it was to 
obtain every information, did not make a rigid scrutiny into the title deeds of the various estates previous to advancing the claims of the crown. This brave man had enemies, and he was too proud to have recourse to the common arts either of adulation or bribery to aid his cause. It was a satisfaction to find that the two principal towns demanded of him were embodied in a grant of Sangram Singh's reign and the absolute rights of the fisc, of which he had become possessed, were cut down to about 15,000 rupees of annual revenue. But there were other points on which he was even more tenacious than the surrender of these. Being the chief noble of the fine district of Badnor, which consisted of 360 towns and villages, chiefly of feudal allotments, many of them of his own clan. He had taken advantage of the times to establish his influence over them, to assume the right of wardship of minors, and secure those services which were due to the prince, but which he wanted the power to enforce. The holders of these estates were of the third class of vassals or GOL, the mass, whose services it was important to reclaim, and who constituted in past times the most efficient force of the Ranas and were the preponderating balance of their authority when mercenaries were unknown in these patriarchal states. Abundant means towards a just investigation had been previously procured. And after some discussion, in which all admissible claims were recognized, and argument was silenced by incontrovertible facts, this chieftain relinquished all that was demanded, and sent in, as from himself his written renunciation to his sovereign. However convincing the data by which his proper rights and those of his prince were defined, it was to feeling 569 and prejudice that we were mainly indebted for so satisfactory an adjustment. An appeal to the name of Jaimal, who fell defending Chitter against Akbar, and the contrast of his ancestors. Loyalty and devotion with his own contumacy acted as a talisman, and wrung tears from his eyes and the deed from his hand. It will afford some idea of the difficulties encountered, as well as the invidiousness of the task of arbitrating such matters, to give his own comment verbatim, I remained faithful when his own kin deserted him, and was one of four chiefs who alone of all Muir fought for him in the rebellion. But the son of Jaimal is forgotten, while the plunderer is his boon companion, and, though of inferior rank, receives an estate which elevates him. Above me, alluding to the chief of Baidsar, who plundered the queen's dower. But while the brave descendant of Jaimal returned to Badnor with the marks of his sovereign's favor, and the applause of those he esteemed, the runner went back to Baidsar in disgrace to which his prince's injudicious favor further contributed. Hamra of Baidsar Hamra of Baidsar was of the second class of nobles, a Khandawat by birth. He succeeded to his father Sardar Singh, the assassin of the prime minister even in the palace of his sovereign, into whose presence he had the audacity to pursue the surviving brother, destined to avenge him. Hamra inherited all the turbulence and disaffection, with the estates, of his father. And this most conspicuous of the many lawless chieftains of the times was known throughout Rajasthan. As Hamra, the runner, Doreit. Though not entitled to hold 570 lands beyond 30,000 annually, he had become possessed. To the amount of 80,000, chiefly of the Fisk or Kalisa and nearly all obtained by violence, though since confirmed by the prince's patent. With the chieftain of Lawa, precisely in the same predicament, who held the fortress of Kuroda and other valuable lands, Hammer resided entirely at the palace, and obtaining the Rana's ear by professions of obedience, kept possession. While chiefs in every respect his superiors had been compelled to surrender. 
and when at length the Saktawat of Lawa was forbid. The court until Kuroda and all his usurpations were yielded up. The son of Sardar displayed his usual turbulence, curled his mustache at the minister, and hinted at the fate of his predecessor. Although none dared to imitate him, his stubbornness was not without admirers, especially among his own clan. And, as it was too evident that fear or favor swayed the Rana, it was a case for the agent's interference, the opportunity for which was soon afforded. When forced to give letters of surrender, the Rana's functionaries, who went to take possession, were insulted, refused admittance, and compelled to return. Not a moment could be lost in punishing this contempt of authority. And as the Rana was holding a court when the report arrived, the agent requested an audience. He found the Rana and his chiefs assembled in the balcony of the sun, and amongst them the notorious Hamra. After the usual compliments, the agent asked the minister if his master had been put in possession of Siana. It was evident from the general constraint that all were acquainted with the result of the deputation. But to remove responsibility from the minister, the agent, addressing the Rana as if he were in ignorance of the insult, related the transaction and observed that his government would hold him culpable if he remained at Udaipur while His Highness's commands were disregarded. Thus supported, the Rana resumed his dignity and enforceable language, signified to all present his anxious desire to do nothing which was harsh or ungracious, but that, thus compelled, he would not recede from what became him as their sovereign. Calling for a Baira, he looked sternly at Hamra and commanded him to quit his presence instantly, and the capital in an hour, and, but for the agent's interposition, he would have been banished the country. Confiscation of his whole estate was commanded, until renunciation was completed. He departed that night. And 571 Contrary to expectation, not only were all the usurpations surrendered, but, what was scarcely contemplated by the agent, the Rana's flag of sequestration was quietly admitted into the fortress of Baidsar. The case of Umli. One more anecdote may suffice. The lands and fortress of Umli had been in the family of Amet since the year 27, only five years posterior to the date to which these arrangements extended, their possession verged on half a century. The lords of Amet were of the sixteen, and were chiefs of the clan. Jagawat. The present representative enjoyed a fair character. He could, with the chief of Badnor, claim the succession of the loyal. For Partop and Jaimal, their respective ancestors, were rivals and martyrs on that memorable day when the genius of Chitter abandoned the Sisodias. But the heir of Amet had not this alone to support his claims. For his predecessor Partop, had lost his life in defending his country against the Marathas. And Umli had been his acquisition. Fateh Singh, such was his name, was put forward by the more artful of his immediate kin. The Khandawat interest. But his disposition, blunt and impetuous, was little calculated to promote their views, he was an honest. Rajput, who neither could nor cared to conceal his anger, and at a ceremonious visit paid him by the agent. He had hardly sufficient control over himself to be courteous, and though he said nothing, his eyes, inflamed with opium and disdain, spoke his feelings. He maintained a dogged indifference, and was inaccessible to argument, till at length, following the example of Badnor, he was induced to abide by the agent's mediation. He came attended by his vassals, who anxiously awaited the result, which an unpremeditated incident facilitated. After a long and fruitless expostulation, he had taken refuge in an obstinate silence. And, seated in a chair opposite to the envoy, with his shield in front, 
placed perpendicularly on his knees, and his arms and head. 572 reclined thereon, he continued vacantly looking on the ground. To interrupt this uncourteous silence in his own house, the envoy took a picture, which with several others was at hand, and placing it before him, remarked. That chief did not gain his reputation. For Swamidharma, loyalty, by conduct such as yours. His eyes suddenly recovered their animation and his countenance was lighted with a smile, as he rapidly uttered, How did you come by this, why does this interest you? A tear started in his eye as he added, This is my father. Yes, said the agent, it is the loyal Partop on the day he went forth to meet his death, but his name yet lives, and a stranger does homage to his fame. Take Umli, take Umli, he hurriedly repeated, with a suppressed tone of exultation and sorrow, but forget not the extent of the sacrifice. To prolong the visit would have been painful to both, but as it might have been trusting too much to humanity to delay the resumption, the agent availed himself of the moment to indict the churchithity of surrender for the lands. With these instances, characteristic of individuals in the times, this sketch of the introductory measures for improving the condition of Muir may be closed. To enter more largely in detail is foreign to the purpose of the work. Nor is it requisite for the comprehension of the unity of the object, that a more minute dissection of the parts should be afforded. Before, however, we exhibit the general results of these arrangements, we shall revert to the condition of the more humble, but a most important part of the community, the peasantry of Muir. And embody, in a few remarks, the fruits of observation or inquiry, as to their past and present state, their rights, the establishment of them, their infringement, and restitution. On this subject much has been necessarily introduced in the sketch of the feudal system, where landed tenures were discussed. But it is one on which such a contrariety of opinion exists, that it may be desirable to show the exact state of landed tenures in a country, where Hindu manners should exist in greater purity than in any other part of the vast continent of India. Facsimile of Native Drawing of Partab Singh and Raymal. To face page 572. The Landed System. The riot, cultivator, is the proprietor of the soil and muir. He compares his right therein to the Akshay. 573 Duba, which no vicissitudes can destroy. He calls the land his. Bapoda, the most emphatic, the most ancient, the most cherished. And the most significant phrase his language commands for. Patrimonial inheritance. He has nature and Manu in support. Of his claim, and can quote the text, alike compulsory on prince. And peasant, cultivated land is the property of him who cut away the wood, or who cleared and tilled it. An ordinance. Binding on the whole Hindu race, and which no international wars, or conquest, could overturn. In accordance with this principle is the ancient adage, not of Muir only but all Rajputana. Bhag are Dani Raj Ho, Bum are Dani Macho, the Government is owner of the rent, but I am the master of the land. With the toleration and benevolence of the race the conqueror is commanded to respect the deities adored by the conquered, also their virtuous priests, and to establish the laws of the conquered nation as declared in their books. If it were deemed desirable to recede to the system of pure Hindu agrarian law, there is no deficiency of materials. The customary laws contained in the various reports of able men, superadded to the general ordinances of Manu, would form a code at once simple and efficient, for though innovation from foreign conquest has placed many principles in abeyance and modified others, yet he has observed to little purpose who does not trace a uniformity of design, which at one time had ramified wherever the 574 name of Hindu prevailed, language has been modified, and terms have been corrupted or changed. But the primary pervading principle is yet perceptible. And whether we examine the systems 
of Kandesh, the Karnatic, or Rajasthan, we shall discover the elements to be the same. If we consider the system from the period described by Arian, Curtius, and Diodorus, we shall see in the government of townships each commune an imperium and imperio. A little republic, maintaining its municipal legislation independent of the monarchy, on which it relies for general support, and to which it pays the bog, or tax in kind, as the price of this protection. For though the prescribed duties of kings are as well defined by Manu as by any jurisconsult in Europe, nothing can be more lax than the mutual relations of the governed and governing in Hindu monarchies, which are resolved into unbounded liberty of action. To the artificial regulation of society, which leaves all who depend on manual exertion to an immutable degradation, must be ascribed these multitudinous governments, unknown to the rest of mankind, which, in spite of such dislocation, maintain the bonds of mutual sympathies. Strictly speaking, every state presents the picture of so many hundred or thousand minute republics, without any connection with each other, giving allegiance, and, and rent, bog, to a prince, who neither legislates for them, nor even forms a police for their internal protection. It is consequent on this want of paramount interference that, in matters of police, of justice, and of law, the communes act for themselves. And from this want of paternal interference only have arisen those courts of equity, or arbitration, the panchayats. But to return to the freehold riot of Muir, whose Bapoda is the Watan and the Miris of the peninsula, words of foreign growth, introduced by the Mohammedan conquerors, the first, Persian, is of more general use in Kandesh. The other, Arabic, 575 inches the Carnatic. Thus the great Persian moralist Sadi exemplifies its application, if you desire to succeed to your father's inheritance, Miris, first obtain his wisdom. While the term Bapoda thus implies the inheritance or patrimony, its holder, if a military vassal, is called Bumia, a term equally powerful, meaning one actually identified with the soil, bum and for which the Mohammedan has no equivalent but in the possessive compound Watandar, or Marastar. The Kaniachi of Malabar is the Bumia of Rajasthan. The emperors of Delhi, in the zenith of their power, bestowed the epithet Zamindar upon the Hindu tributary sovereigns, not out of disrespect, but in the true application of their own term Bumia Raj, expressive of their tenacity to the soil. And this fact affords additional evidence of the proprietary right being in the cultivator, riot, namely, that he alone can confer the freehold land, which gives the title of Bumia, and of which both past history and present usage will furnish us with examples. When the tenure of land obtained from the cultivator is held more valid than the grant of the sovereign, it will be deemed a conclusive argument of the proprietary right being vested in the riot. What should induce a chieftain, when inducted into a perpetual fief, to establish through the riot a right to a few acres in bum? But the knowledge that although the vicissitudes of fortune or of favor may deprive him of his aggregate seigneurial rights, his claims, derived from the spontaneous favor of the commune, can never be set aside. And when he ceases to be the lord, he becomes a member of the commonwealth, merging his title of Thakur, or seigneur, into the more humble one of Bumia, the allodial tenant of the Rajput feudal system, elsewhere discussed. Thus we have touched on the method by which he acquires this distinction, for protecting the community from violence. And if left destitute by the negligence or inability of the government, he is vested with the rights of the crown, in its share of the bog or rent. But when their own land is in the predicament called Galita, or reversions from lapses to the commune, he is seized in 576 all the rights of the former proprietor, or, by internal arrangements, they can convey such right by cession of the commune. The Bumia. The privilege attached to the bum, and acquired from the community by the protection afforded to it, is the most powerful argument for the recognition of its original rights. The Bumia, thus vested, may at pleasure drive his own plow, the right to the soil. His bum is exempt from the jerib, measuring rod. It is never assessed, and his only sign of allegiance is a quit rent, in most cases triennial, and the tax of Carlicker, a war imposition, now commuted for money. The state, however, indirectly receives the services of these allodial tenants, the yeomen of Rajasthan, who constitute, as in the districts of Kumhomer and Mandalgar, the landwer, or local 
militia. In fact, since the days of universal repose set in, and the townships required no protection, an arrangement was made. With the Bumias of Muir, in which the crown, foregoing its claim of quit rent, has obtained their services in the garrisons and frontier stations of police at a very slight pecuniary sacrifice. Such are the rights and privileges derived from the riot cultivator alone. The Rana may dispossess the chiefs of Badnor, or Salumbar, of their estates, the grant of the crown, he could not touch the rights emanating from the community. And thus the descendants of a chieftain, who a few years before might have followed his sovereign at the head of one hundred cavaliers, would descend into the humble foot militia of a district. Thousands are in this predicament, the Kanawats, Lunawats, Kumhawats, and other clans, who, like the Celt, forget not their claims of birth and the distinctions of fortune, but assert their propinquity as brothers in the nineteenth or thirtieth degree to the prince on the throne. So sacred was the tenure derived from the riot, that even monarchs held lands in bum from their subjects, for an instance of which we are indebted to the great poetic historian of the last Hindu king. Chan relates, that when his sovereign, the Chauhan, had subjugated the kingdom of Anhawara from the Solunki, he returned to the nephew of the 577 conquered prince several districts and seaports, and all the bum held by the family. In short, the Rajput vaunts his aristocratic distinction derived from the land, and opposes the title of Bhumiya Raj, or government of the soil, to the Bhaniya Raj, or commercial government, which he affixes as an epithet of contempt to Jaipur where wealth accumulates and men decay. In the great Register of Patents, Patabahi, of Muir we find a species of bum held by the greater vassals on particular crown lands. Whether this originated from inability of seating entire townships to complete the estate to the rank of the incumbent, or whether it was merely in confirmation of the grant of the commune, could not be ascertained. The benefit from this bum is only pecuniary, and the title is, Bum Rockwelly or Land, in return for, preservation. Strange to say, the crown itself holds, bum rockwelly, on its own fiscal domains consisting of small portions in each village, to the amount of 10,000 rupees in a district of 30 or 40 townships. This species, however, is so incongruous that we can only state it does exist, we should vainly seek the cause for such apparent absurdity, for since society has been unhinged, the oracles are mute to much of antiquated custom. Occupiers' rights in the land. We shall close these remarks. With some illustrative traditions and yet existing customs, too. Substantiate the riots right in the soil of Muir. After one of those convulsions described in the annals, the prince had gone to espouse the daughter of the Raja of Mandar, the, then, capital of Marvar. It is customary at the moment of Hathlava, or the junction of hands, that any request preferred by the bridegroom to the father of the bride should meet compliance, a usage which has yielded many fatal results. And the Rana had been prompted on this occasion to demand a body of ten thousand jot cultivators to repeople the deserted fisk of Muir. An assent was given to the unprecedented demand, but when the inhabitants were thus despotically called on to migrate, they denied the power and refused. Shall we, said they, abandon the lands of our inheritance, Bapoda, the property of our children, to accompany a stranger into a foreign land, there to labor for him? Kill us. You may, but never shall we relinquish our inalienable rights. The Mander prince, who had trusted to this reply, deemed himself. 578 exonerated from his promise and secured from the loss of so many subjects, but he was deceived. The Rana held out to them the enjoyment of the proprietary rights as cheat to the crown in his country, with the lands left without occupants by the sword, and to all, increase of property. When equal and absolute power was thus conferred, they no longer hesitated to exchange the arid soil of Marvar for the garden of Rijwara, and the descendants of these jots still occupy the flats watered by the Barak and Banis. In those districts which afforded protection from innovation, the proprietary right of the riot will be found in full force. 
Of this the populous and extensive district of Jahajpur, consisting of 106 townships, affords a good specimen. There are but two pieces of land throughout the whole of this tract the property of the crown, and these were obtained by force during the occupancy of Zalem Singh of Kota. The right thus unjustly acquired was, from the conscientiousness of the Rana's civil governor, on the point of being annulled by sale and reversion, when the court interfered to maintain its proprietary right to the tanks of Loaria and Itonda. And the lands which they irrigate, now the bum of the Rana. This will serve as an illustration how bum may be acquired, and the annals of Kota will exhibit, unhappily for the riots of that country, the almost total annihilation of their rights. By the same summary process which originally attached Loaria to the fisc. The power of alienation being thus proved, it would be superfluous to insist further on the proprietary right of the cultivator of the soil. Proprietary rights in land. Besides the ability to alienate as. Demonstrated, all the overt symbols which mark the proprietary. Right in other countries are to be found in Muir, that of entire. Conveyance by sale, or temporary by mortgage. And numerous. Instances could be adduced, especially of the latter. The fertile. Lands of Horla, along the banks of the Curry, are almost all. Mortgaged, and the registers of these transactions form two. 579 considerable volumes. In which great variety of deeds may be. Discovered, one extended for 101 years. When redemption was to follow, without regard to interest on the. One hand, or the benefits from the land on the other, but merely by repayment of the sum borrowed to maintain the interest. During abeyance, it is generally stipulated that a certain portion of the harvest shall be reserved for the mortgagee, a fourth, a fifth, or gugri, a share so small as to be valued only as a mark of proprietary recognition. The mortgagees were chiefly of the Commercial classes of the large frontier towns. In many cases the proprietor continues to cultivate for another the lands. His ancestor mortgaged four or five generations ago, nor does he deem his right at all impaired. A plan had been sketched to raise money to redeem these mortgages, from whose complex operation the revenue was sure to suffer. No length of time or Absence can affect the claim to the Bapoda, and so sacred is the right of absentees. That land will lay sterile and unproductive. From the penalty which Manu denounces on all who interfere with their neighbor's rights, for unless there be an especial agreement between the owner of the land and the seed, the fruits belong clearly to the landowner. Even if seed conveyed by Water or by wind should germinate, the plant belongs to the landowner. The mere sower takes not the fruit. Even crime and the extreme sentence of the law will not alter succession to property, either to the military or cultivating vassal. And the old Kentish adage, probably introduced by the Jots from Scandinavia, who under Hengist established that kingdom of the Heptarchy. Namely, the father to the bow, and the son to the plow. 580 is practically understood by the Jots and Bumias of Muir, whose treason is not deemed hereditary, nor a chain of noble acts destroyed because a false link was thrown out. We speak of the military vassals, the cultivator cannot aspire to so dignified a crime as treason. Village officials, the Patel. The officers of the townships are the same as have been so often described and are already too familiar to those interested in the subject to require illustration. From the Patel, the Cromwell of each township, to the village. Gossip, the ascetic sannyasi, each deems his office, and the land. He holds in virtue thereof in perpetuity, free of rent to the state. Except a small triennial quit rent. And the liability, like every other branch of the state, to two war taxes. Opinions are various as to the origin and attributes of the Patel, the most important personage in village sway, whose office is by many deemed foreign to the pure Hindu system, and to which language even his title is deemed alien. 
But there is no doubt that both office and title are of ancient growth, and even etymological rule proves the Patel to be head, patty, of the community. The office of Patel of Muir was originally elective, he was, primus inter pares, the constituted attorney or representative of the commune, and as the medium between the cultivator and the government, enjoyed benefits from both. Besides his bapoda, and the serrano, or one fortieth of all produce from the riot, he had a remission of a third or fourth of the rent from such extra lands as he might cultivate in addition to his patrimony. Such was the Patel, the link connecting the peasant with the government, air predatory war subverted all order, 581 but as rapine increased, so did his authority. He became the plenipotentiary of the community, the security for the contribution imposed, and often the hostage for its payment, remaining in the camp of the predatory hordes till they were paid off. He gladly undertook the liquidation of such contributions as these perpetual invaders imposed. To indemnify himself, a schedule was formed of the share of each riot, and mortgage of land, and sequestration of personal effects followed till his avarice was satisfied. Who dared complain against a Patel, the intimate of Paton and Maratha commanders, his adopted patrons? He thus became the master of his fellow citizens, and, as power corrupts all men, their tyrant instead of their mediator. It was a system necessarily involving its own decay, for a while glutted with plenty, but failing with the supply, and ending in desolation, exile, and death. Nothing was left to prey on but the despoiled carcass. Yet when peace returned, and in its train the exile riot to reclaim the Bapoda, the vampire Patel was resuscitated, and evinced the same ardor for supremacy. And the same cupidity which had so materially aided to convert the fertile muir to a desert. The Patel accordingly proved one of the chief obstacles to returning prosperity. And the attempt to reduce this corrupted middleman to his original station in society was both difficult and hazardous, from the support they met in the corrupt officers at court, and other influences, behind the curtain. A system of renting the crown lands deemed the most expedient to advance prosperity, it was incumbent to find a remedy for this evil. The mere name of some of these petty tyrants inspired such terror as to check all desire of return to the country. But the origin of the institution of the office and its abuses being ascertained, it was imperative, though difficult, to restore the one and banish the other. The original elective right in many townships was therefore returned to the riot, who nominated new Patels, his choice being confirmed by the Rana, in whose presence investiture was performed by binding a turban on the elected for which he presented his Nazar. Traces of the sale of these offices in past times were observable, and it was deemed of primary importance to avoid all such channels for corruption, in order that the riot's election should meet with no obstacle. That the plan was beneficial there could be no doubt. That the benefit would be permanent, depended, unfortunately, on circumstances 582 which those most anxious had not the means to control, for it must be recollected that although personal aid and advice might be given when asked. All internal interference was by treaty strictly, and most justly, prohibited. After a few remarks on the mode of levying the crown rents, we shall conclude the subject of village economy in Muir, and proceed to close this too extended chapter with the results of four years of peace and the consequent improved prosperity. Modes of collecting rents. There are two methods of levying. The revenues of the crown on every description of corn, can cut. And bataille, for on sugar cane, poppy, oil, hemp, tobacco, cotton, indigo, and garden stuffs, a money payment is fixed. Varying. From two to six rupees per baiga. The can cut is a conjectural. Assessment of the standing crop, by the united judgment of the officers of government, the Patel, the Putvari, or Registrar, and the owner of the field. The accuracy with which an accustomed I will determine the quantity of grain on a given surface is surprising, but should the owner deem the estimate overrated, he can insist on bataille, or division of the corn after it is threshed. The most ancient and only infallible mode by which the dues either of the government or the husbandman can be ascertained. In the Bataille system the share of the government varies from one-third to two-fifths of the spring harvest, as wheat and barley, and sometimes even half, which is the invariable proportion of the autumnal crops. In either case, 
can cut or bataille when the shares are appropriated, those of the crown may be commuted to a money payment at the average rate of the market. The cut is the most liable to corruption. The riot bribes the collector who will underrate the crop. And when he betrays his duty, the shana, or watchman, is not likely to be honest, and as the makai, or Indian corn, the grand autumnal crop of muir, is eaten green, the crown may be defrauded of half its dues. The system is one of uncertainty, from which eventually the riot derives no advantage, though it fosters the cupidity of patels and collectors. But there was a bearer, or tax, introduced to make up for this deficiency, which was in proportion to the quantity cultivated, and its amount at the mercy of the officers. Thus the riot went to work with a millstone round his neck. Instead of the exhilarating reflection that every hour's additional 583 labor was his own, he saw merely the advantage of these harpies, and contented himself with raising a scanty subsistence in a slovenly and indolent manner by which he forfeited the ancient reputation of the jot cultivator of Muir. Improvement in the condition of the people. Notwithstanding these and various other drawbacks to the prosperity of the country. In an impoverished court, avaricious and corrupt officers, discontented. Patels, and bad seasons. Yet the final report in May. 1822 could not but be gratifying when contrasted with that of February 1818. In order to ascertain the progressive improvement, a census had been made at the end of 1821, of the three central fiscal districts watered by the Barak and Banis. As a specimen of the whole, we may take the Tukpa or subdivision of Sahara. Of its 27 villages, six were inhabited in 1818. The number of families being 369, three fourths, of whom belonged to the resumed town of Umli. In 1821, 926 families were reported, and every village of the 27 was occupied, so that population had almost trebled. The number of plows was more than trebled, and cultivation quadrupled. And though this, from the causes described, was not above one third of what real industry might have affected, the contrast was abundantly cheering. The same ratio of prosperity applied to the entire crown domain of Muir. By the recovery of Kumhomer, Reaper, Rajnagar, and Sudrikanara. From the Marathas, of Jahajpur from Kota, of the usurpations of the nobles. Together with the resumption of all the estates of the females of his family, a task at once difficult and delicate. And by the subjugation of the mountain districts of Marwara, a thousand towns and villages were united to form the fiscal domain of the Rana, composing twenty-four districts of various magnitudes, divided, as in ancient times. And with the primitive appellations, into portions tantamount to the 584 tithings and hundreds of England, the division from time immemorial. Amongst the Hindus. From these and the commercial. Duties or revenue was derived sufficient for the comforts, and even. The dignities of the prince and his court. And promising an annual. Increase in the ratio of good government, but profusion scattered. All that industry and ingenuity could collect. The artificial wants of the prince perpetuated the real necessities of the peasant, and this, it is to be feared, will continue till the present generation shall sleep with their forefathers. Abstract of the Fiscal Revenues of Muir in the Years 1818-19-20-21-22 Spring Harvest of R.S. 40,000 451,281 659,100. 1,018,478. 936,640. The active superintendence of the British agent being almost entirely withdrawn. 
abstract of commercial duties included in the above. In 1818. Nominal. R.S. 96,683. 165,108. 220,000. 217,000. Farmed for three years, from 1822, for 750,000 rupees, which was assigned by the Rana for the liquidation of tribute fallen in arrear. Mines and minerals. There are sources of wealth in Muir. Yet untouched, and to which her princes owe much of their power. The tin mines of Jawara and Dariba alone, little more than half a century ago, yielded above three locks annually. 585 besides rich copper mines in various parts. From such, beyond. A doubt, much of the wealth of Muir was extracted, but the miners are now dead, and the mines filled with water. An attempt was made to work them, but it was so unprofitable that the design was soon abandoned. Nothing will better exemplify the progress of prosperity than the comparative population of some of the chief towns before, and after, for years of peace. No of houses in 1818. No of houses in 1822. Udaipur. 3,500. 10,000. Bilvada. Not one. 2,700. Per. 1,200. Mundal. Gosunda. 350. The feudal lands. The feudal lands, which were then double. The fiscal, did not exhibit the like improvement, the merchant. And cultivator residing thereon not having the same certainty. Of reaping the fruits of their industry. Still great amelioration. Took place, and few were so blind as not to see their account in. It. The earnestness with which many requested the agent to back their expressed intentions with his guarantee to their communities of the same measure of justice and protection as the fiscal tenants enjoyed was proof that they well understood the benefits of reciprocal confidence. But this could not be tendered without danger. Before the agent left the country he greatly withdrew from active interference, it being his constant, as it was his last impressive lesson, that they should rely upon themselves. If they desired to retain a shadow of independence. 2. Give an idea of the improved police, insurance which has been described as amounting to 8% in a space of 25. Miles became almost nominal, or one-fourth of a rupee percent. From one frontier to the other. It would, however, have been quite utopian to have expected that the lawless tribes would remain in that stupid subordination which the unexampled state. 586 of society imposed for a time, as described in the opening of these transactions. When they found that real restraints did not follow. Imaginary terrors. Had the wild tribes been under the sole influence of British power, nothing would have been so simple as Effectually, not only to control, but to conciliate and improve them. For it is a mortifying truth, that the more remote from civilization, the more tractable and easy was the object to manage. More especially the bill. But these children of nature were incorporated in the domains of the feudal chiefs, who when they found our system did not extend to perpetual control, returned to their old habits of oppression this provoked retaliation. Which to subdue requires more power than the Rana yet possesses, and in the anomalous state of our alliances, will always be an embarrassing task to whosoever may exercise political control. In conclusion, it is to be hoped that the years of oppression that have swept the land will be held in remembrance by the protecting power, and that neither petulance nor indolence will lessen the benevolence which restored life to Muir or mar the picture of comparative happiness it created. 587 The sixteen chief nobles of Muir, their titles, names, clans, tribes, estates. Number of villages in each, and their value. Titles. Names. Clan. Tribe. 
Estate. Number of villages. Value, A.D. 1760. Remarks. Raj. Chandan Singh. Jala. Jala. Sudri. 100,000. These estates are all diminished one half in nominal amount, and their revenues still more. Rao. Pertop Singh. Chauhan. Chauhan. Bidia. 100,000. Rao. Mokam Singh. Chauhan. Chauhan. Kotharia. 80,000. Rawat. Padma Singh. Kondawat. Sisodia. Salumbar. 84,000. Would realize this if cultivated. Thakur. Zorawar Singh. Rator. Mertia. Ganero. 100,000. This chief ceases to be one of the sixteen since the Rana lost the province of Godwar. Rao. Kashodas. Pramar. Bijolia. 45,000. Would realize this if cultivated. Rawat. Gokuldas. Sangawat. Sisodia. Diagar. 80,000. Would realize more if cultivated. Rawat. Maha Singh. Megawat. Sisodia. Begun. 200,000. This includes usurpations, now seized by Sindhya. The estate would realize 70,000 if cultivated. Raj. Kalyan Singh. Jala. Jala. Delwara. 100,000. Would realize two thirds if cultivated. Rawat. Salim Singh. Jagawat. Jagawat. Amet. 60,000. Do, do. Raj. Chattersal. Jala. Jala. Gogunda. 50,000. Would realize this if cultivated. Rawat. Fateh Singh. Sarangavat. Sisodia. Kaner. 95,000. Would realize half if cultivated. Maharaja. Zorawar Singh. Saktawat. Sisodia. Binder. 64,000. Would realize this if cultivated. Thakur. Jeth Singh. Mertia. Rator. Bad Noor. 80,000. Do, do. Rawat. Salim Singh. Saktawat. Sisodia. Bansi. 40,000. These chiefs have lost all influence and half their their estates. Rao. Surajmal Singh. Chauhan. Chauhan. Parsoli. 40,000. Rawat. Kesri Singh. Kishanawat. Sisodia. Bainsrur. 60,000. These chiefs have taken rank on the depression of the above, they never appear at court on the same day. Rawat. Jawan Singh. Kishanawat. Sisodia. Kurabar. 35,000. Note. The inferior grades possessed estates to a still larger amount, conjointly yielding a revenue of 30 lakhs of rupees. And as each thousand rupees of estate furnished on emergency three horses completely equipped, the feudal interest could supply 9,000 horse besides foot, of which they make little account. Accounts of the present condition of these nobles will be found in Erskine II. A. Under the headings of their estates. See Appendix, No, for Treaty with the Rana. Commanded by Major General Sir R. Duncan, KCB. The author had the honor to be selected by the Marquess of Hastings to represent him at the Rana's court, with the title of a political agent to the Western Rajput states. During the campaign of 1817-18 he was placed as the point of communication to the various divisions of the Northern Army. At the same time being entrusted with the negotiations with Holkar, previous to the rupture, and with those of Kota and Bundy. 
He concluded the treaty with the latter state en route to Udaipur, where, as at the latter, there were only the benefits of moral and political existence to confer. The author had passed through Bilvada in May 1806, when it was comparatively flourishing. On this occasion, February 1818, it was entirely deserted. It excited a smile, in the midst of regrets, to observe the practical wit of some of the soldiers, who had supplied the naked representative of Adenov with an apron, not of leaves, but scarlet cloth. The agent had seen him when a boy, at a meeting already described, but he could scarcely have hoped to find in one, to the formation of whose character the times had been so unfavorable, such a specimen as this descendant of Partop. A description of the city and valley will be more appropriate elsewhere. CP. The escort consisted of two companies of foot, each of one hundred men, with half a troop of cavalry. The gentlemen attached to the mission were Captain Waugh, who was secretary and commandant of the escort, with Lieutenant Carey as his subaltern. Dr. Duncan was the medical officer. Modes and music. The buckler is the tray in which gifts are presented by the Rajputs. If we dare compare the moral economy of an entire people to the physical economy of the individual, we should liken this period in the history of Muir to intermittent pulsation of the heart, a pause in moral as in physical existence. A consciousness thereof, inertly awaiting the propelling power to restore healthful action to a state of languid repose. Or what the Rajput would better comprehend, his own condition when the opiate stimulant begins to dissipate, and mind and body are alike abandoned to helpless imbecility. Who has lived out of the circle of mere vegetation, and not experienced this temporary deprivation of moral vitality? For no other simile would suit the painful pause in the sympathies of the inhabitants of this once fertile region, where experience could point out but one page in their annals, one period in their history. When the clangor of the war trumpet was suspended, or the sword shut up in its scabbard. The portals of Janus at Rome were closed but twice in a period of seven hundred years. And in exactly the same time from the conquest by Shahabadidin to the great pacification, but twice can we record peace in Muir, the reign of Numa has its type in Shah Jahan, while the more appropriate reign of Augustus belongs to Britain. Are we to wonder then that a chilling void now occupied, if the solecism is admissible, the place of interminable action? When the mind was released from the anxiety of daily, hourly, devising schemes of preservation, to one of perfect security, that enervating calm, in which, to use their own homely phrase, bear or bakri eki thalias e pi. The wolf and the goat drank from the same vessel. Another, and more usual form is, ajkal, sure bakri ek got pani pite hain, nowadays the tiger and the goat drink from the same stream. But this unruffled torpidity had its limit, the agrarian laws of Muir were but mentioned, and the national pulse instantly rose. Or rather, who makes the monogrammatic signet sahi, correct, to all deeds, grants, etc. Properly Surat Navis, Statement Writer. The Salumbar chief had his deputy, who resided at court for this sole duty, for which he held a village. C.P. Miao, Dafter, Taksala, Sila, Guddi, Ghana, Kaprabandar, Gora, Rasora, Nakarkena, Jalab, Raala. Sawan Sudi Tij, third of the bright half of the month Sawan, July to August, a festival celebrated throughout North India. About 45 miles north of Udaipur city. In the personal narrative. Although Bilvada has not attained that high prosperity my enthusiasm anticipated, yet the philanthropic Heber records that in 1825, three years after I had left the country, it exhibited a greater appearance of trade, industry, and moderate but widely diffused wealth and comfort, than he had witnessed since he left Delhi, Diary, ed. 1861, 2. 56F. The record of the sentiments of the inhabitants towards me, as conveyed by the bishop, was gratifying, though their expression could excite no surprise in any one acquainted with the characters and sensibilities of these people. The author's anticipation of the prosperity of this town have not been completely realized. But it is still an important center of trade noted for the manufacture of cooking utensils, and possessing a ginning factory and a cotton press, Erskine II. A. 97F. A literal translation of this curious piece of Hindu legislation will be found at the end of the appendix. If not drawn up with all the dignity of the legal enactments of the great governments of the West, 
it has an important advantage in conciseness, the articles cannot be misinterpreted, and require no lawyer to expound them. Kampani Sahib Kunama Kuzor Se is a common phrase of our native soldiery, and Dohai. Kampani Ki is an invocation or appeal against injustice, but I never heard this watchword so powerfully applied as when a sub. With the residence escort in 1812. One of our men, a noble young Rajput about 19 years of age, and six feet high, had been sent with an elephant to forage in the wilds of Narvar. A band of at least fifty predatory horsemen assailed him, and demanded the surrender of the elephant, which he met by pointing his musket and giving them defiance. Beset on all sides, he fired, was cut down, and left for dead, in which state he was found, and brought to camp upon a litter. One saber cut had opened the back entirely across, exposing the action of the viscera, and his arms and wrists were barbarously hacked, yet he was firm, collected, and even cheerful. And to a kind reproach for his rashness, he said, What would you have said, Captain Sahib, had I surrendered the company's musket, Kampani Ki Bandak, without fighting? From their temperate habits, the wound in the back did well. But the severed nerves of the wrists brought on a lockjaw of which he died. The company have thousands who would alike die for their bandak. It were wise to cherish such feelings. An instance of the practice of sitting dharna to enforce a claim, Yul Burnell, Hobson Jobson, 2nd edition 315 f. c. c. p. and note. It will fill up the picture of the times to relate the revenge. When Jamshid, the infamous lieutenant of the infamous Amir Khan, established his headquarters at Udaipur, which he daily devastated, Sardar Singh, then in power, was seized and confined as a hostage for the payment of 30,000 rupees demanded of the Rana. The surviving brothers of the murdered minister Samji purchased their foe, with the sum demanded, and anticipated his clansmen, who were on the point of effecting his liberation. The same sun shone on the head of Sardar, which was placed as a signal of revenge over the gateway of Rampiari's palace. I had the anecdotes from the minister Sihol, one of the actors in these tragedies, and a relative of the brothers, who were all swept away by the dagger. A similar fate often seemed to him, though a brave man, inevitable during these resumptions. Which impression, added to the Rana's known inconstancy of favor, robbed him of half his energies. Nearly twelve months after this, my public duty called me to Nambahara en route to Kota. The castle of Hamra was within an hour's ride, and at night he was reported as having arrived to visit me, when I appointed the next day to receive him. Early next morning, according to custom, I took my ride, with four of Skinner's horse, and galloped past him, stretched with his followers on the ground not far from my camp, towards his fort. He came to me after breakfast, called me his greatest friend, swore by his dagger he was my Rajput, and that he would be in future obedient and loyal, but this, I fear, can never be. Literally faith, Dharma, to his lord, Swami. Paper of Relinquishment. The dub grass, Synodon Dactylon, flourishes in all seasons, and most in the intense heats, it is not only a Mara or immortal, but Akshay, not to be eradicated, and its tenacity to the soil deserves the distinction. From Bap, Father, and the termination of, or belonging to, and by which clans are distinguished, as Karansat, descended of Karan, Mansingat, descended of Munsingha. It is curious enough that the mountain clans of Albania, and other Greeks, have the same distinguishing termination, and the Minot of Greece and the Myrad of Rajputana alike signify mountaineer, or, of the mountain, Mena in Albanian. Myru or Meru in Sanskrit. The words have no connection. Laws, 9. 44. When he, the king, has gained victory, let him duly worship the gods and honor righteous brahmanas, let him grant exemptions, and let him cause promises of safety to be proclaimed. But having fully ascertained the wishes of all the conquered, let him place then a relation of the vanquished ruler on the throne, and let him impose his conditions. Let him make authoritative the lawful customs of the inhabitants, just as they are stated to be, Manu, Laws, 7. 201 f, Trans. Bueller, Sacred Books of the East, 25. 248 f. Let him, the king, cause his annual revenue in his kingdom to be collected by trusty, officials, 
let him obey the sacred law, in his transactions with, the people, and behave as a father to all men, Manu, Laws, 7. 80. Not to turn back in battle, to protect the people, to honor the Brahmanas, is the best means for a king to secure happiness, I.B. 7. 88. From the people let him, the king, learn, the theory, of the, various, trades and professions, I.B. 7. 43. But, he who is given, to these vices, loses, even his life, I.B. 7. 46. Trans. Bueller, Sacred Books of the East, 25. Connie, Land, and Achi, Heritage, Report, I should be inclined to imagine the Achi, like the O.T. in Awat, Rajput Terminations, implying clanship. Tamil Kaniyachi, that which is held in free in hereditary property. Kani, Land, Achi, Inheritance, Wilson, Glossary, S.V., Madras Manual of Administration, 3. 58. C.P. C.P. C. Sketch of Feudal System. Narwala of Danville. The Balhara Sovereignty of the Arabian Travelers of the 8th and 9th Centuries. I visited the remains of this city on my last journey, and from original authorities shall give an account of this ancient emporium of commerce and literature. Salvamenta of the European System. The author has to acknowledge with regret that he was the cause of the Mina proprietors in not reobtaining their Bapoda, this arose, partly from ignorance at the time, partly from the individual claimants being dead, and more than all. From the representation that the intended sale originated in a bribe to Saturn the governor, which, however, was not the case. Claims to the Bapoda appear to be maintainable if not alienated longer than 101 years, an undisturbed possession, no matter how obtained for the same period appears to confer this right. The Miris of Kandesh appears to have been on the same footing. See Mr. Elphinstone's report, October 25, 1819, edition 1872, f, quoted in B.G., 12. 266, the word Miris means, inherited estate, the right of disposal of which rests with the holder. The Jot certainly did not bring the custom to Kent. The Sami Begum of the Peninsula in 5th Report, pages 356-57, correctly Swami Boga, Lord's Rent, in Sanskrit. Manu, Laws, 9. 52-54, on the servile classes. Bueller's version differs, but the meaning is practically the same as that of the text. Patel. Patel Bearer. The Garjinti Bearer, and Karlaker, or Wood and Forage, explained in the feudal system. In copperplate grants dug from the ruins of the ancient Ujjain, presented to the Royal Asiatic Society, the prince's patents, Pada, conferring gifts are addressed to the Pada Silas and Riots. I never heard an etymology of this word, but imagine it to be from Pada, grant, or patent, and Sila, which means a nail, or sharp instrument. Sila, the stone on which the grant is engraved. Metaphorically, that which binds or unites these patents, all, however, having paddy, or chief, as the basis, see Transactions of the Royal Asiatic Society, Volume 1. Paddy, chief, has no connection with Pada, a grant, the latter being the origin of Patel. For the position of the Patel C. Baden-Powell, the Indian village community, 10 FF, Malcolm, Memoir of Central India, 2nd edition 2. 14 FF. Can, grain, cut, valuation, batai from batana, to divide. Mui, Barak, and Kapasan. To effect this, indispensable alike for unity of government and the establishment of a police, the individual statements of their holders were taken for the revenues they had derived from them. And money payments three times the amount were adjudged to them. They were gainers by this arrangement, and were soon loaded with jewels and ornaments, but the numerous train of harpies who cheated them and abused the poor riot were eternally at work to defeat all such beneficial schemes. And the counteraction of the intrigues was painful and disgusting. Manu, Laws, 7. 119, ordains the division into tens, hundreds, and thousands. Farmed for the ensuing three years, from 1822, for seven lakhs of rupees. In S. 1816, Jawara yielded 222,000 rupees and Dariba 80,000 rupees. 
The tin of these mines contains a portion of silver. What the author calls the tin mines are probably the lead and zinc mines at Javar, 16 miles south of Udaipur city. They seem now to be exhausted, and search might be made for other untouched pockets of ore. Those at Dariba, which formerly yielded a considerable revenue, have long been closed, Erskine 2, A, 53, dot. There are between two and three thousand towns, villages, and hamlets, besides the fiscal land of Muir, but the tribute of the British government is derived only from the fiscal. It would have been impossible to collect from the feudal lands, which are burthened with service, and form the army of the state. Sir John Malcolm's wise and philanthropic measures for the reclamation of this race in Malva will support my assertions. Memoir of Central India, 2nd edition I, 516 ff, 2. 179 ff. 588 printed by R. and R. Clark, Limited, Edinburgh. Transcribers note. There are references in all three volumes to genealogical tables in Volume 1, which were not reprinted in this crook edition. The spelling of names and places is variable, as noted in the editor's introduction to Volume 1, as the system of transliteration underwent many changes in the intervening century. The use of macrons was not yet introduced in James Todd's day. This text, with very few exceptions, follows the text as printed. Hyphenation of compound words follows the text, with the rare exception of when it occurs on a line break and the preponderance of other instances provides clear guidance. Errors deemed most likely to be the printers have been corrected, and are noted here. The sole footnote on P had no reference in the text. Based on the content of the note, the reference has been at the end of the first paragraph on the page. The correction to note was made in order to close a quotation beginning with the cloud of war, but lacking a closing quote. Earlier editions supplied the resolution. Errors deemed most likely to be the printers have been corrected, and are noted here. This list contains issues in the main text. References are to the page and line in the original. Imperial Gazetteer of India, comma. Added. Muntakab, at slash ut, to Warwick. Replaced. The least suspicious kind of historical evidence, dot. Added. In the respective historical portions, dot. Added. The burning plains of IND, dot. Added. Were learned in the Vedas, dot. Added. Other eight generations anterior, dot. Added. Inhabitants had their appellation, we cannot say, dot. Added. Descendants of Rama, dot. Added. After a lapse of 2,250 years, dot. Added. The power of the Pramaras, dot. Added. To have been patrons of science, dot. Added. The principality of the Rana of Muir, dot. Added and most powerful fiefs of Muir, dot. Added. Pancholi Raychand A, M slash N, D Meta Muldas. Replaced. The contemporary of Vikramaditya, A, B, dot C, 56. Replaced. 1, comma, Kanaxan. Added. The Rhymer of Aurangabad. Added. By Abhati Rajput of Jaslamar, dot. Added. Rana A.R., S., I. Sing 2. Inserted. From S. 1825 to S. 1831, A.D. 1768 74, forward slash. Replaced. The Foreign Chief, I.A. slash A.I., N.S. Transposed. The following list contains issues corrected or noted in the footnote text. The reference is to the original page and note, and the line within the note which may appear on a later page. Smith, E.H.I., 387, Note, I.A., I, 269 FF, 3. 17 FF, 32. 167 F. Added. Boggs, the Tiger Lord. Added. And said to be built by Puru, forward slash. Replaced. Household, forward slash. Replaced. Smaller units being called by Elisa, 42, or CH, A, Yubisa, 24. 
Restored. Supplemental Glossary, 178 FF. Added. 1i, 319. Added. Art. Relief. Added. The fief of his vassal without his consent, forward slash. Replaced. E less seconds de l'eau regaler quand i, t slash l, passate par leur borg. Replaced. The name of min, n, agra was changed. Removed. Mers in Porbundar, Wilberforce Bell, History of Cathy Awad, 53. Added. Census Report, Rajputana, 1911, I, 255. Added. Cloud of War Rolled from Himachal. Added. Maharna Kumba, Sovereign, Soldier, Scholar, Ajmer, 1917. Added. Calcine Shell Lee, N slash M, E. Replaced. Upon, S slash T, Air Refusal to Intermarry. Replaced. A colloque, A I slash I A, L Contraction for Pertop. Transposed. J, U slash A, Sarkar. Replaced. Scott's History of Aurangzeb Successors, Volume 1. Added. A royal grant. Added. Your favor was received by the pundit pardon. Removed. In 1814, Ranaji Bursha, colon forward slash in 1813. Replaced. On the liquidation of the contribution, comma forward slash dot. Replaced. Since he left a, hl slash lh, i. Transposed. Synodon dactylon. Opening bracket added. Transcription of the plate on p. Each feature on the plate is summarized below, including both the original transliteration from Todd's original text and the version used by Crook in the text of this edition. Section through Central India in 25 degrees north lat. From Abu, Abu, to Bundelkhand, Bundelkhand. Plateau of Central India, Trap Formation. M.T. Abu, M.T. Abu. Aravali Mountains. Udipur, Udaipur. Jod, E. Ruttinghur. Rampura, Rampura. Chumbul R, Chumbul R. Kota. Parbati R, Parbati R. Shahabad, F. Sinda R. Kuniadana, H. Betwa R. Kotra. A. B. The isolated Abu 24 mile circumference at base underscore 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 granite and naze. C. D. The Aravali chain underscore 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 granite reposing on compact blue slate. D. E. Plains of Muir. E. F. Pater or Plateau of Central India, underscore 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 trap. F G dot Valley of the Sinda. G H dot Table Mountain the eastern limit of Rajputna, structure doubtful. H I dot Plains of the Betwa, Bundelkhand.